This would all have taken place roughly 10 to 11 years ago, over a period of two years. We had moved into this older house in Abu Dhabi, UAE, after living in another house in the city for two years. It was a creepy house, very normal and in a pretty populated area that was gaining more popularity. The house was quite old, built well on the outside and made from concrete, but was showing its age on the inside. I never felt anything weird about the house, just annoyed at how often a pipe would leak or paint would need to be touched up. However, I very vividly remember two moments in that house. First, I was sleeping in my sister's room with my sister and mother. I must have been around 10 years old, with my sister being five. I didn't like sleeping alone and neither did my sister, so we often shared rooms with our parents. I remember randomly waking up in the middle of the night, no idea why, and after a few minutes of lying there awake, I heard a surprisingly loud female scream. It scared me. I woke my mother and said, did you hear the scream? To which she responded, it was probably just the cats. There were many stray cats that lived in the area, but I knew that it wasn't the cats. It sounded as though a woman was screaming briefly and it definitely sounded as though it had come from inside the house, and it wasn't our cat because he was asleep with my dad. I eventually fell asleep again and didn't bring it up again, and I never found out what it was. Secondly, one night I was lying in bed with my dad. My mom was in another room with my sister. I was trying to fall asleep and my dad was reading a book. We then both heard what sounded like a large plastic container being dropped. My dad and I got up to investigate. My sister and mother were asleep, and there was nothing noticeable that had fallen. My dad explained that it was probably our cat that had knocked something over. We went to bed, and the next day I basically ignored the experience again and didn't talk about it. But we never found any signs of something that had fallen over. After two years in the house and no other events happening to me, we moved to another house in the same area, it was newer and bigger. Nothing happened again. But a few years later, I bring up my story to my mom one day, who then reveals that I wasn't the only one to experience strange things in that house. She explains how one night, when my sister and I were sleeping in our own rooms, my dad had gone to bed to read a book, while my mom stayed in the living room to finish a cup of tea. My dad was lying on his side reading, when he vividly remembers feeling my mother get into bed with him. He even said, you finished that tea quickly, but when he turned around, no one was there. My mother was still drinking tea in the living room, and my sister and I were asleep in our own rooms. He struggled to fall asleep that night. Another time, my mom's friend had come over to meet my mom and see the house for the first time, while my sister and I were at school, and my father was at work. My mom's friend, we'll call her Linda, was sitting in the living room while my mom made coffee for the two of them. Linda then sees my father walk up the stairs to the second floor. She greets my dad, let's call him John, with, Hey John, good to see you. My mom comes out of the kitchen with coffee and questions as to who Linda was talking to. Linda says she was greeting my father but my mother explained how my father was at work and no one else was in the house. Linda was adamant that she saw a man walk up to the second floor. She and my mom go upstairs to check and find no one there. Linda left immediately and it took a few months before she ever came back. Finally, the scariest of them all. My mom was watching my sister while I was at a friend's house and my dad was at work. My sister was playing in her room while my mom read a book in the same room. My mom got up briefly to go to the kitchen and pack some stuff away. When she gets back, my sister is coloring with some crayons. My mom's confused as she always keeps the crayons on the very top shelf in a cupboard with the door closed because my sister went through crayons crazy fast. She asked my sister where she'd gotten the crayons, to which my sister replied, the man gave them to me. My mom was alone in the house, and had left my four-year-old sister alone for only about two minutes. 
This freaked my mother out a lot, and for years she never told anyone about it. After moving out, many of our friends told my parents how they disliked coming to our house. They couldn't say why, but said that it had a strange feeling to it. And my mom never told me about the incidents, as to not scare me. Ten years later, we haven't experienced anything ever again, but we all still very much remember and dislike talking about that house. I worked as a bookkeeper and shareholder in a business office. When I began, the books were a mess, so I was spending a lot of time in the office very early in the morning working through issues. I'm a morning person, so sometimes I was there as early as four or five in the morning. Usually, no one else was in the building. To set the scene, my office was at the very end of a 10,000 square foot single level space in a fairly new business plaza. Our unit had heavy fire doors bisecting the space and a back fire exit that opened onto a long, narrow walkway that ran the length of the back and wrapped around the building, ending in a sidewalk just outside my office window. There's a deep drop-off next to the walkway along the back of the building and a very tall fence at the end of the building. One morning, I heard running footsteps, heavy like a guy, from inside at the front of the building. I hear one of the bisecting fire doors crash open and the back door open and slam shut. I ran to the back door and looked out, but I didn't see anyone. I ran back to the front and out to the parking lot. No one was there. This became a very regular occurrence. I would respond every time, but I was having thoughts. It always sounded exactly the same. One day it had snowed. Snow on the walkway, snow in the parking lot, footsteps running, fire door crashing open, back door open and slam. I run to look out. No footprints. Another morning, very early, another person was there with me when this happened, and they ran into my office to tell me. We had an interesting chat. He told me that he had previously heard footsteps and movement when he thought he was alone in the building. I asked him to keep it to himself, not a rumor we wanted getting out. He thought maybe he wouldn't be coming in during off hours anymore. Flip forward a few months, we get a security system installed, interior motion detection, and remote monitoring. I start getting calls in the middle of the night from security that the back door had alarmed. I meet the police, we walk through, nothing. Out of pure frustration, the next time I heard the running footsteps, I yelled out, knock it off. And it stopped, at least for me. One night, I get a call from my assistant. She and her husband are at the office. She had just deactivated the alarm and entered the building. They heard running footsteps, the fire door crash open, the back door open and slam shut. Her husband takes off running to catch the person, only to find, of course, nothing. I had to walk her through the scenario. The alarm was set before you turned it off, right? The office has motion detectors, right? There was no one in the building. Don't call the police, set the alarm when you leave. And have a good night. Not long after I left my position and sold my interest in the company, the company moved within the year. I often wonder if the running man followed them. Whenever I tell this story, people call me crazy or tell me that my grandparents' house is haunted. But to be honest, this stuff only happens to me and it's only happened three or four times that I can think of. It was a normal day. I was hanging out at home, waiting for my mom to come home on her lunch break. It was about 30 minutes before she got home that I was watching SpongeBob or Hannah Montana that had happened. 
At the time, it scared the hell out of me, since I knew that I was home alone with all the doors locked. But I felt a hand on my shoulder. Then I smell a smell that I haven't smelled in years, followed by a voice that made all the hairs on my body stand up. It was my great grandma. She said, I'm here, Miha. I'm always here. I love you. As for the smell, it wasn't until a month or so later that I put together what it was. My grandma had wanted to have a vial of my great grandma's old perfume in the home. I smelled that, and it reminded me of the smell that I had smelled when I felt the hand. And then I remembered that that was what my great grandma always wore. To this day, everyone brushes this story off or asks me why out of all the family members she would visit me. I don't know. I just know that she did. When I was younger, I'm talking from the ages of zero to six, my family and I lived in this house in Creston, Iowa. I'll never forget that place. It was two stories. The attic was technically three bedrooms, and mine was the one up the stairs. Go up the stairs through my brother's bedroom, hang a left through the parents' room and to the back. Picture a bedroom with slanted walls and two windows in the back. That was my room. A bedroom through a bedroom to a bedroom. The layout of this place made zero sense. It also had a basement that from my very vague memory never stopped flooding. Not sure what that has to do with the story, but I'd like to know what happened to this place. I remember a little road that if you followed it around the back, you'd go under this tunnel bridge that supported trains. If you'd look out the side window from the kitchen, you could see the public baseball fields. I am 32 now, and my brother is 29, and we still have dreams about this nightmare for children. Every night when I would go to sleep, I would see these glowing eyes in my windows, two sets of them on occasion, like it brought its freaking buddy to come peep on this five-year-old in the second story window. I would tell my mom all the time, and to this very day she thinks I made it up, she gave me the typical mom response and told me to go stand up to my fears. I did. Once. That night, I yelled, Go away! And the body that the eyes were attached to started to frantically try to open the window. I had them locked, of course. We wouldn't go to bed without them locked. As soon as the growling and rattling started, I gunned it to my brother's room, and the little guy is floating out of his crib. I go to my mom's bed while having one of those throat-dry-can't-scream moments, trying to push her awake. My father comes walking up the stairs, and my brother falls back into his crib. Dad hears him screaming, and me standing there crying and reaching for him, and he puts us both back to sleep. I didn't sleep. About a week went by that I didn't sleep, and my mom invited my grandparents to stay the night. My grandpa was apparently the only thing that could calm me. That old geezer made me feel safe, you know? On the third night of his stay, the eyes were back, so I go downstairs to snuggle up to my grandpa while he's asleep on the couch. When I rounded the corner, I could see something black floating up through his stomach and up through the ceiling. He's gasping for air and begging something above his head to make it stop. I was so freaked that I froze. The next morning, I asked him about it. He said that an angel was patting his head, telling him that it was going to be okay and that it was almost over. My brother was three and I was five. My grandparents are all past now. There's no way we should still be seeing this stuff in our sleep by the time we're 30. I want to know if that place is still standing and if anything else has happened to anybody else who stayed there. I guess I'd just like to know that it wasn't just us.
This story transpired many years ago when my now 18-year-old daughter was five years old. It was never uncommon that after giving my daughter a bath before putting her in bed for the evening, that my wife, myself, and my daughter would end up in our bedroom as we got her toweled off in her pajamas and ready for bed that evening. This night, we were all laying in bed as usual, laughing, talking, and catching up as we normally did. Through all the fun and laughter, my daughter stopped and took a serious tone with us. We both asked my daughter, what's the matter? And she now, laying on her back and looking toward the corner ceiling in our bedroom, asked in a matter of fact and hushed tone, what do angels look like? Neither my wife nor I are very religious, but have grown up with religion in our lives as children and young adults. My wife grew up with Buddhist teachings, and I grew up as Catholic and Baptist. So we both had knowledge of what the scriptures and texts described as what angels typically looked like. Thinking this is a prime teaching moment, both my wife and I jumped on it. We ran down the look of what a classic angel looks like, or from what we know from growing up that we've been told explicitly that they look like. Beautiful, glowing, wings dressed in white and flowing white clothes. They are kind and loving and are sent to watch over us to protect us in our times of need. My daughter's eyes never strayed from the corner of the room as we both gave our best description of what we thought an angel looked like and their purpose in our lives, if we are fortunate enough to see one. We both noticed her gaze after our best attempt to provide her with the best information we could muster, considering her very important question. She points to the corner of the room and ceiling that her eyes had been affixed to, and says, They look like that, right? Dumbfounded and a little frightened, my wife and I quickly look to where she's pointing and see nothing. We ask, Sweetie, what do you see? She states to both of us, I see an angel right there on the wall. Don't you see her? She's pretty. Utterly shaken, a little frightened, and disappointed that neither my wife nor I could share in the experience she was having, we couldn't see what it was that she was clearly seeing. I know I struggled my hardest to try and will this being to show itself to me. I had to explain to my little one that the older we get, sometimes these special things don't allow us to see them, because we adults may not understand. And if she sees it, then it is perhaps her guardian angel letting her know that they were there, watching over her and protecting her, and that is truly a great thing. After what seemed like ages, but I'm sure it took nothing but a few seconds, my daughter stated that the angel was gone and she was ready for bed. In that moment, as I carried her to bed, I was both grateful and sad. Grateful that she may have seen something many of us never get to see. Sad that my eyes could not see this being, that my sight had been blinded and shut off from sharing this moment with my daughter, because I may be blinded due to age, life, and experiences. To this day, I still wish both myself and my wife could have truly seen and experienced that moment with my daughter. I grew up in a household that rarely attended church. Sometimes, when visiting our grandparents, my two brothers and I would be forced to go to worship services, but those moments were few and far between. Even so, it's almost impossible to avoid running across Christian symbols in books, movies, and television shows. Thus, it's likely most Americans have at least a basic understanding of such Christian symbols as the cross and angelic beings. So, when my youngest brother Parker, of around three years old, began telling us that he saw angels, my parents saw no immediate cause for concern, nor were they at all surprised. From what I can remember, all of the adults in the family and in our friend circles thought it was cute. I must admit, I was a bit more skeptical than the grown-ups. 
Quite frankly, I could not shake an unsettling feeling deep in my gut that something about it just wasn't right. Some time later, my brothers and I were spending a summer day at our babysitter's mind-numbingly boring home when my youngest brother called out for someone to come and look at a picture he had just finished. Now, being all of three years old, abstract shapes and outrageous color schemes constituted the bulk of my brother's artwork up until this point. At least, this is the level of work we were all used to and fully expected to see. As it happens, I was the first to arrive on the scene and lay eyes on the drawing. The first thing I noticed, to my astonishment, was the lack of color. In fact, the entire drawing consisted of various shades of black, which was completely out of character in my brother's case. Before I was even aware of what I had laid my eyes upon, a cold chill was creeping up my spine, causing the hairs on the back of my neck to stand on end. The next thing I could not avoid being struck by was the seemingly miraculous leap forward in this three-year-old boy's artistic ability. I could actually make out the discernible details of a figure, demonstrating ability well beyond his years. Without regard to the figure on the page, I immediately felt something scandalous must be afoot. I marched over to our middle brother, Christian, fully intent upon drawing a confession out of him. He must have sketched the figure and conspired to have a little fun at my expense. I was not laughing. I couldn't shake this feeling of being disturbed, much like the one I would get from creepy pictures or statues that seemed to stare directly into my soul. When he pled his innocence, I quickly dragged Christian over to the table and demanded that he end his charade. However, the moment his eyes met the figure, I recognized the look on his face. I imagined it must have been exactly as I had looked upon viewing the figure only moments before. Tears began to stream from his eyes as I released his arm and watched him race over to the secure arms of his favorite teddy bear. He always had that bear with him, but I had not seen him act as he did in that moment in years. He was three all over again. I was beginning to feel sweat beating up on my forehead and the back of my neck. I turned to Parker, who had not moved from his spot at the table throughout the entirety of the commotion, his face displaying a confused look. As the oldest, not wanting to leave the responsibility to our babysitter, I decided that I would inquire about the figure. The figure? Up to this point, I hadn't even considered what exactly my brother had drawn. All I knew was that it was chilling me to the bone and I couldn't understand why, but I would soon have my answer. Before launching into my interrogation, I glanced back at the shadowy figure on the paper. Why had I not spent a moment to figure out what he had drawn? Was it my subconscious attempting to protect me from identifying it? These questions ran through my brain, and still do every time I lie awake in bed at night, some twenty plus years later, wary of what may be waiting for me in the darkest corners of my room, behind the door and under the bed. Some things just stick with you, and tend to rear their ugly head at the worst moments. What I saw on the paper haunts me to this day. The drawing was of a dark, shadowy figure, partly veiled in what appeared to be smoke or possibly mist. The body was nude, and the limbs and torso were contorted in grotesquely unnatural fashions. Tears were welling up in my eyes as I scanned the figure, slowly drifting up toward its face. This face was something indescribably sinister and horrid. It had no business even being a figment of imagination, much less being sketched by a three-year-old. I cannot, after all of these years, find something even remotely like it to compare it with. It didn't exactly have eyes, but you felt like it was staring right through you, like it knew you. I felt like it knew more about me than I knew myself, yet there was something oddly familiar about the figure. What I suppose could possibly pass for a mouth stretched from the middle of its lopsided, egg-shaped head all the way to the very bottom of its face. Impossible as it may seem, the figure appeared to be smiling and whispering at the same time. For some reason, I felt like it was asking me to remember. Remember what? Looking up at my three-year-old brother, 
with his blue eyes and innocent expression. I could not believe such a vision of utter darkness and cruelty could spring forth from his young and inexperienced mind. Was this something he thought about often? Had he dreamt it and felt compelled to put it down on paper? If he was at all frightened by the image, as Christian and I clearly were, he wasn't showing the slightest sign. I could only bring myself to ask him a single question. Why? Just then, Christian accidentally knocked the television remote to the floor, momentarily snapping me out of the dramatic heaviness of the moment. He still looked mortified. I turned to the three-year-old behind me, realizing there might just be some mystery about to be revealed, and heard the words I immediately realized were the cause of my unease with the figure. When I asked him why, he simply smiled and said, I see him every day. He's my angel. Upon hearing this, something seemed to break inside me. It was as if some switch flipped and an impossibly dim light flickered to life in a dark and distant room. A faded memory from as far back as I can remember began to take shape. On the couch behind me, Christian began sobbing loudly. He was definitely his three-year-old self, squeezing his teddy bear and moaning that he wanted our mother. Something from within compelled me to go over to him. It was not a voice, but it was definitely a feeling. I was out of my element. We needed mom and dad. The babysitter was not going to be enough. Something was seriously wrong, and we did not have any answers. The moment I sank into the couch, my brother threw his teddy bear and wrapped his arms around me. This was certainly new. We loved each other, about as much as two young brothers can hope to love one another, but the only times we ever hugged were for family pictures. And yet I could tell that it was the most appropriate thing the two of us could do in that moment. He needed it. I needed it. Without looking up at me, through alternating sobs and snivels, he began to speak. He told me he wished he had never looked at the figure. He asked me why I had made him do it, which drove a hot dagger right through my little heart. I began to cry once again, telling him that I was sorry in my own whimpering voice. After we sat there crying for what seemed like an hour, though it was likely mere minutes, my brother once again spoke. This time he seemed oddly calm, almost as if he had not been crying and shaking with fear for the past several minutes. While he spoke, my attention was fading in and out, as he recounted the various houses we had lived in and the rooms we shared over the years. I had no idea why he was bringing any of this up at this particular moment. He continued in this manner, and I began to just be able to make out the memory that had moments before been triggered at the table and was slowly coming into focus. It was a series of short scenes, mostly in an apartment my parents rented when I was around three or four years old. Some of them were of places I could not quite make out, but I assumed they represented my grandparents' old house and the daycare center I once attended. They were old memories of old places. Before I could make these images more concrete and begin to try to remember their significance, I was ripped from my trance-like state by something my brother said. He was asking me if I remembered his imaginary friend. He said he used to think it was his guardian angel. I, myself, was around nine when he used to talk about this imaginary friend and I tended to just ignore him when he spoke about it. I did remember, however, a time when I awoke to the sound of my brother whispering. I remember rolling over so that I could smack him and tell him to go to sleep, but immediately being startled by the sound of a deep, raspy voice that seemed to be responding to him. I must have blocked it out, but at that moment I could suddenly recall that night. I ran straight into our parents' room waking them up and going on and on about a man in our room. Unfortunately, when my parents finally got up and went to investigate, my brother was sound asleep, and nothing was amiss. The window was closed and locked, the bed was clear underneath, and our closet only housed a few sweatshirts and board games. As this was all coming back to me, my own memory began to sharpen and reveal itself. It was as if a movie was being played on fast-forward of select moments from my early childhood, as an only child for the first few years of my life, it was not uncommon for me to have to settle on entertaining myself. 
Strangely enough, though, in the images streaming through my brain, a figure began to materialize. Frame by frame, as the scenes repeated themselves over and over again, a growing dark mist or smoke was taking shape. Christian had lost his temporary state of calmness and returned to sobbing uncontrollably, but the images continued to hold my attention. What was that thing in each of the scenes with me? Why did I feel some connection to it? The sobs of my brother grew into full-on wailing. Still, I could not be brought out of my current state. I had to know what my memory was trying to show me. At some point, my curiosity began to change to an all-too-familiar feeling of dread. I was coming to the realization that I knew exactly what was in those rooms with me. I had always known. I did not want to see it in its full form, but I could not look away. The images were in my head, not in front of my eyes. I could feel tears streaming once again down my cold, clammy face. I was sweating profusely and shivering uncontrollably, like one continuous chill running up and down my spine. It started with that unmistakable stench. It seemed to roll off of him like the smoke that surrounded his presence. Then I saw that hideously familiar naked body with all of its twists and inhuman angles. I could hear a faint noise rising from somewhere in the background. No, it was welling up from inside me. I was screaming. The last thing I remembered before blacking out was that ungodly face, crooked and ghastly, somehow smiling without a mouth and seeing right into my soul with non-existent eyes. And to think, I now can vividly remember that three-year-old me used to be comforted by this hideous creature. He was, after all, my guardian angel. Up until the age of 18, I lived in a modest suburban home on the East Coast with my parents and my younger brother. While the home wasn't too old, it was built in the 70s, the house was located less than a quarter mile away from an older cemetery, which is something I have recently considered as an explanation for the events that occurred there. For as long as I can remember, it always felt as if some dark presence was watching me in my house. At night, I would wrap myself in so many blankets that I could barely breathe, only leaving a small hole to peer through into my room. We all lived on the second story too, yet most of the activity seemed to occur in my room and my brother's. The overwhelming fear I experienced almost daily really began when I was seven or eight. At that point, I would often wake up to shadowy figures standing over my bed and even saw my door opened and closed during the night. However, as I got older, these events worsened. One night, I woke up to a small shadow figure the size of a child, rocking in a chair directly across from my bed. I must have stared at that figure for about an hour until I had the courage to turn the light on. Of course, when I did, it was gone, but my chair was left rocking in its place my window wide open, which was strange because it was winter and I definitely didn't open it, and my books were knocked off my shelf. I began telling my parents what had been happening to me, and they barely uttered a word. My brother had been behaving strangely at this time as well, speaking to the walls, and angrily yelling at my mom whenever she tried to put away his toys at night. He eventually told my parents that he had to leave his toys out, or else the big one and the little one would get mad. He also said that the little one would pull on his toes at night if he didn't do what it said. When my parents finally heard this explanation, they then disclosed what else had been occurring to them. When my mom was alone, her hair would frequently get yanked from behind, or she would hear whispering voices. She'd seen objects such as a bowl fly 10 feet across the room and smash into a wall. While we were not being physically injured, it was clear that these spirits were trying to torment us. At night, we would all hear noises throughout the house. Sometimes it would be a cabinet closing or dishes clashing together. 
Other times, it would be full-on footsteps stomping around. It had gotten to the point where my parents hired paranormal investigators to look into the house. From what I know, they had picked up slight audible recordings in both my room and theirs. Nothing too major, yet it appeared as if some unexplained activity was spiking their detectors. I'll also add that my family is not religious, so we never hired a priest or any other religious organization to help us ward off any potential bad spirits. Anyway, after the investigation, my mom was so fed up that she'd begun considering selling the house. Then, all of a sudden, all the activity almost immediately stopped. No sounds at night, no objects flying, and my brother no longer saw the big one and the little one. Things really did seem to die down until I was about 12, right after my parents divorced. I split my time between that house, my dad's, and my new house, my mom's. I still hadn't experienced anything like I did when I was younger, but something seriously freaked me out whenever I had been home alone there. I always felt like I was being watched. I'm currently living full-time at my mom's house now, but I just can't wrap my mind around what happened to me as a kid. I'd also like to note that strange things have now been happening at my mom's. I'm not sure if I'm just sensitive to these types of paranormal activity, but I just can't explain why. My boyfriend doesn't believe a word of this story, but oh well. I kind of think that people don't believe in this stuff until it happens to them. Anyway, thanks for listening to my story. I would love to hear from anyone else who has similar paranormal experiences. Does anyone think that being haunted as a child could make someone more susceptible to future activity? Let me know. In the seventh grade one day, I was talking with some friends and we started telling some scary stories, just for fun. One of my friends told a story about how he and a couple of friends went to an abandoned house, and one person from the group brought a Ouija board. They got mad at him because he didn't say anything about bringing it to that place. So some people left because, you know, they were smart, and they knew that you just didn't mess around with that board. But a handful stayed and decided to move up to the attic and play with the board. While playing with the board, it just flips over by itself, and the planchette goes flying. That scared everybody, and they all left right away. And while everybody hurried out of the house, the one kid that brought the board decided to hide in a closet, which would obviously stop a demon from attacking you. He called his mother to pick him up, but his mom punished him by making him stay overnight in the abandoned house, and in the morning she came to go pick him up. Now this is where it gets interesting. After that incident, the kid was riding his bike, when out of nowhere he falls, and while inspecting his body for injuries, his parents find three big scratches on both the front and the back of his body. Nobody knows what really happened to him, but everyone has their suspicions. It was about 7 p.m. during a terrible thunderstorm. My mom was working late at night at my school for some project. She brought me, my sisters, and my sister's friend along with her because there was no one at home to watch us. I don't know where my mom took off to to finish this project, but my sisters and I all walked into our school gym. We were very bored, so we just wandered around the gym jumping on the bleachers and doing stuff the kids would do at a time like that. We all decided to sit down and tell some funny stories to pass the time, but that laughter soon turned into terror. We all noticed one of the lights flickering on and off, and as it did, it was going into some kind of pattern. It was kind of scary, but we didn't think much of it, until every single light in the gym started flickering on and off in the same pattern altogether. We freaked out and started panicking. Keep in mind, this was during a huge thunderstorm. As we were trying to run outside of the gym, 
we saw something. It took just one flash of lightning for us to see a figure of an old lady standing right in the middle of the gym. We ran out of the gym in terror, as we didn't even know what we had just witnessed. And to this day, I still wonder who, or what, it was that we saw that night. A good friend of mine told me this story years ago. He is the stereotypical old big bad trucker. I've seen some weird stuff while driving with him in South Texas along the border. He never batted an eye. But while telling me this story, he had goosebumps and a concerned expression, which from this guy is about the equivalent of a trembling lip. I'll tell this story in the first person as he told it to me. Years ago, in the late 90s, I was on my way from the house in Central Texas, heading to Laredo to pick up a load. It was early morning, around 4 or 5. I had just come off a string of days at home, so I know I wasn't tired. I'm on one of those two-lane winding roads in the absolute middle of nowhere when I see something on the side of the road, at the edge of my high beams. At first I thought it was just roadkill, as is usually the case. But as I get closer, I see that it is roadkill and there's somebody crouching over the deer carcass. I remember thinking either this guy's taking the antlers as a trophy or he's just sick. As I got closer, I could then see that this guy was eating the deer. He's pulling chunks of meat from the stomach and bringing them up to his face. At this point, he stops mid motion and looks up at me. Not at my truck, at me. He, or it, stands up, and that's when I see that it is huge, brown, and covered in hair. At this point, I just remember thinking, oh crap, this thing is standing on the tiny shoulder, looking at me. By this point, maybe three seconds have passed, and I'm about to the point in the road that he's standing at. I didn't even think of stopping. In fact, I'm starting to lay on it and get out of there. As I'm passing it, it's looking at me, again, not at the truck. It's looking through the driver's side windshield at me. Whatever this thing was obviously had the intelligence to know that there was a driver and to know where I was sitting. As I started to pass him, I could see his head above the hood of an old needle nose Pete. If you don't know, that's an old truck design where the hood goes straight out from the windshield, known for being tall and difficult to see around. This thing is a freaking giant. I remember seeing what looked like human intelligence in its eyes, but it was not human. Still scares the crap out of me. I work in a Victorian prison in England. For privacy reasons, I obviously won't say where. But there's always been a prison in this area since maybe the 13th century. But the current and most recent build was from the 1850s. The prison that I work in has seen some executions in its time and saw some of the last hangings in the UK, making it a very eerie place to work. The wing that I work on holds the old execution cells on the bottom landing, and the prisoners who were executed used to drop from the landing above and down onto the landing below, where they would be taken off and put into small, tunnely, unmarked graves out back. You can still see where they've bricked up the tunnels in the outbuilding. So one evening, I was counting the wing after I'd locked everyone away. I went down to the bottom landing to count and I watched a dark, shadowy figure dart around the corner of this landing. Immediately I said, Come on, mate, I called bang up half hour ago, get moving. 
Suddenly, I realized that there was no sound from whatever this thing was that had darted off. But also, that I had already locked everyone away, and I made sure every door was secure. I even checked the CCTV, and there was nobody else on that landing other than myself. A few other officers have also seen whatever this is, but it can never be seen on the cameras. The thing that terrifies me is knowing that people have died down there. What was this guy running from? I'm a prison officer, not a storyteller. So this could either be really long and boring or full of information that's irrelevant. I don't know, but it's my story and I wanted to tell it anyway. We start our nights at approximately 8 p.m. and we're locked in until the following morning at 6 a.m. It's essentially a skeleton crew and several hundred prisoners secured behind their doors. This past week has had the most activity that I've ever experienced. A lot of the people who work with me have had really spooky happenings as well. I'm not really a believer, per se, but a lot of spooky and unexplained things have happened at night. So many that I have no choice but to begin to believe when it's all added up together. At night, we usually patrol two linked wings, as there's no need to have staff patrolling each when the prisoners are asleep. There's a wing that I believe is haunted. On the third floor landing, when cutting in between the two wings, there's a sudden feeling of being watched by something from around the corner. It freaks me out so much that I refuse to cut through there now, as I just feel cold and watched. I go the longer way around to access this particular landing if I have to answer a call bell. It's the same on the ones landing on the same wing. As soon as you come down the stairs and turn to carry on the patrol, there's just this horrible, oppressive feeling of being followed and it just gives me the heebie-jeebies. I've had emergency cell bells, which are used by prisoners to alert staff to an emergency, go off in cells that are not occupied. Random doors slam when all of the doors are locked for obvious reasons. And I've thought that I've seen movement on CCTV cameras when I'm on my own. I've also heard things. However, anyone who's either been in a prison or worked in one will know that they're very noisy even at night. I've never said anything about this to colleagues, because being a prison officer dealing with hardened criminals and being spooked by nothing is a surefire way to get the mick taken out of you. Fast forward to this week. Luckily, I was not on this wing and was a member of staff that walks around supporting patrol staff. I spooked a patrol on a random wing as they didn't hear me and I made a joke about whether or not they thought I was a ghost. We got talking about ghosts and stuff, and naturally the subject of that wing came up. My face must have said it all, because they said, don't tell me the threes as you cut through and the ones as you come off the stairs. Now it's spooky that somebody else has felt the same, but it's also a little bit relieving that it's not just me. I carried on with my rounds and chatted to people and got talking about my good jump scare on our chat. It turns out that a lot of people who work in prisons believe in ghosts after they've worked a couple of night shifts. One of the patrols told me that they almost called me to sit with them as they had heard a loud bang as though it was a cell door slamming shut. They went to investigate, but nothing. They had just sat back down and it went again this obviously spooked them. We begin talking about how it's weird the ghosts have been mentioned. And then that happens. He then had his own story about the wing that I think is haunted, where one of the metal security gates slammed shut behind him on the threes landing as he was cutting through one night. Now, having worked on this wing, the gate doesn't move on its own as it's very heavy, let alone slam behind anyone of its own accord. We have a laugh about being blokes and scared of shadows, and I crack on with seeing the next person. 
to access them, I have to go through a wooden door and a metal gate. It's pitch black and I don't have my torch, so I open the wooden door and then metal gate, and I step in to look for the light switch so I can see to lock the door and gate behind me. As I'm doing this, the wooden door slams shut directly behind me with a huge force. I jumped. It wasn't a windy night, and we were indoors anyway, so there was no breeze. Let me tell you, I have never shut some doors and gates so fast in my whole life. I got out of there fast. I spend my rounds talking about the ghosts and seeing what everyone else's stories are. And there are some really interesting stories. But everyone I talk to talks about this haunted wing, either on the threes where they feel like they're being watched or the ones as they come off the stairs. By this point, I had spoken to six staff in total and all of them independently had the same types of stories. That's way too much of a coincidence for me. I finally go into the haunted wing, and I'm talking to the patrol who has all the lights on for what I can now only assume are obvious reasons, that they have felt it too. And I swear I see somebody moving on the cameras in the ones, walking toward the office, just before they go out of camera shot. There was nothing there, and nothing on the playback. I can't tell you what's happening, but something is definitely going on, and it is very creepy. For my 30th birthday, my partner and I at the time were staying at a hotel in Maui that my mother had paid for as a birthday present. I thought it was fine, a little dated feeling. The bed looked out into the living room, which had a dark, void vibe at night, but I really didn't think anything of it at the time. Until my partner started talking about getting bad vibes on the second night. I told him to just brush it off. After the third night, I mentioned a weird dream that I had had, where I was in the hotel bed and I saw two silver strings pulling my feet off the surface of the bed. It felt lucid, because I rarely dream about the room that I'm actually in, unless I'm in partial sleep paralysis, which is rare. And this didn't feel like sleep paralysis, just a normal dream. My partner apparently had a dream about his body being lifted off the bed on the same night, and this freaked me out. I never have paranormal experiences, and I rarely get spooked. But by the fourth night, my partner said, I literally cannot spend another night here. Something is way off about this place. I asked him what was going on besides the weird dreams. And he said that he couldn't pinpoint it, but he was just unwilling to spend another night there. He had never gotten any sort of vibes like this in the past from any other place we'd been. So I had to tell our Airbnb host that we needed to leave early. We ended up not getting any refunds and we sprung for a brand new hotel for the rest of the trip. I couldn't find anything on Google about the first hotel and nothing else happened. It was just super bizarre and my only paranormal adjacent experience. I still wish though that I could find out more information about the history of that hotel. So when I was 10 or 11, I can't remember, I went camping near Port Arthur. During these days, my family and I would go all throughout Port Arthur. I didn't find anything that spooky, just a lot of interesting history, until going on one of the ghost tours. When going into the dissection room, I saw a vision of a person. First, it was just phasing out of the wall and then it was standing at the base of the table. What was weird was that the tour guide was describing a sighting, which was presumed to be a surgeon, and it matched my vision exactly. 
However, I didn't feel that it was a surgeon. He didn't look like he was wearing prison clothes either, and Port Arthur is a prison. My dad had an experience too. To preface, my dad didn't tell me about this until we got home, and even then quite reluctantly, because he said he didn't want to scare us kids. So when we were all asleep, my dad went out to go to the bathroom, but walking through the tent, he saw a full body apparition of what he called a guard in a bright red uniform carrying a lantern. The guard walked through the tent, walking through the tent walls. He could see the glow of the lantern through the walls as well. I have other experiences, but I feel like they probably seem mundane and random. These experiences did really spike after coming back from Port Arthur though. But perhaps it was just my child's imagination. All things considered though, Port Arthur prison is pretty weird. When I was about 15 or 16, my neighbor asked my sister Cindy and I if we could stay at her large century house while she was on a business trip for two weeks. We were to be pet sitting and house sitting. Having been close to our neighbor and loved her dog and kitty, we said of course. Cindy slept in the master bedroom and I stayed in the second bedroom upstairs, which is connected to the attic. Now Cindy and I always loved creepy stuff always watching ghost adventures every Friday night, and we shared a lot of personal paranormal experiences together. We would always open the small attic door and mess around, saying that we should go in there, but I'm glad we never did. One night, Cindy stayed next door while I was at the neighbor's. I was sitting on the couch with the dog and the kitty next to me, watching TV. My neighbor has one of those alarm systems where if you open an entrance door, a little beep goes off. I heard the beep and I didn't really react, expecting to see my sister or my mom walk in to come hang out. After a minute of waiting to hear something or for someone to come in, nothing happened. I called out for Cindy, but no answer. I messaged my mom and asked if it was her, but they weren't even home. What scared me is that the beep goes off for any door, meaning that it could have been the front door that was maybe five feet from me on the other side of the wall. So I brushed it off and tried not to get too scared and just continued watching TV. Except that after about 30 minutes, I started hearing footsteps above me, which would have been the master bedroom. I look to my left and I see the dog. I look to my right and I see the cat so it couldn't have been them. I turned the TV down and I listened some more, and it sounded like the footsteps just paced back and forth. I had my sister come over and spend the night with me that night. The next day I go to my neighbors right after school and I see the basement door was open. Odd, but I closed it and went about my day. I started to clean her dining room and moved the chairs away from the table to sweep underneath it. I remembered that the broom was upstairs, so I ran up really quickly to grab it. As I come back down to the dining room, one of the dining room chairs was pushed into the stairway entrance, blocking me in. Again, I tried to brush it off and push it to the back of my mind. Except once I started sweeping, I felt something almost rush up behind me, so much so that I dropped the broom and ran my butt next door to my parents. The last few days consisted of random stuff moving, doors opening, and lights being on while we were at school. When my neighbor got back, she paid us and thanked us, and then asked if anything weird had happened. I said, actually, yes. I explained to her everything, and she just kind of laughed and goes, yeah, that happens a lot. I didn't want to tell you girls beforehand in case it would deter you from staying here. She also mentioned that I slept in the most haunted room in the house, the second bedroom upstairs with the attic. I brought up the basement door, but that's where her vibe changed. 
She said that's the one place in her house that she won't mess with because it scares her that much. Needless to say, after those two weeks, I sort of avoided going there, for a few years at least. Then I graduated high school and moved out of my parents' house, and that neighbor offered me a room in her house, and I said yes. But that's a story for another day. I am a park warden. I spend most of my shifts alone, working 5.30 p.m. to 2.30 a.m. in the Canadian wilderness. We have about 300 campsites, a handful of beaches, and the infrastructure that goes with them, like the showers and things like that. It just so happens that my park is closed for the winter, which is pretty standard in Canada, feet upon feet of snow and blistering cold. So there's no staff in the park from mid-October to early April. Years ago, a man decided to end it all via a sawed-off shotgun down by the river on one of the beaches in late November, and nobody found him until the spring melt. This beach is at the farthest north point of the park, and it's pretty isolated, but as it has a beach, it requires at least one patrol an evening. I was down in the showers at that specific beach at around 7 p.m. on a very overcast day. I was checking the supplies in the first aid kits and signing off on fire extinguishers. The weather was blah, so there were no campers out or patrons anywhere near the beach, and the parking lot was empty, except for my cruiser. All of a sudden, a feeling of intense panic washed over me, and I booked it to my cruiser. I get in, slam the door, take a few deep breaths, and wait for the feeling to pass. After a minute or two, I get back to business, but this time sitting in my locked car, which is still parked in the same spot, filling out binders and work logs. Suddenly, a huge dark shape moves across my driver's side window. I screamed and jumped back. My immediate thought was that somebody had been lurking and was about to try to smack the glass open. Sure as hell, though, it's empty. Not a soul around. You can bet that I left any and all future maintenance tasks in that neck of the park to be done by the day shift. I floored it out of there with a giant F that. Maybe not the scariest or most shocking story that will ever be posted here, but it rattled me hard, and I now refuse to do foot patrols down there at night, and it's been three years. This story might not be as scary as you hope, but every time I think of it, I get chills. I have been a park ranger for 11 years. Obviously, I'm not going to say where I work, but it's a very large park. This story took place in the spring of 2008. The park that I worked at had a very big drinking problem with youths trespassing all the time. We had calls almost every night. I worked nights most of my career. One day, a member of the public who had been camping out had called in saying that there was a large group of teens making noise and drinking. I was dispatched and started walking over in the dark. I tried to sneak up. This was a bit of a breach of my standard operating procedure, but I was trying to apprehend as many as I could manage. I managed to get about four to five of them, and the others ran into the woods. My prediction was that there had been as many as 20 people there from what I saw. I radioed through to dispatch to get a couple of deputies out there to take over. Deputies arrived at that point, I was all alone in the middle of nowhere, and I radioed through to try to get guided back to a more civilized part of the woods. At that point, I had already walked quite far and the radio connection was breaking up. We had really bad radios back then. As I approached a part of the woods that I was familiar with, I looked behind me and I saw somebody walking up to me very slowly. I called out, hello, no response. 
At this point, radio contact was back. I radioed in saying that I had just spotted someone. At this point, the figure was maybe 40 meters away. I called out, stop, and then, are you okay? No response. As the figure came closer, it just disappeared. I couldn't make out what it was. The next day came and I mentioned it to my friend who had worked there for about 10 years. I told him what happened and he made a scared face and said, it's nothing. He got up and walked away. In 2013, I left to work at the sheriff's office and I never mentioned it to anyone except some close friends while drinking. I'm still not sure what it was, but given the reaction of the guy I worked with, I really doubt it was nothing. One night in 2006 or 2007, I noticed a campfire in the distance and I went to investigate as setting up camps in the area that I was patrolling was not allowed as conservation efforts were in place. I walked over and no one was there. And I thought, what idiots would let a fire unattended? So I went over there and there were about two tents from what I remember and no one there. I radioed in and asked for a couple of guys to come clean up. When they arrived, I went to look for any sign that people were around. I looked for a couple of minutes and didn't find anything. Then we all left after extinguishing the fire and clearing up. We had one guy stay there as we had unattended equipment. Then I went back to the office because I was due a break. After the break, I went out and I saw a group of three who seemed fairly distressed. I approached them and asked them what they were doing in this neck of the woods. They said they were camping and had been told to leave their campsite immediately. I became suspicious as we had no rangers working there. I asked them who they saw and they said that he was wearing a very old fashioned type of uniform and supposedly he had no face. At this point, shivers went up and down my spine. I told them to go and collect their equipment and they went and got their equipment and then I saw them leaving. I've only mentioned this to my friend who works in the park. He hasn't had any reports of such thing, not even up until this day. This is probably one of my scariest stories as a park ranger. I still have no clue what happened, but whenever I hear that in the dark in the middle of the woods, a shiver still went down my spine. Ghost stories have always been a love-hate situation for me. I've always enjoyed the unexplained as entertainment, but as with street magic, I find myself focusing on figuring out the plausible explanations instead of enjoying the experience. I would hear stories from friends and family, and I would respond with skepticism, probing questions, and a look of disbelief. Today, I look back on this behavior with a moderate amount of shame, because decades after my mission trip to a small city in Florida, I question what happened to me, and I recognize that look of disbelief in the faces of listeners as they listen to my own story. I was not raised in a religious family. I like to think of myself as an analytical person, and I try to rely on evidence for most of my beliefs. Growing up in Midwestern Michigan, there was a time in my adolescence that I'm sure many people experience. A time when I was looking for some place to belong. While many teenagers drive their parents nuts by surrounding themselves with drinking and drugs, my rebellion was in the form of a church in my hometown. It had a pretty robust youth group and they accepted me quickly. It was a safe place, a community that acted like a family I could confide in. I threw myself into it and spent a few years being embroiled in everything they did. So much so that my parents questioned whether or not I was in a cult. 
This prolonged encounter with the church was an important step along my personal development journey and would also become the catalyst for one of the most frightening moments of my life. This was during a mission trip that we took to Sarasota, Florida in the summer of 1997. Sarasota is a small city with a population of little more than 50,000 people. The city was very socioeconomically divided, being populated by the very rich and the very poor. The mission trip was located at a modest Baptist church within the city. The purpose was to conduct a vacation Bible school, or VBS, for the children that lived in the neighborhood, mostly economically disadvantaged youth. I knew nothing else about the church. We were given no information about the congregation or their beliefs ahead of time. The only background provided was that our youth pastor, David, made contact with this small church and agreed to donate our time to help coordinate the VBS program. I was relatively close with several of the people on the trip. However, we were joined by a student who was not a part of our youth group named Alvin. I don't remember exactly why he came, as I was never close to him, but I remember being told that Al's mother wanted him to be a Christian, in contrast to their heritage, an idea that at the time he seemed to be very disinterested in. A dry, straight-laced young man, he was almost an opposite personality of my friends and me, largely immature, outgoing goof-offs that were all looking for attention. Nevertheless, he attended the trip with the rest of us, we all loaded onto the bus and headed south. We arrived in Sarasota and got to work. The first part of the trip was pretty uneventful. Nothing seemed unusual. We worked, teaching certain classes ranging in topics that a normal, non-denominational Christian Sunday school would teach. It wasn't until the last couple of days where the trip started going off the rails. Close to dusk, the second to the last day of the trip, our group was outside, playing kickball with the children, while we waited for their parents to pick them up. It was a hot summer day in Florida, so many of us Michigan kids were not used to the humid, hot evenings that followed. I decided to go into the church and get a drink to cool down, escaping the large number of gnats that constantly accosted me whenever I stepped outside. The church itself was made out of white plaster, a common style for Florida. The exterior was peeling, but the inside seemed to have been cared for meticulously. The dark green carpet was everywhere except for the chapel, which itself was burgundy with gold designs. The building of the church was shaped like a T. You entered the double doors at the bottom of the T. The long hallway had an extended mirror, which was attached to one wall, and a sitting bench was on the other. There was wooden bedboard type paneling that went halfway up the wall to the mirror. As you continued down the hall at the T-junction, you could take a left and walk into the chapel, or you could go right and walk into a large dining room area that was filled with tables. I walked through the doors at the bottom of the T, and as teenagers are wont to do, I glanced at the mirror to check my own reflection, check the outfit, the hair, the overall appearance. Adolescence is a vain time. Anyway, as I looked in the mirror, I saw Alvin sitting in the bench opposite the mirror, just looking at me. I quickly questioned what he was doing inside away from everyone else. Hey Al, what are you doing man? Don't like kickball. And as I'm saying it, interrupting my sentence, he smiled in what felt like a disingenuous, menacing simper. He then raised his hand, formed a gun-shaped gesture, and winked while pointing it at me, clicking his tongue to make a sound. He was acting in a way that seemed uncharacteristic for who I knew Alvin to be. I chuckled and turned away from the mirror to speak to him, and as I did that, I realized there was nobody there. I looked back to the mirror to confirm that I was alone in the hallway. I didn't understand. I didn't just see him out of the corner of my eye. I mean, at first I did, but then I looked him right into the eyes with the mirror simply acting as a conduit. 
I heard the sound of his tongue, making what would soon be a familiar clicking sound. When the images of Al disappeared, the fright washed over me in what seemed to be similar to a panic attack, a tingling that transformed my warm body into a shaky, nervous husk of who I usually was. I ran outside and grabbed the first person I came into contact with, my friend Ronnie. Ronnie and I were not extremely close, but we had fun together because we were both outgoing, obnoxious, overconfident males that focused more on fun than the purpose of our visit. When I approached him, I immediately saw in his eyes that he knew something was wrong. Dude, I don't know what's happening. I just saw something super weird. I feel like I'm losing my mind. What happened? Ronnie asked, starting to smile with some humor at how freaked out I seemed. I don't... I just... I walked inside and looked in the mirror to see Al just sitting there and smiling at me, but it wasn't Al. It, it looked like him, but when I started talking to him, he just stared at me and made this gesture. At this point, I showed him the finger-pointing, winking gesture. Something about the way that I had recreated the look seemed to take the smile off Ronnie's face. But then when I started talking to him, I, I turned around to continue the conversation. Al wasn't there. He wasn't there. As if we were thinking the exact same thing, we turned to look to find where Alvin was at that moment. Our eyes scanned the crowd in opposite directions, both arriving at the same point where Al sat watching the kickball game. He was not partaking, as I remember him to be a sober, pensive kid, not the kickball type, and definitely not one who would have given me some weird pointing gesture while winking. Al is all the way over there. So what was it? A ghost? Like a, a demon or something? Ronnie asked, shocked. Dude, how the crap should I know? We spoke in very strange, surfer-like dialect for two mid-Michigan boys, I know. And then I saw this look of what seemed to be understanding wash over Ronnie's face. Like it all made sense to him. He said, you know what this is, right? This is Satan. He's trying to distract you from doing God's work. He has no power here. Let's go tell him. I followed Ronnie into the church, like we were on some kind of mission. It was empty again, but I felt this cold, uneasy feeling as soon as we stepped inside. As I said, it was the middle of summer in Florida, and we were inside an old church with barely functioning AC. But I remember instantly being chilled. And that's when Ronnie starts yelling. Hey, Satan, you ain't got nothing on us. Bring it. You can't stop us. What you got? Did I mention we were overconfident? We waited in silence for what seemed like an eternity, but was probably only 30 seconds. Nothing happened. We looked at each other, seeing what seemed to be a creeped out factor on each other's faces. We paused for a split second and then just began laughing out loud at the ridiculousness of the situation. Maybe I just overreacted, dramatic teenagers and whatnot. The evening ended after the last adult arrived to pick up their child. My youth group and I loaded the bus and headed back to the condo that we had rented. It was dark by this time, and I had calmed down a bit, momentarily forgetting what had happened. The bus ride took some time, so I usually would just sit there, looking out the window at the landscapes that were unusual to me, a boy from the north. We drove along the coast, passing interesting architecture surrounded by unfamiliar foliage common to the Florida ecosystem. As we rode, I looked out the window and saw a person sitting on a large stone sign for a different church, a Roman Catholic cathedral. I squinted to see him, as I was curious what this character was doing sitting on such a fancy-looking stone slab sign. As the bus got closer and closer, to my growing fright, I started to realize that the person sitting on the slab was somebody I knew. It was Alvin. He was sitting on the sign, looking down at his feet as he kicked them, his behavior resembling that of a much younger boy. 
As we passed this Alvin sitting on the sign, he looked up from his feet and looked directly at me. His eyes were not Alvin's eyes. They were different. Another, older, wiser man's eyes, piercing through the motion and distance. He looked at me and smirked with that menacing, threatening grin. As we began to pass, I turned my head to look at the front of the bus. Just a few seats ahead of me, Al sat, quietly doing what I had been doing a few moments before, looking at the water. I looked back out the window as we passed. The other Alvin raised his hand into the familiar gun-pointing gesture and pointed at me. What was even stranger? I could hear the clicking sound in my head, and I'm not sure how to explain this, but it wasn't coming from me. It wasn't my common inner monologue. It was someone else. It was something else. He winked. For lack of a better phrase, I began to freak out. I shouted and drew attention from some of my friends, my assistant youth pastor Jason, and my pastor David. I remember thinking that I was losing my mind. The intensity of Faux Alvin's eyes and the click of his tongue playing on repeat in my brain, and nobody seemed to understand my panic. David said we would talk once we got settled back at our condo and that I should just take a breath. We arrived at the condo. It was lavish accommodations to a small town kid, causing me to wonder how one would arrange payment for such a place, especially for a gaggle of teenagers. It had tall vaulted ceilings and the decor was designed in the early 90s. So it was fitted with brass lighting fixtures and lightly stained oak finishings. Exiting the bus, my knees were shaking. A fog of embarrassment settled over me as other kids gazed with an obvious wonder that only children with a lack of decorum would show. My youth pastors took me into a back bedroom away from the other kids, gave me a pint of haagen coffee ice cream, which assisted in calming my nerves, and settled me. Once settled, they proceeded to talk to me about what they thought was happening. David gave his version of what he believed was transpiring. There's a war happening, he said. A war between heaven and hell, where angels and demons are in a battle for the souls and sanity of God's followers. And what you and Ronnie did was incredibly stupid. You challenged Satan to a battle that you cannot win. He's too powerful. That was his foothold. You need to be careful. This did very little to calm my nerves. It seemed uncharacteristically morose of David to be that blunt, especially with a teenager, but he continued. Do not do that again. If you keep doing the right thing, God will protect you, but you cannot tell anyone else that this happened. It spreads fear that Satan thrives on. Being a naive young Christian at the time, I believed him. I thought that this war could seem possible, but I also trusted a mentor that I shouldn't share my story, and I would follow that advice for years. I went to bed early that night, trying to move past this experience, Alvin's face and the clicking gesture continuing to haunt my thoughts. It didn't work. The next day was our last at the church. We were done coordinating the VBS program, but the leaders of the church wanted to treat us to a dinner as a way of saying thanks. I didn't think about it at the time, but it was very strange that we hadn't yet met the pastor of the church until this dinner. Beforehand, we had packed up all of our belongings and were prepared to leave once we had finished dinner. We all sat in the east side of the church, in the dining area with all the tables, eating the spaghetti dinner that they had provided us. It was a happy scene. I looked around at everyone enjoying the meal, laughing and joking around the tables. Suddenly, the back door of the church opened and a cold gust of wind rushed past me. Bizarre for a Florida summer afternoon, followed by the entrance of a tall elderly man and two slightly younger women behind him. 
As with all members of the youth group, I had never met this man before. He was introduced to us as the pastor, but none of us recall ever hearing his first or last name. And all I could focus on were his eyes. They seemed familiar to me, although I couldn't place them. They weren't kind eyes, although I couldn't articulate that in my mind at the time. He spoke a short sentence or two of thanks to the group, and then proceeded to move past the tables, sharing short statements of small talk, referring to my friends as guy, ladies, or in the case of Ronnie, who was sitting next to me, young man. As he slowly approached me, I continued to eat spaghetti, because free food. The pastor moved deliberately behind me until I could feel his bony hand touch my right shoulder. I turned around to look and saw the pastor glaring straight into my eyes. Not a polite stranger's glance, but a deep, disturbing stare. Those eyes, I had seen those before. He took his hand off my shoulder and spoke. Hey, how's it going? He addressed me by name. Something was wrong, and it was immediately obvious to me. No one had met this pastor, and he didn't know any of us from Adam. He referred to everyone as such, with generic titles like son and darling. But he knew my name. He looked at me like he knew me. And then, he did it. He smiled in that familiar, menacing way, lifted his hand, made the pointing gesture while winking, and closed it out with the tongue click. I shot up and backed up quickly, clamoring for my footing as I knocked over some empty chairs, and I ran out of the dining hall. I ran to the adjacent chapel and did the only thing that came to mind at the time. I sat in a pew and cried. My pastor and my pastor's wife, Kathy, followed me shortly after. I expected to hear their voice of reassurance, the kind people that had been mentors to me for years. But that is not what followed. What are you doing? That was the rudest thing I've ever seen. What's wrong with you? David shouted. You're acting like a baby, Kathy exclaimed. This was extremely uncharacteristic for both of them, so I knew something was wrong. They were usually very calm, kind people in public. So I ran from them. I ran out of the chapel, down the long hallway, past the mirror where I had originally seen who I thought was Alvin, and out the front doors. Following directly after me, Kathy stepped out the door before the door even closed. I turned to see her expression transform from an angry hunter into a concerned caregiver. What's wrong, honey? Why are you crying? I knew immediately why the anger had left her. She had left the church. She was outside. Something was wrong with that place. After discussing what I felt had happened, I never went into that church again. I waited outside for the rest of my group to finish eating. Afterward, David, with a small group of us, did some kind of weird ritual where we anointed the church and its door with oil. He read some scriptures that were unfamiliar to me and we boarded the bus and left. I haven't spoken with David or Kathy in decades, but directly after this happened, Kathy, while coming short of saying that I was lying, disagreed with the sequence of events. She seemed to believe that she heard me making a ruckus outside, so she followed me directly out there, concerned for my well-being. David remembers being angry at me, and while he seemed more docile out of the building, he just treated me differently afterward. The church itself seems to have been disbanded. I can't find any mention of the church on the internet, and members of the youth group that I've kept in touch with have gone to Sarasota and have never been able to find the location, even though we took the same route several times a day. One particular friend said that there's just a field where that building used to be, as if this whole thing never happened. Because David had told me that I shouldn't talk about what had happened, I didn't discuss this experience with any of my church friends, at least not for a long while after. 
A few years later, I spoke about these events with friends that I made outside of the church, and my story is often met with a mixture of interest and skepticism that I often felt myself before I experienced this. I have since left my church, and I think I've personally arrived at a certain level of agnosticism. I like to think that I do not believe in ghosts or demons, but I also can't deny that which happened to me in the summer of 97. I don't have an explanation, and there are just too many things that don't make sense. I'm just hoping that I had a kind of mental break of sorts, because the alternative is far too frightening. I moved into my house about seven months ago, and it was a disaster. I'm not the richest person, so there was a deal struck, and I cleansed the house from the previous tenants. I hadn't seen the place before I moved in. It was a desperate situation I would rather not dive into. When I moved in, there was expired canned food and expired candy waist high from the living room to the kitchen. Literal crap was all over the floor. It was bad. There was a coal stove. It was a very old, rigged-together house. So the first thing I noticed was that in the basement, there's a tunnel that was dug out. It has a small turn, it's not very long, that leads to this small, circular, tiny room. That's the only way I can explain it. Maybe a small child could stand up in it, but I'm only five foot two, and I couldn't. All that's there is a light hanging from the middle of the ceiling. This is all just rock and cement. The only way that I can explain the light is like in the Brave Little Toaster, when they go to the store with the other appliances, that big lamp that sings. It's kind of like that. It's like a pendant light. Then I was using Facebook Messenger. I was sending a video of me playing my game on my laptop to my friend. It was only on my phone. It took up all the screen, even my time and notifications. I checked all of my Facebook stories and open tabs and nothing, but this weird footage cut through my recording. I still have no idea where this is. I've never seen it before. It didn't appear on the computer only on my phone. The video clip showed this marigold colored building and a couple of other places that I've never seen before. It was nowhere, anywhere on Facebook that I could find. So my 15 year old son and I were setting up the attic for his room. He had recently decided to move up to the attic. It was always used for storage. There's a tiny cubby hole that we were clearing out. To the far left wall, the small end of the wall was carpeted. Thinking that was really strange, I ripped the carpet down and found boards, and there was a crack in between two of them. So I used the flashlight and looked inside, and there was a whole other room, bigger than the cubby hole that we were already in. So of course, the two of us kicked the boards down. All that was in there was wooden shutters, wooden boards, pipes and debris, and a lot of insulation. I saw a piece of wood that looked strangely smooth and out of place, so I flipped it over, and it was a Ouija board. I've done some research since, and it's a 1939 William Fold mystifying oracle board. I did not find the planchette with it, but I did find this weird triangle thing made of wood. It had some runic stuff on it. My 15-year-old son said, screw this, I'm out, and left me there to be possessed by myself, I guess. Since then, I have put the board on the mirror of my dresser as a decoration. Everybody keeps telling me to get rid of it and burn it. I don't want to. I don't feel anything evil from it. I kind of really feel a connection with it. I'm not trying to be all Reagan Captain Howdy here, but it's the truth. I also forgot to mention the weird things that have been happening. Normal things, like toys going off, or things missing and reappearing. Recently, my friend and I, who is here frequently, 
have been seeing things. People. I saw a man. Twice. I chalked the first one up to my mind playing tricks on me. It was a split second. He was there, I looked at my phone, and he was gone. But a week later, I was driving down a dark back road that's really windy. I live out in the boonies, where there's nothing but woods everywhere. I was driving and, of course, paying attention because I had my son in the car. Not that I don't pay attention when it's just me, but you know. And there was nothing there. But when I looked in the rearview mirror, and I looked three separate times within the span of a few seconds, not ten feet away was a man slowly walking away from the car in the middle of the side of the street I was driving on. I would have had to have hit him, but like I said, nothing was there. He came out of absolutely nowhere, and there's no way he could have been there that fast. Not as close to the car as he was. He had a fedora or bowler hat looking thing on and what looked like a suit jacket, and he was walking very slowly. I saw him three separate times when I looked in the rearview mirror, and then he was gone. My 12-year-old son says that he didn't see him, and he didn't see the other man either. So I guess I really don't know what to do with all of this information. I guess what I really want is information as to what could be going on in this house. So if you have any ideas, let me know. So this happened a long time ago, but I just remembered it and thought maybe you guys would enjoy the story. I was in middle school at the time. It was the summer between my 7th and 8th grade year, so I was about 13 years old. A group of friends and I were all at a girl's house that we knew. She lived in a small duplex. We were young, but we were all somewhat obsessed with but also very skeptical of spooky stuff. One of us out of the blue suggested, hey, let's make a Ouija board and try to talk to spirits. I think you can tell where this is going. So we get out a paper and we made a board and used a shot glass as a planchette. It was all fun and games at first. We all put our fingers on the shot glass and played for a while, but eventually, most of the group got bored with it. We all sat around after that, just talking for a bit. Two of the other girls went upstairs to go to our friend's bedroom and do whatever nonsense they were going to do. And I got the bright idea to play with the board by myself. I know what you're all thinking. Bad plan. Everyone knows that's a bad plan. But hey, I was 13, and I didn't believe in any of it. Anyway... I did the thing, and just as I was about to say goodbye, two of my friends run back down to the room the rest of us are sitting in. One of them lifts her shirt to reveal scratches on her ribs, as if someone had dug their nails in and just scratched her up really badly. She looked down at me and screamed at me to say goodbye. I did, of course, and nothing happened after that. Everything was fine, and we all had a good time. To this day, I don't know if something paranormal was going on, or if it was just a weird coincidence. Either way, the girl that got scratched still brings this up to me every once in a while, even to this very day. Everything I'm about to tell you is true. Most of it happened between 2003 and 2005, with just a little bit of spillover. In 2003, I was a 20-year-old, recently single mother of a one-year-old son. When the father of my then child, now children, moved out, I had no desire to live alone in my apartment. So my two best friends, Heather and Jamie, moved in. Jamie also had a son who was a little over a year old at the time. The five of us made a little home, and things were good. 
At some point, and I've tried so hard to remember how it all started, but I can't, Jamie, Heather, and I kind of became addicted to using the Ouija board. I had bought this board at Kmart for like $8 one year, and I think it was for that reason that I didn't take it very seriously. But boy, was I wrong. When we first started using it, I remained pretty skeptical, even as it began to tell us some pretty accurate and intimate things. Looking back, I always thought that Jamie was the one moving the oracle. I knew it wasn't Heather because at times she was legitimately afraid. One day, I fought with the father of my sons. Super upset and crying, I hopped in my car by myself and just went for a drive. At the peak of being upset and alone in the car, I said out loud, is this my destiny or am I supposed to fight to save this? I went home to the loving arms of my friends and as we did most nights, we got out the board. The very first thing the board said that night was, destiny changes with every breath. Neither of them could have possibly known what I had just said in the car because I didn't tell them. That was the point when my skepticism started to fade away. We continued to use the board pretty much every night and it continued to tell us things that would come true. At this point, the entity had claimed to be our collective spirit guide, Ben. One night, we had a male friend at the apartment. He was asleep on the couch behind us as we sat in our circle on the floor around the board. Heather remembered something from that night that I did not until she mentioned it recently. She had felt a cold presence wrap around her arm and then shoot up her nose. She started to freak out, but as I already told you, she was the scaredy cat of the group. I was more annoyed than worried or scared. We convinced her to sit back down, and that's when the board said something about not being happy that our male visitor was there. Almost immediately, our visitor sat straight up on the couch and said, what are you bitches doing to me? He lifted his shirt and he had several tiny handprints all over his chest and stomach. That was likely the point when I realized that we might be dealing with something a lot darker than what it was selling itself as. What I didn't know then is that it was about to get much worse. We went to the local library and got some books on the occult. We brought them home but never looked at them. Until one night the three of us and the two babies had been out somewhere. We came home and put the boys in the playpen. I started running the vacuum. As I was vacuuming, I heard Heather and Jamie screaming hysterically. I stopped to find out what was happening, and that's when they told me that they had heard a very loud thump and then a child screaming bloody murder. They thought one of the boys had fallen from the playpen and gotten hurt, but both boys were still peacefully playing where we had left them when we went to check. As they're telling me this, I was suddenly overcome by the smell of rotten meat. I'm a bit of a neat freak, and therefore, there shouldn't have been anything to cause this smell. I started searching high and low for the source of the smell, but it seemed to keep moving every time I got close to it. Meanwhile, Heather had grabbed one of the roughly five books that we had picked up from the library, opened it to a random page, and started reading. She said, you have to come and read this. Annoyed, I replied, I can't stop until I find out where this smell is coming from. Very sternly, she said again, You have to come and read this. I looked at her, and she was ghost white with tears streaming down her face. I walked over and took the book from her. The first paragraph of the page to which she had randomly opened said, The scream of a non-present child accompanied by the smell of rotten flesh signifies the presence of pure evil. I wish I could tell you what we did in the following minutes. I don't remember. What I do remember is the next day we took all of the books back to the library and got a Bible. We brought it home, left it open on a chair in the living room, and left for the rest of the day. I'm not even a religious person, but it's funny what you'll do when you're scared. We never used the board in that apartment again. If that story is the cake, this is the icing. Fast forward to June of 2004. I had given birth to my second son in February. Jamie and I were living in a different apartment, and Heather was living with a boyfriend. Heather came to visit, and for whatever reason, after what had happened, I truly cannot explain why we chose to do it. 
we broke out the board. I only remember one question from that day. Heather said to the board, Jamie has a son. Referencing me with my name said, I have a son. When will I ever have children? And the board replied, seven for you. So that became a running joke for the next several months. Like, haha, Heather's going to have seven kids. Fast forward again, this time to January of 2005. I live with my children in yet another apartment. Jamie has moved in with her now husband, and Heather is living with a different boyfriend. I was laying in bed one night, and seven for you just popped into my head. Suddenly, it hit me. The board had said that in June, and it was now January. July, August, September. Seven months. Duh. Heather is pregnant now. I called her the next day to tell her that she was pregnant. She was very adamant that it was not possible. To shorten the back and forth we did for the next two weeks, yes, she absolutely was pregnant. She gave birth to her first son in October of 2005. Since then, we've done the math. She was only about two weeks pregnant when I first told her. Although we are all still friends, I don't know a lot about what they've experienced paranormal-wise in the years since. I know that Heather has had some pretty scary experiences in a house she lived in up until last year, where a previous tenant had committed suicide. I lived in the parsonage of a church for 10 years, and we had some pretty strange experiences there too, including a time that my younger sister and I watched a full grocery bag that was hanging on a doorknob lift off the door until it was completely horizontal and then drop back down. Even my skeptical mom saw shadow figures in that house. Now we are in a new house, and my son, remember the son who was one in the apartment? Yeah, he's almost 19 now. And my brother are having some unusual experiences in the basement, which is where their bedrooms are. I have pretty regular dreams too, where I'm screaming at demons to leave my family and I alone. But that's probably nothing, right? Right? I grew up in a large, dark, and damp cliché of what everyone pictures a haunted house would look like. For more than a hundred years, the house has loomed on top of a hill lined with foreboding oak trees, where murders of crows would frequently stop. I have an older sister, seven years older, who was a problem child and very into the occult, demons, and devil-worshipping. She would terrify my younger brother and I with stories and just the general way that she would look at us blankly. When she turned about 13, she became even more rebellious. She would run away and be missing for weeks or months. She was the one who originally introduced my brother and I to the Ouija board. My mother was an alcoholic, mentally ill woman and she was in charge of watching us kids while my dad worked the night shifts, and many times, double shifts. To say that our home had a bad energy would be an understatement. We would later learn the dark history of our home from the 90-year-old woman across the street. Mrs. Looker told us that our home was built as a home for unwed mothers. Many births and deaths happened there over the years. It served that purpose for about 20 years until it was forced to be shut down, and then it was sold to a family who lived there until 1970, when my father bought it for an unbelievable price. He still lives there today. The first prefacing experience is one that I only very vaguely remember, but my mom has told me in full detail many times, and my dad, who doesn't believe in ghosts, also corroborates. My mom was outside sunbathing and my sister was inside with a friend of hers. I went into the kitchen and grabbed a butter knife and was holding it in a fist with the top pointed to the ground when I slowly walked into the living room where my sister was playing with her friend. I had a blank look on my face and was shaking and I kept repeating, mommy needs help. She's fighting the devil across the street in a tunnel. My sister yelled for my mom and she came into the house and asked me what was wrong. 
and I just kept repeating. Mommy needs help. She's fighting the devil across the street in a tunnel. My mom kept shaking me and telling me that she was right there and to snap out of it. She said I was in that state for about an hour, where I was just staring off into nowhere, repeating the same thing. I finally snapped back into reality and started acting normally, but I didn't remember anything. My mom was convinced that I was possessed. Later that night, when it was bath time, she noticed I had three bad burn marks on my shoulder that she said looked like they were from claws. It's also important to note that my mother was abandoned as a child and adopted and herself has always been spiritual. She has experienced being saved by a guardian angel when she was young and found herself too far away from her rural house at nightfall and felt impending danger closing in on her. She can't explain what it was, but she knew she was in danger and was very scared. She closed her eyes and opened them, and all of a sudden, she was on her front porch, which was hundreds of yards away from where she had started. The next experience was from my younger brother's perspective. He's younger by a year and a half, and we shared a bedroom and bunks until I was 11. I slept on the top bunk, and he was on the bottom bunk. Our room was always extremely messy, with toys scattered all over. One morning at about 4 a.m., my brother woke up and said that he saw my mom crouched down cleaning up the toys. He only saw her back and her hair, which was a mix of gray and dyed blonde. My mother always wore a long, light blue flowy nightgown to bed, which was easily recognizable. He didn't think anything of it and went back to sleep. In the morning when we both woke up, the room was spotlessly clean, and I asked him how it had happened. That was when he explained that he had seen my mom in there cleaning in the middle of the night. At breakfast, we asked her why she had decided to clean our room at such an hour, and needless to say, she told us that she had never been in the room. She went in to look and was amazed at how clean our room was since it was never like that. Around this time, my brother started getting frequent night terrors that would scare the living crap out of me. I'd wake up to him screaming, standing in the corner of the room facing the wall and banging his head on the wall. Sometimes he would be apologizing to God over and over. Sometimes he would be sitting in the middle of the room with his knees to his chest, hands draped around his knees, rocking back and forth and saying things that didn't make any sense while bawling his eyes out. My dad would come down the long, dark hallway to our room and try to snap him out of it. Sometimes he would slap him hard just to see if he could get a reaction, but his demeanor would never change. Eventually, my dad said to just leave him be, because nothing seemed to wake him up out of it. And if you can imagine, this was terribly scary as a kid. I'd wake up in a living nightmare, scared out of my mind, having to watch him do this, sometimes for an hour straight, until he would just climb back in bed and fall asleep. I remember one particularly scary episode when I woke up. He was just sitting on the dresser, on the dresser, cross-legged, with his back to the mirror, covering his eyes and crying, and just saying, no, I won't, you can't make me look. I would try talking to him and sometimes he would respond, but with very simple answers. I grabbed him by the hand and told him that we should get some water. He got off the dresser and followed me to the bathroom, but refused to go in. I went in and turned the faucet on so he could drink out of it, but he didn't want to go into the bathroom because of the mirror above the sink. I finally pushed him in, and he looked at himself in the mirror and let out the loudest blood-curdling scream. He was so frightened at whatever he saw that he passed out. This continued for years and would happen probably once every two to three months always in the wee hours of the morning. When I finally moved out of that room, down the long hallway to the big bedroom at around age 11, it was almost scarier walking up and down there alone, hearing my brother's fits down the hall. Waking up in a room by myself, hearing it from far away, had a different feel. A few more important details about this house that you'll need to know is that the electrical and plumbing systems were very old and had never been updated. As a result, many lights would never work, including the most important one for me as a child, the light in the long dark hallway outside my room, 
which connected to my brother's room, sister's room, and the only bathroom, which was straight down the hallway. When my brother was having his fits, I'd open the door and reach my hand to flick the light. It would rarely work. If I wanted to go check on him, I'd have to run down the hallway in the pitch dark, feeling the walls to get to his room. That was the worst. So many times I'd be too scared, and I would just stay in my room with my light on. Now, the old plumbing and piping in the house meant that when you turned on a faucet, not only would it sometimes be a rusty red color for a few seconds, and then turn into clear, normal-looking water, but there was a distinct whistle sound when it came on, which intensified with the stronger stream. Many times I would wake up, and down the hallway, I would hear the whistle and the water on full blast in the bathroom. I'd have to sprint down there in the pitch-dark hallway to flick on the bathroom light and shut it off. Imagine that dread for a second. Not only do you have to sprint down the hallway toward the scary noise in the dark, but you think that anything could be in that bathroom when you flick the light on. Then I'd have to sprint down the dark hall again to my room. The worst part is that after I would shut it off and get back to sleep, I'd wake up an hour later to the same thing. This happened intermittently for years. My dad always said that it was just my brother doing it to scare me, but he always denied it, and it would be a pretty elaborate hoax to pull off for so many years. The last thing I want to preface before getting into the terrifying Ouija night, although I have a few more stories I could tell, regards one of my girlfriends in my adult years. I was dating a beautiful Venezuelan woman with long black hair. We dated for about a year before I learned of her childhood in Venezuela, where she gained local notoriety as an incredibly powerful medium. Some days, she claimed as many as 30 ghosts would be trying to communicate with her, and through her. It got so bad that her mother had taken her to Zimbabwe to a witch doctor, who was renowned for being able to reverse or suppress the powers that mediums have whenever it got too overwhelming for them. I know, I couldn't believe it either. But when I met her mother, she told me the whole thing and she cried while telling me the story. My girlfriend also showed me the scars on her ankles, knees, and wrists, tiny little slits that I had never noticed before where the witch doctor cut her to drain some of her blood for the ceremony. How did this topic of her being a medium come up? Well, we were staying at a friend's house for his annual party where we were playing drinking games, hanging out in his pool, and doing a bonfire. Everyone stayed in the house, but my girlfriend and I brought my new tent and blow-up mattress and stayed in his backyard. It was a pretty rural area, and his backyard adjoined to a big cornfield. In the morning, we were pillow talking, and I thought she was just trying to scare me when she said, Did you hear the little girl outside the tent last night? I played along and said, Yeah, that was creepy, right? She said that she circled around the tent a few times and then ran into the cornfield. The whole day I didn't think anything of it, because I thought we were just playfully trying to scare each other that morning. Later that night, I told my friend Mark, who owns the house, that my girlfriend said that she heard a little girl hanging around our tent. His face went white, and he said, Wait a minute, how do you know about the little girl? Are you serious? I said, What are you talking about? I thought she was kidding. Apparently there's some urban myth story on his street that a little girl, who went missing decades ago in the cornfields, sometimes comes out at night. He said he always thought it was bull. This is when I asked my girlfriend if she'd been serious, and she did say that she actually heard the little girl. That's when she came clean with the whole medium backstory. She said after Zimbabwe her powers weren't as strong, but she would still get periodic ghosts that would try to talk to her. After I corroborated her crazy childhood medium story with her mom, I had brought her to my dad's house where I grew up so she could meet my dad and she could only stay in the house for a few minutes before she had to leave. She said that the dread she felt in there was the most overwhelming sense of dread she had ever felt in her life, and that she never wanted to return. So, to the Ouija board night. My brother is now 20 years old, and I'm 22. My mom lives in a house in our small city's downtown area, and my brother spends a lot of his time there because she lets him drink and smoke there. 
He'd been there with his girlfriend, playing with a Ouija board all night when I got there, after a night drinking with friends. The door was locked, so I knocked. He came flying down the stairs and swished open the curtain to see me standing there. He had the literal look on his face like he had just seen a ghost. I've never seen him so scared. He just tells me to come inside and that I wouldn't believe what was going on. He says that he and his girlfriend have been playing the Ouija board and they have this very strong, evil spirit who calls himself AZ that's been talking to him all night. He's AZ because he encompasses everything and is omnipresent, apparently. He said that AZ had been spelling out kill mom and saying evil things about her all night long. She was sleeping in the room next door through it all. AZ was also very vulgar. My brother said that he'd knocked down a crucifix off the wall and opened and closed the bathroom door just a few minutes before I got there. The hair on the back of my neck was standing up because I believed my brother and I felt the dread, but I didn't have proof that I had seen with my own eyes. I watched them playing and the planchette was whipping around the board answering questions very quickly. AZ fixated on me and started by spelling out, brother. My brother asked if he wanted to talk to me, and AZ said no. He asked if he liked me, and AZ said no. I then asked my brother to tell him that I don't believe in him, and that I need a sign. AZ spelled out, die. He then asked if he was going to hurt me. AZ said no, and then spelled out, mom. At that point, I went into my mom's room just to make sure she was okay, and she was. When I was in her room, I stubbed my toe and tripped a little. I came back out into the living room and told Dan that mom was okay. My brother commanded him to leave my mother alone. He said that I wanted to see a sign, and AZ spelled out, trip. I started to feel a little wave of energy come over me, and I was thinking, did he just see me stub my toe? My brother asked him what he meant by trip, and I told him that I had just stubbed my toe and tripped in mom's room. Then I said, ask him if he could hear me, and I started addressing him myself. AZ said that he could. I said if I write down a word on a piece of paper, would he be able to see it and spell it? And he said maybe. I asked if he would do it, and he said no. So, I did something I probably shouldn't have done. I started to verbally abuse him a little bit, calling him a coward and some other names, and that if he really wanted us to know who he was and that he was real, he would do it. The planchette started to fly around the board without stopping anywhere, but eventually spelled out short. I asked if it wanted me to write short words, and it replied, yes. I went to the far side of the apartment with a piece of paper and a pen, and I wrote down C, like the ocean. I came back, and my brother asked him if he saw what I wrote and to spell it. The planchette slowly circled around the board and landed on S and then it slowly went to E. My heart raced and I almost started crying, but then it landed on X. My brother asked me if that was the word, and I said no. My brother started cursing at AZ, calling him a pervert, and telling him to quit playing around. That was when the planchette promptly spelled out C. I said, oh my gosh. That's when the planchette slid off the board with a pretty strong force and my mom's cat came running out of my mom's room to the living room. It jumped on the couch and scrambled across it and then crawled under the table. It was terrified of something. I have goosebumps every time I recount this. When my brother got AZ back on the board, I proceeded to keep playing the spelling game. Next with ocean and then cream and then three or four more words. Each time I would go to a completely different room and make sure that nobody could see what I wrote except for me. I folded it up and put it in my pocket so nobody could see through the paper. Every time I came back to the living room, AZ had spelled out the words with ease, faster and faster. I left the house and told my brother to be safe and I went to my friend's house up the road 
because there's no way in hell I was going back to my dad's that night. I can't really explain the feeling you get when you just know without a doubt that they are real. Things that are other than you. I was overwhelmed with every emotion at the same time. Make no mistake about it, folks. They do exist. Back in 2017, we went on a Caribbean cruise, and our ship was called the Harmony of the Seas. My whole family slept in the same cabin. My little sister and I shared a bunk bed which could be separated from the rest of the room by a curtain. It was our first night, and I woke up at 4.27 a.m. I thought my sister was looking at me from the corner of the curtain, so at first I was like, what are you doing? But it didn't take long before I realized that it was not my sister. I had no clue who or what was watching me. So I turned on my light as fast as I could, but it was gone. I considered staying up until somebody would wake up, but I was so jet-lagged that I just fell back asleep again. The next night, the exact same thing happened. Someone with long, dark hair was staring at me. I was like, oh no, not this again. And just like the night before, I turned my light on as fast as I could, and it disappeared. I checked the time on my phone, and again it was 4.27. Needless to say, I kept my little light on for the rest of the cruise, and thankfully I didn't see her again. I suppose you could say I was having sleep paralysis, but I don't know how I would have been able to move that fast if that was the case. I don't know if anybody else has had an experience like this on the same ship or in that region, or maybe there's some kind of tragedy there on that ship that would have resulted in a ghost, but if you know anything, let me know. So it's 1982 and Ronald Reagan is turning the US Navy from 400 ships into 600 ships because of the Soviet Union. So the Navy takes a lot of old ships that they mothballed in Bremerton, Washington and tow them over to Tacoma to refurbish them and bring them back into service. I'm sure they did this everywhere they had old Navy ships. So I get a job as a security guard with a company being contracted with Tacoma Boat who have a huge contract with the U.S. Navy. I can't remember the name of the ship, but it was an electronic warfare ship, which means I have no idea what it was for. Probably a spy ship that listened in on Soviet ships and submarines, but I'm just guessing. I wasn't from the Navy. I was a civilian security guard with eight hours of security training under my belt, assigned to walk the entire ship every couple of hours. Me and another guy, and the other guy was crazier than a squirrel on meth, but hey, when you're paying your guards three fifteen dollars per hour, you take what you can get. We took turns walking the ship, as we called it, had to go all over to make sure that nobody was there. The workers got there at 6am and left by 7pm. Lots of expensive tools lying around, as well as paintbrushes paint guns, sanders, all kinds of things that one could sell if you ripped them off. So that's what we were for. Nobody was supposed to be on the ship at all, except for me and the hyperactive mental fellow security guard. We took turns. I would walk the ship one hour, and he would walk it the next. Then me the next, and so on and so forth until our shift was over at 6 a.m. The ship appeared to be pretty much gutted of just about all of its electronic equipment. I was told that all of the old equipment was being replaced with new, but they had to paint it all inside and out first, and they were still in the painting phase. Also, they were working on the engines below, hence all the tools that I saw in the engine room. I worked there maybe five days at most, not even that. It was a long time ago. I would hear voices. I'd be in one room and voices would come from the corridor. 
I'd be in the corridor and voices would come from a room. Just the voices of men, like they were talking to each other. I'd go into the corridor when I heard the voices and I'd see nobody and hear nothing. Then the voices would come from a certain room. I'd rush in there and, again, nobody there. Silence. I concluded that there were radios on the ship and some kind of PA system that I wasn't familiar with. I told the other guard about the voices. He said, man, that's wild. I mean, you know, I don't know. He was either crazy or high and I couldn't tell which. I asked him if he was playing a joke on me and he laughed and denied it. I still wasn't sure because he looked pretty crazy. This was long before drug testing. The last night I was there, same thing, the voices all over the place. One of the mechanics who worked on the engine came in early at about 5 p.m. and was sipping coffee in our guard room, which was part of a trailer. I said, I'm hearing those voices again all over the ship. Must be some kind of radio. The mechanic swallowed his coffee hard and shook his head. Nope, no radios on this ship. Took them all out. They're going to install new ones, but they're not here yet. I was stunned. I said, are you sure? He took another sip of coffee and nodded yes. I didn't go back. Today, I kind of regret not going back and trying to communicate with the entities on that ship. This happened to me almost a year ago, and I still can't explain it. My mom and I and my siblings went on a cruise in October of 2019. After a trip to Calgary, I went back to our cabin, while the other three already went to the restaurant. I just wanted to bring our bags to the cabin and then go to the restaurants too. So I entered our cabin, and everything started to feel... blurred. I can't find a better word for it. I started to feel very confused, and I wasn't even sure I was in the right cabin anymore, even though I opened the door by myself with our key. I checked the room and decided, yeah, that's our room, but this weird, confused feeling stayed. Then I noticed my mom's old, golden phone with the broken screen, and a picture of my siblings as a background on the table. I asked myself, why did they bring her old phone to this cruise? and flight mode wasn't turned on, and that made me pretty angry. So I took the phone, turned on flight mode, and left the room to find my family in the restaurant. When I arrived there, I asked them about the phone, but nobody knew that they took it with us on the cruise. I didn't believe them, but I also started to doubt what I saw since I was already feeling so weird. We went back to our cabin, and the phone was gone. I had touched this phone, picked it up, turned on flight mode, and set it right back down. I started to feel very uncomfortable about what happened, but still, nobody believed me. After a while of discussing, my family decided to ask housekeeping about the phone. And yes, there was a phone. As a reminder, I saw a golden phone with a broken screen with a photo of my siblings on it, and the phone language was German. But the phone that had really been there was black, with a template as a background, and the phone language was Hindi. It was the phone of the housekeeper. He had forgotten it in our room and took it back when I left the cabin. But why did I see what I saw? Why did I have this extreme blurry feeling as soon as I entered that room? Why would I have seen my mom's old phone instead of that one, and our pictures, and German? I have no answer to this. I wasn't drinking, it wasn't hot. I have no idea how to explain this. And this story isn't mine, but I always thought that it was really interesting, and I recently got permission to tell it. It's strange, but entirely true. Whether you believe it or not, I hope you at least find it interesting too.
In the 2000s, my mom, out of nowhere, experienced some unusual occurrences, which I suppose could be described as visions. It only happened a handful of times, and with a pretty large time gap in between them. Each vision was only a few seconds long, during which a vivid and lifelike image or moving scene would gradually materialize in front of her. It lasted long enough for her to see it, and then it dissipated. In the first, in 2000, she was in a cafe at Christmas time and was admiring a fellow customer's long blonde hair, when suddenly she saw her in a casket with her hair tied in a braid. It was so jarring that she left shortly afterward, disturbed by what she had seen and unable to find a cause for it. In the second experience in 2005, she was in a meeting with her attorney and a scene began playing to the left of her desk, showing the woman in a garden of flowers, dressed in soft, light-colored clothing and glowing with pure happiness, as if she had an aura around her. My mom felt that although it was awkward, she couldn't leave without knowing and decided to tell her what she had seen. The attorney, who had throughout the meeting been very professional but unmoved by anything, was so stunned that she got tears in her eyes and confirmed that it was true. She loved flowers and was happiest when gardening. The third and final time this happened was in 2008, which is my favorite story and the one that I find most interesting. We moved to a new house that year, an odd place in that the house itself was tiny, but there was a disproportionately large backyard and a lawn running about 50 feet wide and 140 feet long. At the very end, there was a small embankment or grassy knoll directly behind which sat a canal of water, like the kind that people sail barges down for fun. It was the first time that we had ever lived so close to a body of water, and we would watch people sail their boats there on weekends, feed bread to the passing ducks, all was well. But then there came another vision, this time about the water. She was sitting on her bed one morning, just thinking about her day, when a scene began materializing before her. Only unlike the other two, she was a part of this one and not just a spectator. In it, she was a young child who found herself running down to the bottom of our yard one night in order to see the boat that was sailing by. She ran all the way down, just in time to catch the boat as it came past, a 1920-style riverboat, all lit up, similar to the kind that were popular in the southern states. She said that she felt strongly like it was a regular occurrence, running down to catch the boat as it passed, like something she did every week. The boat did not sail on the water of the canal, which of course would have been too shallow, but almost appeared to float as if there was a deeper body of water sitting above the real one. She could see the faces of the people on the boat with perfect clarity, watching them as they waved to her like they knew her. There were women in dresses with parasols and the sound of saloon-style pianos, honky-tonk or something similar. It was like a party was in full swing, she said, everybody having a ball. When the boat had almost fully passed and the vision began to dissolve, my mom's overriding thought afterward was, how could a riverboat fit on a barge canal? She found the whole experience thoroughly eerie, much more than the other two visions, and can still remember the faces and music even now, more than a decade on from the event. She has no connection to the states in which riverboats were popular during that time, being European born and raised nor any interest in that particular time boat nor river boats, though she's thoroughly creeped out by them to this day. We were playing a game recently in which a river boat appeared, and it unsettled her so much that she quit playing. I know it might all mean nothing, and could just be a random glitch of the imagination or a trick of the mind or something, but I find the details very compelling, especially the part about being a child. I hope somebody has some input on it, but... Either way, I hope you enjoyed the story. When I was younger, I used to live by the woods, and I could see a cemetery from my back porch. On Easter, I remember waking up and seeing the Easter Bunny. 
one of those terrifying costumes. And what really gets me is that I remember smelling wet hay. When I woke up, I didn't tell anybody, but there was an extra Easter egg in my house that my parents didn't hide. Years later, when I was in high school, I asked my parents if they had ever dressed up like the Easter Bunny and had come into our room. They said that they would never go through so much trouble. Then my younger sister, who I shared a bunk bed with when this happened, said that she remembers when the Easter Bunny came into our room and made a remark about the hay smell. I was terrified that we both remembered seeing a person dressed as a bunny in our room. To make it even stranger, I told the friends I sat with at lunch what happened. One of the girls was my neighbor across the street. She told me that one Easter, a long time ago, she looked out her window during the night and saw the Easter bunny standing in her driveway. I had chills, and to this day, I'm terrified of people in rabbit costumes. I'm a carer, and I have been for about five or six years. I prefer to work nights, as it's a calmer working experience. I've seen and heard many strange things, but two stick out, and I thought I'd tell you about it. The first one. I was on shift one night, and every hour we have to do checks on the residents to make sure that they're okay and still with us. So I'm doing my checks, and everything is going okay, until I get to the last room. This lady likes her door closed at night, so the light in the corridor doesn't wake her up. And I go to open her door, but I couldn't move it. It was as if someone was pushing it shut from the other side. I try two or three times to open it, and it just won't budge. Fearing that the lady has fallen behind it, I go to get the nurse on shift and my colleagues. Each of us try to open the door, but it won't move. After 20 minutes or so, the door opens easily, as it should do, and the lady was asleep in bed, snoring away, and there's nothing there to have kept the door closed. I should mention that this was in a part of the building that no one likes to be alone in, as it always feels like you're being watched. On a couple of occasions, a shadow has been seen in some of the rooms. The second. I came in on shift and found out that one of the residents had passed away just 30 minutes before the night staff got there. We were waiting for the undertakers to come and collect the body. It could be up to two hours before they got there. As we were going about our job, the buzzer went off in that room. I went and switched it off and left the room. His buzzer went off every 10 minutes until the undertakers arrived, and none of us could ever explain why or how it was doing that. This story happened three years ago when I was 15. It happened in my village. I don't tell this story much because people tend to think that I'm making it up, but I've been thinking of it quite a lot this week and I just wanted to share it. My village is located in a rural area that is protected by the government because it has been considered a natural paradise for the last 30 years. This means that exploration in this area is quite difficult nowadays since it is forbidden to cut trees, which means that it is a huge forest. I was spending my summer there, and my favorite thing was to go hiking, although I had never gone into the woods alone, just on roads with people. My grandma had told me the cleaning services had opened and rehabilitated a path that had been covered in bushes and trees for the last 30 years because of a race that was being prepared, like runners and stuff. Usually I'd go to the nearest town about an hour away on foot, by the only way that I knew, the road. On my way back from seeing friends there, I took the new path that my granny told me was safe. I went alone. That was a mistake. 
The first part of the path was the easiest, just too many obstacles and landslides, but it was nothing compared to the rest. The second part was a hill full of rocks that was the hardest thing to go up. Literally, I had to climb up on my arms and legs like a dog. When I got to the top, I looked around and found some animal bones. I didn't pay much attention to it since the area is known for its big population of wolves and bears that go out at night. I continued my way faster than before. This part was plain floor, where the woods really begin, so it was a relief when I got to a dead end. Some huge trees had fallen exactly on a row on the path, and it was impossible to cross them. This seemed really off to me, because there were no other fallen trees. The weirdest part? Beside those trees, there was this little barn. Yes, a barn in the middle of the woods. I thought to myself that it was probably abandoned. It looked like it. So I decided to throw my bag into the little field that belonged to the barn, and I crossed the fence. I crossed it running without realizing the most bizarre thing. The field had no trees. It was clear. No bushes, no big plants, nothing. It really shouldn't be like that if it was abandoned, and nobody had been able to cut anything down there for years. I started feeling concerned about how the location of the fallen trees was so coincidental, how there casually was this barn beside a clear field when the path had been closed for 30 years. It just seemed really off. I went on, and luckily, I was reaching the last hill that my grandma had described, the one that connected with the village. Suddenly, there was a moment of silence in the woods. Absolute silence, which allowed me to hear some branches cracking behind me. I thought to myself it was probably a bird or something, but they came closer, and they sounded like footsteps. After trying to convince myself it was probably just an animal, I was way too afraid to look back. I started walking faster. And guess what? So did the footsteps. I just took off running after I noticed that, and so did the footsteps. At this point, I was running for my life. Suddenly, I started to hear incredibly loud grunts. Everything was going really fast. Luckily, I got to my village in a minute or so after that. I got onto the patio of the first house I found and closed the door. It was a relative's house, no need to call the police. I stayed there for 10 minutes until I got my breath back, and then I went home. I get chills just from remembering the place, not having a signal in the middle of nowhere. And the grunts. It makes me think there was something following me since the barn and the trees were just a distraction to slow me down. I never went into the woods alone after that. During my time at university, I had a part-time job at a huge Bavarian company. The building had eight floors and a quadratic shape with a big lobby hall in the center of the building. It actually was hundreds of years old, but completely renovated. I worked once or twice a week, mainly on weekends. Now here's the interesting part. I worked in night shifts, and my job was basically to walk around the whole building twice a night. While walking through the hallways, I just had to watch out for stuff that people forgot when they rushed into the weekend open doors, open windows, light switches, things like that. Nothing out of the ordinary, and the payment was also really good. In fact, I was kind of surprised about how good the payment was, because obviously I didn't have to do much in those eight hours. My girlfriend and other friends mentioned that the payment is just fair, as I had to walk around a huge building at night, completely alone. They always mentioned how they would never do this, Sometimes my girlfriend would visit me there to bring me dinner. They said that the sinister feeling in buildings like these would play mind games with them. I never had problems being alone. Neither was I paranoid, nor did I believe in paranormal occurrences. Just studied throughout the night and did my two walks. 
until this one night in September of 2018. The shift started like any other. I got the keys from the janitor and started studying after my first walk through the building. Between 3.55 and 4.05 a.m., the whole electronic system throughout the entire building resets, which I found really odd at my first shift, but grew to ignore it after some months. The janitor explained the reason after I asked. The reset leads to light sources turning on and off throughout the whole building, systematically, but still chaotic. I sat at the front desk, not even paying attention to it, when suddenly a certain noise reached me. One of the two elevator doors in the first floor opened itself, closed itself, and then opened itself again. Meh, malfunction, I thought, going back to reading boring scientific papers. After 20 minutes, it happened again, but this time, the light in the elevator switched off, which seemed really odd. At this point, I started to feel a little bit alarmed. When I moved into the elevator, the door behind me closed. I panicked and tried to get out of the elevator, but the elevator even started to take me to the second floor in complete darkness. When I reached the second floor, the door opened and I basically fell out of the elevator door, turning around while I fell. The really sinister looking, completely dark elevator closed again and took off to another floor. My heart was racing and a part of me thought someone manipulated the console, but another part of me felt something else, fear. I had goosebumps all over my body and I returned to the front desk with the plan to text my supervisor and the janitor about a technical defect in the elevator. I did this with trembling hands when I suddenly heard another distant noise, radio music from somewhere in the canteen. I slowly moved to the canteen with my smartphone light switched on. The noise came from the kitchen and I followed it. Reaching the kitchen, I saw that a radio was playing music on some of the tables. The cooks listened to the radio while working. I froze and I couldn't breathe. During my first walk, the janitor texted me and told me to put the radio under a certain desk and switch it off as the cooks would always store it there. I did this directly when I started the shift, even texting him to confirm that I had and to ask where the desk was because at first I couldn't find it. I turned around and sprinted through the canteen directly to an exit and waited outside for the last two hours. Luckily, I had the keys with me when someone for the day shift came. When he arrived, I got into the building with him, took my bag and left quickly. I called myself in sick for the next two weeks. After that, I quit the job using excuses regarding my sleep cycle. Till this day, I have no idea what happened that night. At one of the prisons that I worked at, we had three T dorms and four open bay dorms. Our open bay dorms do not have any cells and it's just lined up with bunk beds. An open bay is set up to where you walk in the front door and you have a hallway. Your officer station is right in front of you and you have wings on both sides that you're able to overlook, but they're separated. The only restroom that's available to officers is located in the hallway as soon as you walk in. No inmates have access to that hallway, obviously. Keep the bathroom location in mind, because I'll come back to that later. Anyway, I was working an overnight shift while covering for someone. This dorm is the dorm that holds a lot of our criminals that end in file. Most of them are in their 60s to 80s, and they usually don't really give you much of a problem. So typically, you're assigned to that dorm by yourself at night, unlike our other dorms that hold offenders that are younger. Our captain makes his rounds every night and checks on each dorm. You're able to hear when somebody's keys are put into your front door, and you're able to hear another person walking in the hallway. I was on hour 14 of my shift, 
And considering that I was sitting in a dark room with no cell phone, books, or anything to do or read, I began to doze off. I heard the key in my door, and I woke up with a start, because I knew that the captain would chew me out and potentially fire me if he found me asleep. I heard my front door open, and I heard footsteps coming toward my officer station. It's not a very long hallway. After about two minutes, I still heard walking around, and I heard the distinct jingling of keys, which again, no inmates have access to, obviously. I looked out of my officer station window, and I didn't see anybody. So I walked into the hallway and knocked on the bathroom door, and there was no answer. I decided to go out and check both wings of the dorm, just to make sure that my captain was okay. I walked onto the left wing, and as soon as I did, I heard a toilet flush and a shower come on. I was highly confused and irritated at this point, because all of the inmates were asleep. I shined my flashlight toward the bathroom, but there was nobody in sight. I walked around the bathroom for a bit to make sure nobody was hiding, but again, there was no one. Also, my captain wasn't even in the dorm yet, but still I was hearing the jingling of keys. At this point, I was fed up and exhausted, so I decided to leave the wings and use the officer restroom. As I was in there, I heard keys and the footsteps again, coming from outside the door. I also heard whistling, but it wasn't heavy male footsteps or a male whistle. It was dainty footsteps, as if it was a female officer in my dorm. I kept hearing it, but I never saw anything. When I woke the inmates up for their morning breakfast, one of them said, Miss, you ran into Sergeant. She comes in to visit us often. Don't pay her any mind. The Sergeant has a last name, but for privacy reasons, I'm withholding it. I just let that comment go and I walked them to the chow hall and eventually I asked my captain if he had been in my dorm that night. He said that he had not because he was caught up in our max unit dealing with an important issue. The sergeant was apparently killed by an inmate. She had her throat cut after not providing extra toilet paper back when this was a 100% maximum security prison in the 70s. She clocked in and was never able to clock out. And apparently, she's still doing her rounds. My parents have owned a tavern and restaurant for 14 years in my small town. My father is somebody who likes to start new projects and is a well-known person in our town. One day he was contacted by the local realtor to offer him a private showing of a historic hotel that had been up for sale. This hotel had been around for decades and went from a hotel to a restaurant to a bar with little success. Everyone who had ever owned it before had put it back on the market within a year. The bank had the title now and the realtor told my father, if you don't buy it and fix it up, they plan on ripping it down. A lot of people in the town thought that the only person who could save it was my father, so he bought the hotel. My parents kept the downstairs bar and renovated the upstairs for apartments. That's when odd things began to happen. My father would come home almost every night with the camera footage to show my mom and I. The footage always showed an empty pool room with small random orbs floating in the foreground. My father's a believer in the paranormal, but my mother is not. So she and I both chalked it up to bugs and dust. Although I will agree, the way these orbs zigzagged around the room was weird. It still seemed like nothing though. A month goes by and my father comes home early on a Sunday from working down at the hotel. He walked into the house, spooked, something that my father rarely is. He told us how he was behind the bar, checking on receipts from the night before, when he heard footsteps approaching from the hallway entrance. We don't open on Sunday. But if somebody that my dad knew saw his truck in the parking lot, they would just walk in to see him, 
So at first, he didn't find the footsteps odd at all. Without looking up from his receipts, he called out, We aren't open, but give me a second. He heard the footsteps enter the bar room and take six more steps toward him before stopping. Taking another second to finish going over last night's shift, he looks up and peers around the wooden support beam, but there's nobody there. There was nobody anywhere. He said he got out of there so fast he doesn't even remember locking the door behind him. My mom obviously thinks he's crazy, but I'm freaked out. That place had always kind of given me the creeps, but my father confirming my fears made me never step foot in that building again. Two days ago, my mom had an experience there that sent her out the door faster than my dad. She was in the bar room before opening hours, collecting the shift money from the night before. She wasn't in there for more than five minutes before she started to hear the faint sound of music coming from the entrance hallway. She said that she ignored it for a while, assuming it was one of the tenants upstairs. After collecting the money, she went to leave and the music began to get louder. She said it sounded like old waltz music, piano-based, and was clear as day. The farther she walked down the hall toward the bathrooms, the more prominent the noise became. As she stepped in front of the women's room, she said it sounded like someone was in there playing the music on their phone. By this time, my mom was sufficiently freaked out and ran out of rational reasoning behind what it could be. Just as she was about to open the door, she said that she heard the water turn on and off twice before running out of the building. In the parking lot, she called my dad to come down, certain somebody had to be in there with her. But when he came down to check it out, nobody was there. Now, my mom is a believer, and we are both properly terrified of that old creepy hotel. Update. The bar and hotel burnt down last week. The cause was listed as undetermined. It's a total loss. After my father left the military, he worked in aerospace and frequently had to visit different countries. He and my mother lived in Bitburg, Germany for a year or two. They lived in an old building next to the base. This happened before I was born, and my mom has told this story a few times, as it was an experience that made her believe in ghosts. One evening, my mom was doing dishes. The kitchen had a door at the end that led downstairs to the ground level. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw a man in uniform just outside the window. Thinking it was somebody from the base looking for my dad, she opened the door to find nobody standing there. She freaked out and called security. They arrived and she described the man that she had briefly seen. One of the guys said, oh, you saw him? Yeah, he's been around here for quite some time. Then he went on to explain that the building they were in had been remodeled from part of a hospital which was active during World War II. My mom had seen the ghost of this German officer. Part of my mom's job is that she works in a school. She works with kids who have special needs. The preschool she works at is kind of notorious for being haunted. She told me that's what her coworkers would tell her from time to time. My mom has some experience when it comes to this kind of thing. Anyway, I decided I would share some of the things that happened at that school during the couple of years that she was there. She said that from time to time, somebody would knock on the door she said she refused every single time to open it herself. She always leaves it unlocked and says that she's inside. Usually it's one of her coworkers, but she says sometimes there will be a knock and she would say, come in, and nothing would happen. In the same room during her lunch break, she and another teacher were on her laptop looking to buy a gift for her husband. I should clarify it's for her coworker's husband and it was her coworker's computer. 
When they were looking, my mom said something about her coworker's husband, and the computer all of a sudden, on max volume, played a song that mentioned her coworker's husband's first name. It didn't really scare them. My mom told me they kind of laughed it off, and they ended up buying a speaker. Now, this speaker was gifted to said husband, and within the first week, it was thrown out. The story was that her husband had it next to him one day at his job, and out of nowhere, just like the Mac laptop, the speaker played something eerie. I forget exactly what it was, but my mom told me that the speaker wasn't connected to anything at the time, and was actually turned off. He threw it out pretty fast, so, so much for a surprise anniversary present. This one morning, the school had a delayed opening during a perfect spring day. They thought some kid had broken into the school and trashed a couple of rooms. The preschool has cameras, and that was the first thing they checked, but sure enough, nobody had broken in. The camera in my mom's room showed chairs being slid out from tables. Then it showed somebody in the room tossing books off the shelves. This was captured sometime during the night. She said that the lights were flickering every once in a while too, and other classrooms had the same thing happen. This one room, I guess, was the staff conference room, and it didn't have any cameras inside. My mom told me that the janitor said when he walked in, all of the chairs were pushed out and facing random directions. There was a police report, but the police couldn't find any solid evidence of a break-in. They suspected that somebody stayed in the building while it was open, and waited until it closed and then pulled some massive prank. The thing that bothers me, though, is that I know teachers lock their classroom doors when they leave. And how would any person have gotten in without tripping an alarm? In any event, we're pretty sure that school is haunted. had an event transpire last night that is a small paragraph in the story of my haunted house. To understand the story, it helps to understand the history of the property. Before my house was a house, it was a Veterans of Foreign Wars club. To those that are unaware, it was a bar clubhouse for Veterans of Foreign Wars. The house is over 120 years old, and many people have passed through the doors over the decades. It seems likely that many tortured souls spent time there. There were probably soldiers, people that have done horrible things while fighting in our wars. I live in the USA, by the way. Some of my elderly neighbors talk to me about my house and its history when I'm out walking my dog. Some of them have even drank there, the real old neighbors. Paranormal experiences are pretty common things in this place, but this one was the most recent and it happened last night at around 11.30. I was laying in bed with my two cats. They were sleeping together at the end of the bed, and I was watching a movie on my tablet. The lights were on, so darkness did not obscure my vision. Here's where things get interesting. In a split second, both cats jolted themselves awake and began to fix their eyes on the doorway to the bathroom. I stopped my movie and tried to listen and observe. Keep in mind, both cats' eyes are perfectly fixed on the doorway, with gaze fixed on a central point in the middle upper height of the doorway. I found this strange, as there wasn't a sound to be heard. My first thought is that they were tracking a fly or a bug. It's winter and cold right now, and I don't think I've seen a bug in months. That's because no bug was there. My vision is unusually good, and the lights were on, and nothing was there. At least nothing I could see. At this point, I'm really trying to figure out what these two cats are looking at. They begin to turn their heads horizontally, as if someone was walking out of the bathroom toward the foot of my bed. While this was happening, their heads and eyes moved in sync with each other, as if the two cats' bodies were attached by gears. I knew it wasn't a fly at this point, for certain. Anyone with a cat knows how a cat will move when trying to hunt a fly. They'll look up, down, and in circles as the fly buzzes across the room. 
with their vision at the foot of the bed, they started to look up to me, as if someone was walking up toward me. My hair began to rise on the back of my neck. The pins and needles radiated down my spine and into my arms. All of my senses began to hyperfocus. No bug, no buzzing, but something is clearly there. I can sense the presence of someone there, breathing. The air is cold and feels heavy. At or around this time, I realize I'm having a visit from one of the house's many ghosts. I used to be much more afraid of these kinds of occurrences, but now I just kind of accept it. Anyway, wide-eyed, the cats are staring at something right next to me. In perfect synchronization, their eyes slowly moved up, staring directly over my chest where I was laying. I can sense someone standing over me, looking down on me. This freaked me out. Loudly and out of reflex, I yelled, what the F? For no reason and without any input, the Alexa on my table said, do you want to see something paranormal? Please remember, this is still real life. There's no embellishment. There was no reason for my tablet to do this and also it was really loud. Now I'm very spooked. However, I realize that this thing or spirit or whatever is trying to communicate with me. I did not ask for Alexa, nor did I mention any keywords like ghost or haunted or whatever. Also, as an aside, later I tried to see what settings Alexa was on, and I couldn't find that info because Alexa wasn't even on. I always shut off Alexa because she's kind of annoying. I only turn her on whenever I need something. So there's really no reason for Alexa to have been working. In any event, I decided to reply to Alexa, and I said, no thanks. The air in the room lifted, the cat settled back down, and I tried to sleep and got little. Those two cats saw something that I could not. Whatever it was, it walked out of the bathroom, past the foot of my bed, made a 90 degree turn and stood over me, and tried talking to me through my tablet on an Alexa that wasn't even active. I wanted to share some stories about my family's haunted house, so here goes. I'm 19 and I still live with my parents, along with my little sister, who's 14, and my little brother, who's 17. Many, many things have happened in this house, and it's gotten to the point where I feel safer at my boyfriend's house. We got this house when I was around 11. I would cry to my mom almost every night after getting out of the shower, because while I would shower, I would hear somebody talking to me from the other side of the curtain. It got so bad that I eventually made my mom stay in the bathroom with me while I showered. A couple of years go by and nothing happens. When I started high school, that's when things started happening again, but worse. I would often hear things. Things would move around by themselves and nothing would ever be in the same spot where I had left it before. I told my parents about this, but they thought I was crazy for like two years. Then, things started happening to them as well. One morning, I woke up with a burning sensation on my leg. I had three upside down K shapes scratched into my leg. At first I thought maybe somehow I had done it in my sleep, but they were perfectly aligned. Plus, at that time I chewed on my nails, so I didn't really have any nails to scratch myself with. About two years ago, my little sister comes running into my room at 3.30, shaking. Once she got me awake, she told me that my mom was screaming. I go into her room and she's hysterical, crying her eyes out, with the covers pulled all the way over her head, and my dad comforting her. My mom is shaking and she's so scared she couldn't even talk. My dad left for work that morning, around 4.00 and my mom couldn't sleep unless she had me in there with her. For days, she refused to tell me what happened. 
but then she finally did. She said that she had woken up and saw a rather short black silhouette standing next to my dad. She said the figure was all black, but she could feel how evil it was, and it had a sort of red-orange glow behind it. She was so scared she wouldn't let me leave her alone in the house. In 2020, I met my boyfriend, and I had him over to the house for the first time. He ended up staying the night, but I didn't tell him about my house in fear of scaring him off. It's around two in the morning and my parents are asleep. My brother is at a friend's house and my little sister is in the dining room, painting. My boyfriend and I are in the brother's room because he has a PlayStation. I don't. I'm playing a game and he's watching me play, and I look over and he's not really paying attention. He's looking into the living room, and he looks very pale. I asked him if he was okay, what was wrong, and if he was feeling all right. Finally, I started shaking him because he wouldn't reply. Then he said, who's that standing in front of your parents' room? This freaked me out because I looked and nothing was there. I asked him to describe what he had seen. He said he was looking at exactly what my mom had said she saw a couple of years prior. A couple of months later, my boyfriend is in my room by himself, and my parents are outside on the porch talking. I go in to get him to come outside and go on a walk with us, but when I walk into my room, he's under the covers, and my nightstand is completely upside down. He's pale and shaking, and I ask him what happened. He explained he was on his phone waiting for me to come back, when everything on my nightstand flew off and then flipped over. I had glass bottles and a couple of miniature paintings on my nightstand, and there was broken glass everywhere. This was a couple of months after we got together, but there's so much more I could tell. It's already such a long story, but the point is, I don't feel safe here, and I don't know what to do or who to turn to. I don't know what's in my house, but it is definitely not friendly. So, I live in a small town in the southwest of Scotland. One of those towns where if you don't know someone, you will definitely know one of their friends. In 2015, I moved into a flat or apartment with my two children and my partner. The flat seemed nice and it was in a quiet part of town. Needless to say, we were all really happy with the move. At the time, my eldest son Bobby was four and my youngest Derek was three. Soon after moving in, I started noticing strange things happening. For example, the washing machine turned itself on and off at the wall. Doors opened on their own. But the strangest incidents were yet to come. One night, when the kids were in bed, about six months after moving in, Bobby came running to the living room and said, Daddy, please could you come and tell the hand in my room to stop trying to play with my teddy bears? So, naturally, I went into his room and told this, what I thought was imaginary, hand off. About two weeks later, my son Bobby came to me again. With the complete matter-of-fact innocence of a child, he goes, Daddy, did you know there's a ghost in your attic? I didn't think much of it. Kids will be kids. The next day, I was at work, talking to a colleague about where we'd moved to. Out of nowhere, he goes, Hey, did you know that back in April of 2014, some young guy hung himself in your flat? Suddenly, Bobby talking about a ghost in the attic started to feel a lot more concerning. What blows my mind is that Bobby had never talked about ghosts before moving here. At the time, he didn't even know what an attic or a loft was. I did some digging and even spoke to a friend who's a local police officer. I asked him about the whole incident with the young guy, and he goes, Oh yeah, that's true. He hung himself in the attic up there. We still live in that house, and to this day, strange things happen from time to time. Most recently, the TV turned itself on and turned the volume up to full blast, all on its own. I was the only one home at the time. 
What's really strange is that my youngest son, Derek, has never mentioned anything ghostly. It's all very strange, but very real. This is kind of a long story. It's my first personal paranormal experience from when I was 18. I moved into a two-story townhouse with a friend that I graduated high school with and one of their childhood friends. Let's call my high school friend Amber and their friend Becky. Becky had this sketchy boyfriend who acted all gangster even though we lived in Montana. He was living with us basically all the time Becky and her boyfriend were also pretty Christian. They said that they never experienced any of the things that Amber and myself had. So we moved into this townhouse that was built in the early 2000s. We lived there for about six months. When we first moved in, it was super happy in the house. Amber and I were getting everything set up and enjoying living in our own space for the first time. Becky wasn't super present. She and her boyfriend spent most of their time working in their room or watching movies or fighting. It wasn't until about a month into living there that, separately, Amber and I started to hear footsteps when we were alone in the house. At first I thought it was because we were in a townhouse, but we quickly realized that when we did hear the other side of the house, it was obviously coming from the other side of the wall, and that was rarely. These footsteps sounded exactly like when somebody was walking around upstairs, or downstairs, depending on where you were. The first time I heard them, I was in the living room, playing Xbox Home Alone. I heard the steps start to go from room to room above me. It kind of scared me, so I went upstairs to see if maybe Becky's boyfriend was there, but all the doors were closed. Becky had this little dog that would rip your clothes apart if you let her into your room, so we always closed the doors up there when we weren't home. The steps sounded like they were going into each room without any doors opening or closing. So that's what tipped me off that probably nobody was there, and when I opened all the doors, nobody was. Amber and I talked about it a lot soon after it started, and it's almost like that attention, knowing that we were talking about it, made more things happen, of course. At night, we started to hear the steps in the hallway outside our bedroom doors. Amber and I had rooms right next to each other. It was the creepiest thing. It sounded exactly like when someone's walking barefoot on carpet. How you kind of hear the carpet brush against the rough skin of the bottom of your foot. Amber would text me late at night when I would be laying in bed, straining my ears listening to these footsteps, asking if I could hear it too. Generally, I would always text back that I was hearing it too. It was like a nightly ritual. I feel like saying that until moving into that house, I had had a few paranormal experiences, but I had written them all off as a child's imagination because they scared me so much. But with these things, I suddenly felt like I couldn't write them off. It felt too up close and personal, too real. The footsteps started to sound more rushed over time. My room was right above the kitchen, and I could hear the steps shake things in the cupboards at night when it was really quiet. I also knew that it wasn't any of my roommates, because it was very obvious when they would open their door to walk around for something. Then in March, Amber and I had a friend over hanging out late one night at the house, all alone. Becky and her boyfriend were at a party. Our buddy didn't drive, so Amber left to drive him home. I cleaned up a bit and went up to my bedroom. I left the hallway light on upstairs, because I would start to feel like this weird feeling, this off feeling in there. And whenever I started to feel that, I would just turn the light on. It was a generally dark hallway even in the day, but especially so at night. From my room, I suddenly heard the bathroom door start swinging closed. I was laying in bed, and from the view I had of the hallway, I clearly saw the doorknob peek out against the wall as the door closed, then it slowly swung back open. 
The sound of that door slowly opening at an agonizing pace will forever be ingrained in my mind. I felt absolute fear because I knew for a fact that I was home alone. The wait for Amber to get back was terrible. I sat in my bed, frozen, until they came up the stairs. I ran out to meet them, feeling confident that it was just the two of us home now. I started to explain what happened and what I saw. I even moved the door slowly open and closed it to replicate the creepy sound. And then it happened. Standing there, mid-sentence telling my story, something started to pound obscenely loudly against the wall behind us. We freaked out and ran into my room, and closed the door and sat on my bed together in terror until Becky got home later that night. We were still totally shaken while we told her what happened, but she kind of just brushed us off and her boyfriend didn't seem to care too much either. They just went into her room for the night. Reluctantly, we went to bed in our own rooms. The next day, we went outside to look at the part of the house that the sound had come from. There was no mark, no damage, despite it sounding so destructively loud. There weren't any trees in our yard or the neighbor's yard, and no branches or anything like that on the ground that would indicate something had struck the house. We saged the house that week, and everything stopped. Until May. Some roommate drama went down with Becky when she told us we had a month to pack up and find a new place because she was moving in with her boyfriend and ending the lease. Now, six years later, I totally realized that all of the tension and anger in the house then gave whatever pounded on the wall that night enough energy to make a full comeback. The footsteps started nightly again, running occasionally this time. I could hear them linger at our doors almost too, almost as if taunting us to say, I just might come in. Then one day when I was at work, Amber called me in a panic. Now, a bit of background about Amber. They are by far one of the most grounded, steady-headed people I've ever met. Amber didn't show much emotion or fear during some of our high school shenanigans. So I knew something was up when they called me. Amber told me over the phone that they were just in bed watching something with a guy they had over when Amber and their guest noticed that the foot of the bed started to lift up. It slammed back down and the guy ran out. Amber showed me when I got home that night what it looked like when the foot of the bed was lifted, and I just can't imagine any rational explanation for what would cause something like that to happen. Things continued being creepy and loud at night. Then... My last night in the house rolled around, and this ghost decided to give me quite the send-off. Amber had gotten a job doing trail conservation, so they were on a hitch and Becky was at her new apartment. So I was home alone and told up in my room for the night, because I was a little bit scared of our ghost. I was trying to fall asleep when I heard the usual footsteps start doing the rounds around the house. And then they went straight to my door and stopped. I felt very unnerved by that, but then I heard a soft knock at my door. The dread I felt in that moment is still the most intense thing I've ever felt in my life. It had never knocked on our doors or anything like that before. I sure as hell wasn't going to answer, so I tried to focus on sleeping and ignore it. But then I literally felt like somebody was in my room. It felt like a physical presence, and all I could do was lay in bed, frozen with my eyes shut tightly. I felt the side of my bed shift and compress down, as if somebody had slowly laid down next to me. My heart was in my throat. All I could do was lay there. I was too afraid to open my eyes or do anything. I felt like I didn't want to see what was next to me. For a long time, I lay awake, feeling that weight next to me. It never lifted or went away. Somehow, I fell asleep, exhausted by all of the fear, probably. And when I woke up, there was nobody in my room with me. After all that, Amber and I were briefly roommates again a year later, and we would talk about our experiences. 
It kind of felt cool that we had our own haunted house stories. I guess it still does. I always have to give my two cents when the paranormal stories start getting swapped. But when it was happening, I was really scared. I kept trying to write things off as just my imagination or the house settling or who knows what else. But it just always felt like what I was experiencing was real and it was really happening. The footsteps were too uncanny. I still hear the way they sounded in my head, and it's been six years. Just to start off, I'm not on drugs and I don't suffer from any type of mental illness, so we can rule that out right now. Weird occurrences have followed my family for years. I am only going to stick to the ones that can be classified as mimicking, starting from my first memory of it. My brother and I are 16 months apart, him being older. We shared a bedroom in a two-bedroom apartment, living with only our mom. We had those metal bunks that you could disassemble and turn into two toddler beds, with the railing going around three quarters of the bed. Before we got our own separate ends of the room, I had the top bunk and he had the bottom bunk. My brother would cry a lot at night and that's why he got the bottom, so he could easily get up and go see my mom, and vice versa. It was normal for his crying to wake me up. One night I'll never forget though. I woke up to him crying, but he was trying to stifle it, like when little kids are done crying and they're just breathing weird. Well, I heard my own voice calling his name in a whisper. I sat there not understanding what was happening. I slid my arm down the gap between the bed and the wall. I would hold my brother's hand that way a lot of the time. He held my hand immediately and we stayed like that until the sun came up. He told me that's why he cries at night, because he always hears me, but he knows that it's not. At this point, I was about four, and he was turning six. We never told my mom. When I got older, about 14 or 15, I went through an angsty phase like most girls do. I had long straight hair and was really scrawny. By this time, we were living in a different apartment. My brother and I had bedrooms at one end of the hallway, and the doors faced each other with a bathroom in between. I used to sit on the edge of my bed, and when I did, you could see me in front of my door. On multiple occasions, my brother and mom would see me sitting in that spot while I would be in the bathroom or the kitchen. They would always be like, your twin is here again, and we would just go about our day because it was so normal at that point. When I was in my senior year of high school, I went to an independent study program. It was almost a daily thing where I would hear my name being called while I was taking a test. We were able to take a test when you finished a packet, and they were stupidly simple. The voice wasn't the same every time, but the tone was, like a sense of urgency. I never said anything, because I honestly thought I was insane. I would look up and look around trying to see who was calling me, and no one around me acted like they had heard a thing. A year later, I was enrolled in a trade school. I would hear my name being called there as well. I met a girl there who was openly practicing some form of Wicca. We became close. We went to school at night and got out around eight. Close to the end of the course, I was walking her out to the car and from the dumpster enclosure on the parking lot, I heard my name being called. I wasn't going to act like I had heard anything, but my friend grabbed my hand and told me never to acknowledge it. It really freaked me out. I asked her if she had heard something, and she said yes, that something was trying to be me. Another time I was at my friend's house watching The Conjuring movie. It was only he and I in the house. We were sitting on the bed in his room with our backs against the wall. Okay. Bear with me on this part. In my head, not out loud, I had this thought. But the thought wasn't my own inner monologue. My thought was more of a hearing someone else's voice but in my head. It was really ugly, 
To this day, I have bad vibes about it. In a really fast whisper yell, the voice said, Look at the closet. My eyes darted towards his closet, and at the exact moment, one of the doors fell off. He had normal closet doors, the basic two-panel kind. Only instead of the track they slide on being on the ground, his were on the top, and the doors hung about an inch off the ground. Seconds before the closet door fell, my friend had jumped. Nothing scary was happening in the movie. He preemptively acted spooked. We turned off the movie and we were both kind of like, what the heck? Things like this were common when we got together and it made us have a very strong bond. We talked for a second, trying to rationalize things. But then I decided to tell him about this ugly voice. He then changed his whole demeanor and said, I heard the same thing, only it was your voice. And I had said it so suddenly that it caused him to jump. The only thing is, I had never said a word. Fast forward to two years ago, 2019. I had gotten a home for myself and I lived with my newborn daughter and her father. It was summertime and he was in the backyard grilling. The sliding glass doors were open, but I have thick curtains that were drawn to keep the flies out. I was sitting on my couch with my daughter, sleeping in my arms while nursing. We had been like that when he went outside and told me to stay put. Usually I would go help him. My house is rather small, so no matter where you are, you can have a conversation with the other person, even if they're across the house. So he and I are talking, and then I hear him say, Okay, let's go inside. And I didn't think anything of it. Assuming he was talking to himself or the food, I don't know. He walked in and looked at me sitting on the couch with a look he always makes when he's confused. He asked me how I'd gotten back into that position so fast. If you've never seen a woman breastfeed a newborn, I don't know how to explain the logistics, but there are a lot of them and I couldn't have gotten settled again that quickly. I told him that I hadn't moved and made a comment about my butt being asleep. He was really weirded out and shaking his head. He's very logical and a huge skeptic. Eventually, he was ready to tell me. He said that I had been standing in the doorframe having a conversation with him face to face with my arm holding back the curtain. And then I had turned around and walked away when he said, okay, let's go inside. He was ready to give me an attitude for not holding the curtain for him while he carried in the food until he realized I had never moved. I'm not sure what's going on, but that was the last double me encounter I've had, although I doubt it will be the last. Okay, so last night my roommate and I went to bed relatively early. I decided to take a bath, bubbles, candles, all that. I hear my roommate make the noise she makes when she's frustrated and needs help. I get out of the bath and I call out. No answer. I dry myself off, hop in bed, and turn on my PlayStation. A few minutes go by and I hear it again, but this time it sounds like it's right outside my door. I can see movement and light changing in the hallway under my door. So I called out for Zelda, my roommate, again. No response. No more movement. Maybe ten more minutes go by and I hear it again. This time like she was frustrated and in pain. Almost like she was crying. I message Zelda on Snapchat, but I get no response. I try to get some sleep, and I kept waking up having to use my inhaler and my nebulizer because I felt like I was having an asthma attack. This happened repeatedly until about 9 a.m. when I got a response from Zelda. I've been in my room all night. I've passed out. I meditated last night. Sorry. So it definitely wasn't Zelda. We've both been locked in her room all morning because it's freaking us out so bad. It sounded exactly like her frustration fits. It sounded like she was on my floor, having a total fit about something. I don't know what this was, but does anyone know what it might have been? I 
I'm telling this story to maybe get some help in identifying what I saw, because I've been trying to figure it out for three years. I was a U.S. Marine from 2014 to 2019. I deployed to the Philippines to help out some joint operations. It was right after the siege of Marawi. Basically all we did was stare at the top of the jungle canopy, looking for heat signals and then communicating fire missions for artillery. We were about three months into the deployment and like four hours into this mission staring at absolutely nothing. We were over the mountains of Basilon with really thick jungle canopy. Even with infrared, it's really hard to see anything out there. It was like trying to find needles in a haystack with Vaseline in your eyes. But when something's above the canopy, like a helicopter, birds, or monkeys in the trees, it pops up, and you can really get some good definition depending on how good the camera operator is, and atmospherics, of course. I was the camera guy, and I was just chilling, staring into the void while my pilot burned circles into the sky for hours. I asked my officer in charge of the flight if I could go smoke while the pilot took over the camera after I locked on to a geopoint to keep the camera from going all over the place, and he said yes. So I go smoke, and not a minute later, I hear the guy inside flying go, uh, hey dude, you should get back in here and look at this. So I go back inside all pissed off because I hadn't got to finish my cigarette. But then I see what my pilot had locked the camera onto. I hopped back into my seat and I took back control. I was like, all right, is it cows or ISIS? But it's none of those things. It's just flying above the canopy at a pretty good clip, flapping and gliding on what I can only assume are very large pointed wings. At this point, it's just a very dark shape moving over the canopy, until I clean up the infrared image and start to pick out more. At first I'm like, dude, it's just a really big bird. But then I see like a rounded head at the front and a small space in between what I assumed was the tail, making me think it had some kind of legs. The detail wasn't amazing, but you could make out general shapes. If I have a good day for atmospherics and light and altitude, I can tell an RPG from an AK-47 if I'm lucky. That kind of detail. Then my smart, college-educated officer is like, check the measuring tool. It looks kind of big. We have a tool that uses geodata, altitude, and the aircraft's position, allowing you to use the laser and the program to let you know how far a distance is between two points. We mostly use it to measure buildings and artillery shot distances, but given what we had in the height of the canopy, I didn't see why it wouldn't work for this too. So I take a screen cap of my cam and I send it to my pilot to work on while I'm still on lock. He does the math and he comes up with a roughly six foot length and a 17 foot wingspan. As I watched it fly, I just kept thinking, that looks like a bat just the way that it flapped and moved and the general shape. It wasn't a bird, and its wings definitely came out at like an angle and stretched, you know, just like a bat. But there's no bat that big. The crew and I talked about it, passed it up to hire, but eventually we had to actually go do our jobs instead of become amateur zoologists. But after that flight, I just couldn't shake that feeling or place what it was. The other thing was that right next to our smoke pit, when we're not flying the drones, there's this thing that's absolutely filled with fruit bats, and it glows in infrared. This thing didn't. So my pilot and I got curious and we started asking the local people and contractors who worked at the chow hall and at the PX. A bunch of them laughed and told us that it was because we stay up too late and we work too long on night shift. But, a couple of the older ones told us about an Aswang or a Tik Tik. Sometimes people call it a Mananangal. Apparently it's this big old flying thing that eats babies. But, in an effort to disprove giant baby-eating women man-bats, 
Can somebody please tell me what I saw? Because I would much rather my spicy PTSD just be regular PTSD. This story is from my brother-in-law. It took place in Mexico in the 90s. My brother-in-law, Uriel, and his family had a house on the corner of the street. His parents always worked and never had time to do the house chores or look after Uriel, so they hired a housekeeper and nanny. The nanny was a girl who was around 12 years old. It was acceptable back then to hire young kids in that area. Uriel said that in the beginning, everything was great, and she did all of her chores. The house was pretty big, so it was pretty impressive that at her age, she was able to keep up with all that work. The family was content with her work, and the girl was always happy to help. In the house, there was a big staircase that led up to a second story. Uriel said that as soon as you got onto the top step, there was a large Victorian mirror which was recently given to his parents by some acquaintances. The family started noticing that the girl would always glance at the mirror. The glances then escalated, and she began staring at the mirror from afar. Soon she would stare, to the point where she would stop doing her chores entirely, and just stay there for hours at a time. She stopped speaking to anyone, and did nothing else but stare at the mirror, she even stopped eating and sleeping. The family became very concerned and alerted her family. When her family came to pick her up, they couldn't separate the girl from the mirror. She was in sort of a hypnotized state. They took her to the local witch doctor, and the witch doctor said something in there had taken her, that it had just left her body behind, and that nothing could be done. She was in a vegetative state and remained like that for some days. It would all come to an end when Uriel's family ordered to have the mirror stored in the basement. At one point, one of the few people moving it somehow stepped on the mirror and it broke. It shattered into many pieces. Seconds later, the girl's family called Uriel's family, saying that the girl had been convulsing and that she passed away. It was very sad, and the family was devastated. To this day, he still doesn't like talking about it, because it scared him so much. To be fair, I don't know if this is paranormal or somebody playing a prank on me, but I'd like to hear your thoughts all the same. I've lived in the same studio apartment for four years now, and along one wall is a closet with a mirrored sliding door. I've never cleaned this mirror since I never really touch it, so it doesn't have any smudges on it or anything like that. At least, I never noticed any smudges on it, until tonight. Last night, I was cooking in my apartment with the windows closed. It was a cold night, and because of the steam from the food, it's all one room, so the kitchen is in the same room as my closet, I noticed that my mirror had gotten a bit fogged up. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but as I was walking by the mirror today, I noticed that the top part of my mirror was still a bit foggy looking, and I could see words written on the mirror as if somebody had drawn them with their finger or the eraser of a pencil since the lines are fairly thin. The printing is neat, like teacher writing. The lettering doesn't resemble the handwriting of anybody I know. I assumed that the person who had lived in the apartment before me had traced out words along the top of the mirror and that the steam from the cooking had only just now revealed them. I was curious about what the former resident had to say so I picked up an index card and a clipboard and started copying out what the words said. It was tough because they were faint. They only showed up when the light in the room wasn't shining directly on them, and the first part of the writing was a bit obscured. 
They said in all lowercase letters, being dead isn't being alive. I'm not really sure what to think. It seems kind of tautological. Obviously being dead isn't being alive, right? I mean, by definition. But I'm curious about how the writing got there, and a little freaked out. In all the time I've lived here, the only person who's ever been in the house when I wasn't home is my mom. And she wouldn't do that. And even if she did, it wasn't her handwriting. Every other person who's been in the apartment has been there at the same time as me. And I think that I would have noticed somebody writing on my mirror. So I'm at a bit of a loss. Maybe the previous resident just left a spooky message to mess with me and I never saw it until now. Or maybe my little apartment is haunted. What do you think? For context, I've been doing gymnastics for nine years, and we had some weird shit happen at our old gym. We moved to a new facility in December of 2017, but the creepy stuff didn't end there. Here is one of those stories. This didn't happen to me, but it happened to two of my coaches, who I believe and trust with my life, literally. They wouldn't lie about these things. Gabby and Maya are the only two people who stay in the gym after hours on our practice nights. This particular night was a Thursday. Before this, we had seen handprints all over the mirrors and things like that. The gym we moved into post handprints was a high school gymnasium, and to exit there are two sets of glass doors with a shoe mat in the space between. They walk a few feet down the hallways of the old school to leave. Maya was in the front, and Gabby was behind her. Maya saw a man reflected in the glass. If you think, how could she see that? It's pitch black outside by the time they leave, so reflections really show up in the glass. She says he was white and tall, with shaggy dark hair down to his ears. He starts to run toward them. Maya thought maybe he wanted to ask them a question, so she turned around. Gabby ran into her, since Maya is taller and she couldn't see the reflection, but she heard footsteps coming quickly close to them. There was no one there, though. The man was gone, but both of them knew that there had definitely been someone there. So, my mom has this full stand mirror that my grandpa made for her when she was a teen. She's had it basically forever and is super attached to it. I, on the other hand, am terrified of it and hate being anywhere near it. I often have unexplained experiences involving this mirror, like seeing things in it, dark, heavy feelings in the room that just sort of sit in the mirror. Well, recently, I had a baby, and he's nine months old now, crawling, learning, all that stuff the babies do. My mom lets me come over to take naps in her room while she watches my little one, which helps a lot. Except that her mirror is in her room. The first time I took her up on the offer, I had a dream about a little girl ghost that kept showing herself to me, and then running away. I awoke all groggy and weird, and very drained. I couldn't really explain why I was dreaming about her, if she was real or just my imagination. Eventually I just said whatever and left it at that. The second time not much happened other than the fact that I just could not wake up. My body felt like a ton of bricks, and my limbs wouldn't follow any directions that my brain sent their way. I got up at some point, but only because I could hear my son downstairs crying. The last time was craziest of all. No dreams, I slept only an hour and a half, and everything that happened was just crazy to me. The ghostly activity actually started before I went to nap. I had taken my son upstairs to nap in his playpen, which is placed right in front of that mirror, and when I laid him down and stood up to leave, I heard whispering, but I couldn't make out any of the words. 
I shrugged it off and then went back downstairs. As I was chilling on the couch, I started to hear this whispering again. I tried ignoring it, because honestly I didn't feel threatened in any way, and I just kept playing around on my phone. After a while of that, I started hearing someone walking around upstairs. Not my son, as he can't walk yet anyway, and he was in a playpen, so it couldn't have been him. No one else was home. Obviously I was a little shaken up, but I was still going to ignore it. But then I noticed this toy dinosaur thing lighting up. It has a big red button on top of its head that lights up when it's pressed. Manually pressed. Normally it goes off for a little while after it gets pressed, but this was way after my son was playing with it. And it was like it was just being pressed over and over. The preset sayings would never come all the way through. They just kept going on like their first three words or so. I thought that was creepy and I started to get uneasy. A little bit after that I decided to go upstairs and take a nap as well. When I get into the room, I get that familiar feeling of uneasiness that the mirror always gives me. I side glanced at it and then just tried to ignore it. My little one was asleep and safe, so I wasn't worried about him. I crawled into bed and was on my phone for a couple more minutes when I started hearing the wordless whispers again. I ignored them and tried to fall asleep, but it felt like I was trapped between being awake and being asleep. During that time, I heard all sorts of creaking sounds, walking, things like that. At one point, it sounded like somebody was rubbing their hand really fast across the blanket or sheets. Eventually, I somehow fell asleep, and like I said, I was only asleep for about an hour and a half. But an hour into my nap, my brother got home, he's 11, and he came upstairs because he heard my baby. He was very quiet, barely making any noise. But when he said something to my little one in a whisper, I woke up startled. After reassuring me that it was just him and not some ghost person stalking me, he took my baby downstairs to let me rest a little longer. I set my alarm for 30 minutes, fell back asleep, but instead of my alarm waking me up, I awoke six minutes early, and as I was opening my eyes, all I could see, all over the walls, were words. They were written messily, messily, and I couldn't make out anything at all. But it was all I could see for what felt like a very long time, but it could only have been a minute or so. When I turned my phone on to check the time, the words went away. But I was definitely on edge, and I was shaking. I tried to take a moment to calm down, but in the vanity mirror, which was looking toward that other mirror, something shifted and flew across it. I jumped up and got the hell out of there. When I told my mom, she just laughed, and my husband made fun of me for always getting into these crazy ghost situations. But I just came over to have a good time and relax, not be spooked by some crazy ghost. Anyway, I wanted to note that for the majority of the experience, I was alone with my son. It all started happening once my mom left to go do some Uber Eats deliveries. And when I woke up the second time, my brother and son were downstairs playing. I don't know if I'm just crazy, or if there's really something going on with that mirror. So this happened when I was about 14 years old. My house is not haunted, and never was, but I'm sure that in the first years after we moved in, when I was about nine years old, there was a harmless spirit that still lingered around at the time. I was in our second bathroom, washing my hands, and after I finished and wiped them with a cloth, I looked in the mirror. I had no expression on my face, I was just looking at myself in the mirror, but my reflection tilted its head to the right and gave me a big smile while looking directly into my eyes. I am completely sure that I did not smile or tilt my head when I saw that. My expression must have changed to pure horror, but the face in the mirror didn't. 
I ran out of the bathroom, but I noticed that my reflection just sort of stayed there. It didn't run along with me. This has never happened to me before or after, but it still has me thinking why this happened and how it's even possible. Maybe I don't want to know. Most of these experiences are second-hand. They mostly happened to my best friend at the house he used to live in. I had one experience in the house, and I'll start with that because it's the least interesting. The stuff that happened to my friend is much more difficult to explain. This happened when I was around 21, four years ago. I was picking up my friend so we could go out to a movie, and I had come inside to hang out in the kitchen with his mom while he finished getting ready. It was already dark out, and the house was mostly dark too. Only the light from the kitchen was on. I got tired of waiting for him, so I decided to head out to my car to listen to music while I waited. I walked down the darkened hallway toward the front door. The way the house was situated, the front sitting room was off to the right as you walked toward the door. In that room, against the wall, was a couch, and over it, a large oval mirror. As I walked past the sitting room, I was overcome with this feeling of dread. I knew that I had to keep my eyes straight ahead on the front door, and that if I turned my head to the right and looked in the mirror, I would see something that shouldn't be there, something that would give me nightmares. I practically ran out the front door. Later, when I told my friend about that feeling, he just sort of nodded sagely and said, yeah, I don't look in that mirror. That's the only experience I've ever had with the paranormal. And let's face it, it was really just a frightening feeling in a dark house, and mirrors are creepy anyway. But my friend swears up and down that the following experiences are true. And since he's generally very honest, rational, and not attention-seeking, I believe him. I have no proof, just his words that I choose to believe are the truth. My friend believes there were at least two spirits in that house. One was benevolent, the other less so. And there were a few experiences that seemed to be isolated incidents. He says that he would sometimes see a woman's face in his closet. She was the nice spirit. He said that she seemed like she was just there, watching over him, that she never spoke, just appeared sometimes and watched him. The other spirit was not so kind. My friend says that he would often feel as though something were following him down the long hallway that led from the bedrooms to the kitchen. On one occasion, he says that he tripped over something hard, but when he looked down, the hallway was devoid of any object that could have caused him to trip. On another occasion, he felt something like claws scratch his calf while walking down the same hallway. Again, there was nothing around that could have caused such a sensation. This last experience is the one that I think is the creepiest of all, the one for which I have absolutely no explanation. My best friend and two of our other friends were sitting in the front room, the same room with the couch and the creepy mirror. They were just watching TV and chatting. Suddenly, my best friend noticed that they were not alone in the room. Sitting in a chair that was only moments before completely empty was a man he had never seen before. He was dressed in an old-fashioned, think 1940s, suit and hat. He says the man had a beard and that he didn't speak or look at them. He just sat there. He stared at the man, stunned. After a minute or two, the man faded away. This is the part that really freaked me out. My other friend who was in the room saw him too, and both friends later described him the exact same way. The third friend only saw an empty chair. I'm sure there are logical explanations for some or maybe all of these things, but I don't know how to explain these things. I'm just passing along some stories that I hope somebody will find interesting.
My family home is 30-ish years old, and some strange things have happened in it. This happened in 2009, and we still don't have a clear explanation for it. In the house, some slightly strange things happened, like the radio and TV going on and off, and random doors opening. Lots of cracked mirrors and what sounds like voices. But I live in Ireland, and it's quite windy a lot, so I put those things down to that, and the odd surge of electricity or something. The one standout thing is from when my sister was finishing school. I think high school is the equivalent in the US. She's an excellent student, and she wanted to go on to get into a course that's pretty hard to get into for uni, so she was under a bit of pressure. In her room, there was a long mirror hanging in between two windows. The end of her bed came to the end of the window, and there is a section of wall where the mirror hangs, so it's hanging over the floor. The head of the bed is about six-ish feet or more away from the mirror. The mirror was pretty heavy and strung up on cord and hanging on the wall. One night, she was dreaming and in the dream, she saw a woman. As soon as she saw her, she said she felt an evil feeling, and immediately knew that she shouldn't have seen her. Then, she woke up to the mirror, smashing over her. She was screaming so much my parents came running, thinking that something terrible had happened. Her face and arms were cut, and to be honest, she was pretty traumatized. This room is now my bedroom, because she's too afraid to sleep in it. My parents couldn't figure out how that mirror came off the wall and broke over her. The cord at the back was undamaged, and the mirror is pretty heavy, so it's unlikely that she would have been able to lift it up off the hook herself, and then over her head. Everyone was really freaked out, and we all slept in the same room that night, even my dad who in no way believes in the supernatural. We spoke about it the next day and agreed not to talk about it outside the family, so people wouldn't keep asking my sister about it. Plus, she was terrified and couldn't really talk about it anyway. To this day, she still can't talk about it, and even writing this and remembering it makes me not want to sleep in my parents' house for a while. About four months after it happened, my sister was doing work experience after her finals with my mom's friend who's a psychologist. She had a local handyman in around her home, which was also where her office is. He met my sister for a few minutes in the kitchen one day when she was taking a break, and then they both went on about their days. Later that night, my mom's friend called to our house to discuss something with my mom. She said the handyman had told her that there was something dark with my sister, that it was a woman the same age as her that couldn't move on, and who had come to my sister through a mirror. He said that she needed help. Apparently he sees things but doesn't really talk about it as it freaks him out, but he felt that this was important. My mom immediately asked my dad and I if we had told anybody, and we hadn't. So there's absolutely no way that that man, or my mom's friend, could have known about what had happened with the mirror. We still have no explanation for what happened, and mirrors in our house are constantly cracking. There isn't a bad energy in the house or anything, but I do have to sleep with a light on at home, and normally I like sleeping in the dark. As a note, a man was pushed in front of a train adjacent to our land and there was an old woman that lived in a hut thing until she died, after which our house was built and we moved in. I don't know if that has anything to do with what happened. Apart from that, it's a normal house. I've been feeling incredibly shitty lately. Turns out going through a breakup and letting go isn't the easiest thing in the world, and I just haven't been happy. Yesterday I had a shower, and after getting out, 
I was looking at my foggy reflection in the steamed up mirror. It was one of those weird self-reflection moments that you see on TV or something. I drew a smiley face with my finger over my own face. Dramatic? Yeah, probably. But I just felt like doing it. So just now, after having a bath, I was looking at myself in the same mirror while drying my hair. The mirror had since cleared and steamed over again, so my original smiley face had gone. But now, there was another, smaller one, slightly to the right of where mine had been. I know people are rightly going to be skeptical, and I am too. I'm fully aware of paradelia and similar effects, so maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's just parts of the mirror that unsteamed or whatever, and that's how it looked afterward. But it still looks like a drawn face to me. I did think it could have been my dad, but he always complains if I draw on the mirror or car windows because it takes so long to clear or something like that. I don't really know the science of it, but I just know that it annoys him. I'll ask him tomorrow. Part of me is hoping it's my dad, but the other part is hoping that it wasn't, and that this is just my own little message from somebody who's watching. If it wasn't him that did it, I think it's kind of nice. Do spirits pick up on people's feelings? Was it someone watching over me and giving me a smiley face back? I know it doesn't seem like much, but it's an experience that really sat with me, and I just thought I'd share it. This happened a long time ago, when my daughter was about two. She's now away at college, so I would estimate that this happened in about 2000. I'd been out shopping with my daughter, and she was crying on the way home in the car because she had dropped her sunglasses and couldn't reach them. I couldn't reach them either, and I told her that she would have to wait until we got home. When we got home, I grabbed the glasses from the floor of the car took her out of her car seat, and we went in the house. As I carried her up the stairs, she was playfully trying to fit her little toddler sunglasses onto me. We were being silly and giggling, and I said, let's go see how mommy looks in the mirror with these on. And we went straight to the bathroom to check out my new shades. I turned on the light and held her up to the mirror over the sink. We were just being silly and making faces at each other, when suddenly I noticed something in the reflection that should not have been there. As you look into the bathroom mirror with the door open, you could see the entire living room, which would be behind you, reflected in the mirror. My father, who passed away in 1996, so about four years before this even happened, was seated at the end of the sofa, smiling at me. It was like I was frozen. I stood there, looking at him in the mirror, and absolutely couldn't move. I just gaped at him, then looked at my daughter's face in the mirror to see if she had noticed him. She was still too busy grinning and playing with the glasses to notice. I had enough time to get a really good look at him and note what he was wearing, which was rather nondescript. Just an off-white long-sleeved dress shirt, no tie, and dark slacks. Interestingly, this is not how he was dressed when we buried him. He was sitting rather casually, with one leg crossed over the other, and his left arm outstretched along the arm of the sofa. The whole vision, or whatever you want to call it, probably didn't even last 30 seconds, but it seemed like forever. After staring at him in stunned silence, I finally spun around with the baby in my arms to look out the door into the living room and he was gone. My father passed away very suddenly, and I like to think that he came back just to have a peek at the granddaughter that he unfortunately never knew. He certainly seemed to be enjoying the little show we were putting on in the bathroom that day, judging by the grin he had on his face. A week or so after this happened, I was at my mom's house with my daughter, and my mom and I were talking at the kitchen table while my daughter played on the floor. Suddenly, she got up off the floor and walked over to an empty kitchen chair and said, That's Pop-Pop's chair. 
To my knowledge, no one had ever told her that my father had had a favorite chair at the table where he always sat. I said to her, How do you know that that's Pop Pop's chair? She replied, Because he told me when I saw him last night. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. When I was younger, around five or six, I remember having my first paranormal experience. Upstairs we had three bedrooms, one by the stairs and two rooms on the other side that were horizontal to each other, with a bathroom in the middle of them. My room was across the hall from the room by the stairs, so if the door was open, I could see inside of the room from my own. The room across the hall from me also had a dresser with a mirror on it, right as you enter it against the wall. One night I suddenly woke up out of my sleep, and when this happened back then I would leave my bed and go downstairs to my godmother's room, she raised me, to sleep with her. I was sitting up to slide out of the covers and go downstairs when I saw something in the mirror from the room across the hall. It was a man who, now that I think back, reminds me of the portrait that you would see of Jesus. He had shoulder-length brown hair and was wearing a white robe. He was bright, and he also had his hands together, like he was praying. He looked like he was kneeling down beside the bed. I looked at the floor beside my bed and I saw nothing. So I looked in the mirror again and he was still there, beside the bed, praying, but only in the mirror. I couldn't see this man with my own eyes. Only through the mirror could I see him. I was too afraid to bolt for the stairs, so instead I decided to just hide under my covers until morning. My godmother was a Jehovah's Witness, and although I don't know much about that religion, I do know that we didn't have crosses and Bibles around the house. She also wouldn't even let me go to church with her, so it's not like I was force-fed religion. I didn't have much of a reference for that at the time. As a teen, I moved in with my mom and her husband. And I remember seeing my stepdad's mom washing dishes in the kitchen, but only for a few seconds, and then she was gone. That was after I came out of the bathroom where I was washing my hands and getting ready to go back to bed. I happened to glance in the mirror while washing, and she happened to be dead. Do mirrors have anything to do with being able to see things? Why could I only see them in the mirror? I still don't know the answers. What is it about mirrors that make them so creepy? I can't figure it out, but I do have a true personal story involving one from my childhood. I grew up in a small town in the Piedmont region of Virginia. Rolling country hills, one high school, everyone was your neighbor, that sort of thing. It was me, my mother, my father, and my brother. And just for the purposes of the story, my brother is six years older than me. Well, my town was pretty small, as I said. So small that my family, my grandmother and her husband, and my great-grandmother and her husband all lived in three separate houses, about a mile apart from each other. Once my great-grandfather died in 1989, my grandma moved in with her mother to help take care of her, as she was getting old in years herself. This didn't bother my grandma, as she and her husband's house was only 500 feet down the gravel road. I don't remember too much about my great granny. I just remember that she was always very grumpy, and that she would always yell at my brother and I when we would go over to her house to play. My brother and I would do this because our house was very small, and our great granny's house was big, an open Cape Cod style house with plenty of room to run around and spread out our toys. When my great granny passed away in the first week of February 1994, it took a toll on my family, because within that same week, my grandfather passed away as well. This means that my grandma lost her mom and her husband, both within about five days' time. 
I also should mention that my great granny was on hospice care, and she died in the comfort of her home, in her chair, surrounded by her family. As I grew on in age, about eight to ten years old, I started to retain a better memory about that house, and how honestly creepy it was. The upstairs in particular, as my brother and I were ever really allowed up there. This became especially true since my grandma ended up selling her and her husband's house down the gravel road, and permanently living in this one. And due to the trauma of losing her mother and husband in one week, she developed a pretty bad hoarding habit. Sometimes when my brother and I were visiting, my grandma would be occupied with her Avon downstairs, and we would sneak upstairs to snoop through all the four cluttered rooms. But one room up there always caught my attention. I found myself feeling very lightheaded whenever I would go near it, and sometimes feelings of unease or dread would overcome me. It was just your normal room, very small, hardwood floors, and only a twin bed and a small dresser, and a lot of junk like old Christmas boxes, Avon products, and my great granny's worn clothes. But over in the corner of the room, right beside the small crawl-in storage area, was a mirror. I always found myself strangely attracted to this mirror for some reason. It gave me an eerie sort of feeling, one that I can still very much recall to this day. I often caught my brother giving it a strange glance every now and then too. It wasn't until I started seeing this mirror in my dreams that I began to question its history and why my consciousness was showing it to me in my sleeping state of mind. The dreams were very vivid, and as frightening as they were, I never questioned during the dream itself what was happening or why I was there. I sort of felt like I was there for a reason. They all started with me standing on the porch of the house, staring at the door. It was nighttime and quiet all around me with a slight breeze, a very warm and comfortable summer night. The dream progressed with me making my way into the house, except something was a bit off. I was floating, and whenever I would enter a room inside, the door would open for me. All the lights were off inside but I could still see from the full moon eerily casting its bright light through the open windows, the outside breeze making the curtains dance around inside. Everything seemed to be in slow motion. I make my way upstairs where I'm guided each time to the same room with the mirror. This is the part of the dream where I sense an impending feeling of doom. I make my way in front of the mirror but oddly enough, I never see my reflection. I'm forced to stare at it, when all of a sudden an apparition of my great granny appears. Her skin looks gray and cold, her eyes dark and hollow. The uneasy feeling grows more and more as I start to realize that I am now aware that I'm dreaming. I'm scared to death and I need to wake myself up, somehow. Then, all of a sudden, the image in the mirror turns truly sinister. Her mouth widens, and her eyes glow a deep shade of red, and she lets out the most terrifying scream. This is when I wake up, covered in sweat. I had that exact dream a very many number of times growing up, but I never knew its significance, if there was any at all. I never told anyone, not even my grandma. Fast forward to about four years ago in 2012. My grandma lost her battle to cancer on Mother's Day. My family and I took part in the huge responsibility of cleaning up that house, as we had plans to sell it and move to San Antonio, Texas, where we currently are. The dream had escaped me for some time. I hadn't had it in about 10 years. But when my brother and I, now in our 30s, had the duties of cleaning out that room, the eeriness of it all returned to me. We had a lot of fun times up here, snooping around, didn't we, little brother? He said. I don't remember too much of it, but yeah, fun times, I said. My brother lifts his finger and points. Hey, do you remember that mirror right there? Yeah, I said. It was always really creepy to me, but um, why do you ask? To which he replied, just wondering. 
I'm not sure if you ever knew, actually, but that mirror was our great granny's favorite mirror from her childhood. And it just so happens that right below that mirror, directly parallel to downstairs, is the chair that our great granny died in. As if that didn't make my skin crawl enough, he pauses for a quick second, smiles, and with a bit of a confused look, he says, You know, for some reason, I used to have the strangest dreams about that mirror. I come from a family of pagans and spiritualists, except for my gran who became a strict Catholic. So the paranormal side doesn't really scare me or anything, but this is one incident that will never leave my mind and freaks me out to this day. A few nights prior to this incident, my mother and her friends had a get together at our house not long after we moved in so that it could be cleansed and so on. But before this happened, one of her friends mentioned that something was off about the energy in the house. So, long story short, they got out the Ouija board. This was one thing they all knew how to open and close properly with the right protection. Anyway, my mother said something negative felt like it was in the room. So they proceeded to close the gate that they had opened. Only, that didn't go right in my opinion because the next few days and nights in the house felt really weird. It felt colder in certain spots, and for some reason I really hated the mirror that was in my room, as it just gave off this weird vibe. So fast forward to the night of the incident, and now this same night, I gave up with the mirror and decided to just take it out of my room. It just really creeped me out, and I needed sleep. Well, around 1 to 2 a.m., I'm not 100% sure on the time, I just know it was in that area. My mom and I were awoken by this loud sound of glass breaking. So initially, we think someone is breaking in. Both of us take household weapons, just in case we need them, and head to the stairs. This is where I notice the first picture, which is of me and a childhood friend in a frame that was on the wall at the top of the stairway, shattered on the floor. Automatically, I think it's from the force of windows breaking through, so I shrug it off and follow my mother down the stairs into the living room. That's where we turn on the lights, thinking that we could scare the intruder. But no one was there. We look at the windows, thinking that they had already escaped, but we were shocked to notice that the windows were completely intact until my mother looks at the floor, broken glass and frames everywhere. And what shocks and freaks me out the most is that when I look at all the picture frames that were broken, every picture had me in them, whether I was alone in them or not. After that night, I really couldn't settle at all in that house. I ended up staying with a family member and eventually my mother decided we had to move. To this day, I will not have mirrors in my rooms, except a small one in the bathroom, and no frames with glass in it, because I'm legitimately worried that this gate will be opened again. It's been 14 years since that night. So far, so good. This happened when I was 14, and I'm 21 now. I lived with my parents in a small, three-bedroom townhouse. I remember not being able to sleep the night we moved in, basically laying there, staring at the ceiling for ages. My closet and wardrobe were made of a sliding glass mirror, which faced the side of my bed. Being unable to sleep, I rolled over and stared at the mirror, and then... My heart sank, and I froze. In the reflection of the mirror, I saw a hooded figure behind me, walking toward me. 
It looked to be about six feet tall, and basically resembled the stereotypical Grim Reaper type of character. I freaked out and turned around, but there was nothing there. I ran out of the room, crying to my parents. I knew that they wouldn't believe me, so I just said that I had a bad dream. But I know for a fact that I was not asleep at all. I've had sleep paralysis many times, and this wasn't that either, so I know it was real. A couple of years later, I told my dad about what happened. He told me that when my brother-in-law's uncle came to visit, he's considered a man of healing in Papua New Guinea, he said he felt an odd presence and then blessed the home. This happened after my encounter. After hearing that, it convinced me that it definitely was an entity and it wasn't my imagination. Since then, I've had no further experiences. First and foremost, I have never experienced anything supernatural in my entire life, but I do have friends who have told me stories and have had paranormal experiences before. This is the first time for me. Anyway, I woke up this morning and went to the bathroom and turned on the light. I immediately noticed a set of handprints, both right hand, on the mirror, right at the top. Our mirror is pretty big, so someone would have had to get up on the counter to touch the top. The next thing that I noticed is that they were much smaller than my hand. In fact, at least half the size. I woke up my roommate and pulled her in there, and we both stood staring at them, confused more than anything. There are definitely child's handprints on my mirror. Neither of us touched the mirror, and they weren't there yesterday and neither of us are or have children. We're at a total loss. One of my friends died almost a year ago to the day, so this has been on my mind a lot lately. I flew out for her funeral and met up with a group of friends. Together, we drove to the town where she was to be interred. Because we're all poor college graduates, we took the cheap route and shared a hotel room. The ride over was honestly kind of terrifying. Toward the latter part of the trip, conveniently after nightfall, we ended up driving through unfamiliar rural roads that were entirely devoid of other traffic. At one point, we were super lost and caught in a really thick fog, something completely uncharacteristic of the area. My friends joked that it was her ghost just messing with us. When we finally reached the hotel, it was about 11 and we were exhausted. We were all standing around in the lobby waiting to get checked in and it was a bit of a process. And that's when I saw my dead friend in the mirror she didn't look scary or dead or anything, and she wasn't even looking at me. That's why I didn't immediately parse that it was weird. I looked at her for a second or two and looked back down. When I fully registered what I had seen, I looked back up, but of course, she was gone. Empty space where she had been and all of that. Telling the story now, it seems so cliche. She looked so normal looking, though. She wasn't doing any type of scary dead ghost thing, she was just chilling there in the lobby like the rest of us, kind of bored, looking toward the concierge desk. She was wearing this leather jacket she had that fit her really well. Her eye makeup was like it always was. I mean, she looked great. I remember she was wearing these tiny gold filigree earrings that I had gotten her for Christmas. I didn't tell anybody I was with what I had seen because I didn't want to upset them. I still haven't told them. I don't think she was appearing to me or anything. Like, we were friends, but I definitely wasn't the closest person to her of everybody who was there at the time. I know it's likely that I was just tired, and that she was on my mind, and that I imagined it. But I do want to believe that it was true. It was really comforting to see her there. 
She didn't die suddenly. We all knew that it was going to happen for quite some time. One of her fears was that we would all forget about her when she passed. I chose to believe that she was just following us to make sure we made it to her funeral. Now that I've told the story, I feel kind of stupid, I guess. I just wanted to tell somebody. I am an atheist. I'm a skeptic. Yet, something unexplainable happened during a seance at my 16th birthday party a decade ago. It was autumn of 2006. My mother, sister, and I had just moved to a major city from a suburban town about six hours away. As I was a student in a new school, I had decided that inviting some acquaintances over for my birthday would be a good way to get to know people. About 15 to 20 teens showed up at my house at around 7 p.m. Most of the faces I recognized, but some of them I had never met before. I was excited that so many people had showed up, but very nervous to meet new people. A few hours in, we had all become fast friends and were all looking for a bit of fun. A girl I shared Spanish class with, Maria, thought it would be a great idea to hold a seance. Her grandma, a native of Puerto Rico, practiced the art and had taught her a few things throughout her life. Maria seemed to be familiar with the idea of talking to spirits, and we were all down for just about anything. Maria sat up on the living room floor and turned out every light in the house. She gathered a group of people to sit in a circle and hold hands. She told us that we would be reaching out to her deceased cousin, and that it was safest to start with somebody that she had a direct connection to. I was so nervous, but eager to see what would happen. Everyone became very quiet and still. The wind picked up outside, knocking on the walls and windows. You could hear the age of the house declaring its burden of weight. The connection we all had in that moment was eerie and beautiful. Together we joined hands and closed our eyes. Maria began speaking in Spanish. I couldn't understand most of what she was saying, but out of the words I did know, it seemed like she was speaking about her cousin. Maria's voice grew louder and stronger with every word. It seemed like she spoke for an eternity as she commanded the energy in the room. Suddenly, she stopped. Unaware of what was happening, I opened my eyes. The wavering candlelight was the only light source and it was pitch black outside of our circle. In an instant, we heard the sound of glass shattering on the dining room floor. The shrieks of boys and girls alike broke the silence. I panicked. This had my full attention. Maria told everybody to stay put, and she began speaking in a calm voice. Hector, is that you? No response. Hector, this is Maria. I'm reaching out to tell you that I love you. I hope you have found some peace. No response. I looked around the room in hopes to find out who was behind this shattering of glass. Everyone was accounted for. No one had left. Then the sound of a chair being dragged echoed throughout the house. I looked toward the foyer, where the dining room entrance is, just around the bend. I've heard the sound of my dining room chairs moving across the floor many times. There was no mistaking that sound. It was all too familiar, but it filled me with terror. If everyone was in the living room, then who was in the dining room? For a moment, the dragging ceased. I thought it was over. It wasn't. We watched as a chair flew across the foyer and crashed into the mirror that hung from the back of the front door. Everyone started screaming in terror. Someone in the group broke the circle, causing a chain reaction across the whole group. Maria freaked out, exclaiming, No! We all stood up and turned on the lights. This is over, Maria, I said. I walked into the foyer to see a dining room chair on its side. The mirror hanging on the back of the front door was cracked. My mom is going to kill me, I said. Hey, guys? 
Where's the broken glass? Someone asked. I picked up the chair and walked into the dining room. I expected to see a shattered vase, but there was nothing there. I heard something shattering in this room, Brandy said. I did too, said someone else, but I don't see anything though. What's going on? I don't know, but I don't think that was Hector, Maria said. We broke the circle, so now we'll never know. Es estupido. A look of confusion swept across my face. Mira, you're probably going to have something in your house now. You might want to call a priest and get your house blessed. My cousin did something like this once, and it messed him up for life, Santiago said. We decided that it was time to clean up and wrap up the party. People started saying their goodbyes and left for home. About six people decided they wanted to stay the night, so we had a small slumber party. We left the light on in the dining room, just in case. The next day, the rest of the party guests left. As the last guest left, I closed the door behind them, only to see a reminder of the night before, the broken mirror. Finally alone in the house, I started replaying the events in my mind and walking through the foyer and dining room. I searched the entire house for a shattered glass, but I couldn't find anything. I came to the conclusion that someone probably cleaned it up before I could see it for myself. With one mystery solved, I was determined to figure out how someone could have snuck into the dining room and thrown the chair. The living room couch borders the wall next to the entrance into the foyer. It's possible that someone snuck in there when I had my eyes closed in the hand circle, and I just missed them. But if someone did, I didn't know who. It seemed to me that everybody had been accounted for when we were sitting in the living room listening for a response. But I guess anything is possible. I decided to take a picture of the rooms and share them in class on Monday. I took a photo of the hallway, between the dining room and the foyer. The living room is off to the right of the foyer, and a photo of the mirror, behind the front door. I opened my laptop and downloaded them from the camera so that I could share them to MySpace. That's when I noticed that something was off about the photo of the mirror. There seems to be a figure between the staircase and the lamp. I checked the photo on the camera. It was the same thing, a figure in the mirror. Over the last decade, I've had a really hard time trying to figure out what it is, if it's anything at all. Like I said, I'm an atheist and a skeptic, but maybe someone has an answer that I just haven't considered yet. At this point, I'm open to anything. In college, I would go home every other weekend to work at the job I had had since high school. I would drive directly from campus after my last class on Friday to my job, about an hour. And after my shift was done, I'd go back to my parents' house, which was out in the middle of nowhere. My parents weren't yet home when I got back from work. They often spent their Friday and Saturday evenings drinking like they were the ones in college. So the house was dark. And, since it was mid-fall, so was the yard, save for the yard light. I pulled into my normal parking spot, got out of the car, and then turned to open the back door of my car and get my backpack out of the back seat. That's when I noticed that the bathroom light was on. Was that light on when I pulled up? It must have been, right? As I was contemplating the light and reaching for my backpack, there was suddenly a very angry-looking woman standing in the window, staring at me. We're not talking rusting bitch face here, either. She was pissed off, at me, and I knew it. We stood there staring at each other for a good ten seconds, when my parents pulled into the driveway and distracted me from my stare-down with the woman in the bathroom. By the time I turned back, the light was still on, but the woman was gone. We never saw her again.
I used to work the graveyard shift in a nursing home in Texas, and there were three occasions where I saw what I consider to be shadow figures. Nothing overtly scary happened, but it's the only location I've been at where I've had personal paranormal experiences. Incident number one. Maybe a week or two before this occurred, a man passed away suddenly. After waking up and following his normal morning routine, he went from getting himself dressed and going for his daily walk to having one cup of coffee. And in the time it took him to ask for his second cup and it being made for him, he had stopped breathing and was gone. During normal work duties, I saw a completely black head peek around a corner and then go back to being obscured by the walls, like a man peeked around the corner and then went back down the hall. There were never any noises associated with anybody leaving the room or anybody walking down the hall. And when I went to investigate, there was nobody there. The man that suddenly passed away lived in a room down that hallway, and I've always felt that it was him still being present. Incident number two. Working graveyard shift, we did some housekeeping duties since lots of people slept through the night and I guess they wanted to give us something to do. So I was dusting around the TV and I saw a human shadow walk behind a couch reflected in the TV. Again, no sounds of a resident opening a door and at this point, everybody was in their rooms, sleeping. I assumed it was my coworker since I hadn't seen her in a little while. I figured she was doing some cleaning in another area. A few minutes later, while I was still dusting, she came out of the area where we do laundry. It was on the other side, so clearly it wasn't her. Again, there was no resident up because the walk that I saw was completely fluid, and not one of the residents was physically able to walk like that. It was like somebody in their 20s with no physical difficulties, just casually walking. And again, there was no color reflected in the TV. It was a fully black walking shadow. That one did unsettle me a bit. In a third incident, there was a woman who we knew was passing away. Our duty was to keep her clean and as comfortable as we could while she was in the process of passing. That night, I saw through the window of the nurse's station a pure white shadow walk one way down the hall that the woman was living on, and then walk down the hall again in the first direction. To this day, I don't know why that figure was white when the first two figures I saw were black, but I like to think it was the woman's guardian angel or something like that, staying with her or waiting for her to pass and take her to the afterlife. After moving to Mississippi and getting jobs here, I haven't had any more paranormal experiences, so there must have just been a high level of energy at that place in Texas. It was a fairly new facility, so maybe in some way that had something to do with stirring up some energies. When many, many moons ago, I was well enough to aspire to be a nurse, I was in my first semester of clinicals on, of all wards, palliative care. At my school, we would go on Wednesday and meet the patient, find out about them, and if they had family, we would meet them too. Because of privacy concerns, I will be as minimally informative about identifiable data as possible, but my first patient was under the age of four with terminal cancer and was on their last leg. The family was warm and welcoming, and the kid was awesome. Despite being so ill, that kid was so happy. It was almost an instant big brother, little sibling bond. Thursdays were reserved for book work and research on the diagnosis and possible interventions, but I went back for a second visit on Thursday, just because. Fridays, that semester at least, were actual clinical service days, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. I arrived on the ward at 6.30, just to get ready, zen out a little bit, and prepare myself for anything that I could think of that I might need to do that day. When I walked in, I noticed the nurses were acting a little bit mopey. A few looked like they'd been crying. And it hit me, like someone sucker punched me right in the gut. The little one had passed on. My fears were right. My instructor allowed me to spend time with the family as they said goodbye. And when they stepped out, I helped prepare the little body for transport to the morgue. There was an odd feeling in the room after the parents and family left, and I swear I heard a giggle. To this day, when I'm having a bad day, 
I can still hear an adorable giggly tiny voice say, no sad, I okay, which is what the little one kept telling their mother when she slipped up and had a little cry. It helped stop me from quitting the program then and there on the spot, whether it's a little guardian angel trying to cheer me up, or just some figment of my subconscious mind trying to cheer myself up, it's an awesome thing. I know what I think it is, but I'm not one to be objective about it because of the experience. That's as close as I got to actual hospice care, but it really helped change my ideas about the process of death and how we respond to people experiencing it. In all the interactions, it was about being alive and making memories instead of sulking and feeling bad. And that's how I approach anybody who's at death's door now. I try to make good memories and live with them while I still can, and while they still can, but never condescendingly or as a means of placating anybody. It's genuine, as it should be. The hospital in which I worked did not do pediatrics, but I did work nights and I was a night float, so I ran around the entire facility all night long, helping out wherever I was needed. Our hospital began in 1863, so you can imagine how much it had grown over the years and how much death it had seen. We had everything from slamming doors to the sound of a phantom IV pole moving up one particular hallway toward the nurse's station. We had an elevator that ran seemingly at random throughout the entire night, with doors opening, then closing, before moving on to another random floor. We called the entity in the elevator Thomas, and we would all greet him when the elevator doors opened. There was an actual cold spot in the back right corner of that car. Every time I got squished into the corner while transferring somebody, I would apologize to Thomas for standing on him. He never seemed to mind. We had a whatever in one of the stairwells that would pound on the door and then rattle the heavy latch, startling whoever was staying in the next room. We called it the whatever too because we had no idea what it was. These were heavy metal fire doors, mind you, that didn't just rattle in a light stairwell breeze. The whatever would always pound, then rattle twice in a row. When the patient would inevitably ask about the noise, I would tell them that it was a wind turbine rattling up above on the roof. No reason to freak somebody out at 2 a.m. We had the 1915 era nurse in the long dress, floor length apron, and starched white cap, forever making her rounds in the oldest part of the hospital. Patients used to see her all the time and would ask if they could talk to the really nice nurse again. I would tell them that I would try to find her, but she might be in another part of the hospital by now, which technically was true. We had the creepy telephone in an old break room that would ring, but there was only silence on the other end, every single time. But if you didn't answer that damned phone, something would pound on the break room door. But of course, nobody was ever there either. We had the room in the back corner in hospice oncology that no one liked to visit alone. It was dark and gloomy and so oppressive, and you got the feeling that you were being watched. The lights in that room never seemed to be bright enough. The maintenance guys told me about the disappearing black cat that they would see down in the tunnels. Call lights would go off in empty rooms, disembodied voices and conversations could be heard, and even a pair of legs in slippers and pajama pants could be seen shuffling down a hallway in Nero. Lots of stuff went on there. None of it was ever overly frightening or gave a bad vibe. It was just interesting. To me at least. Except maybe that room up in hospice. Screw that room. I work at a hospital and I'm constantly in the ER visiting with patients. There was one day that I was rushing down the hall in phase two, which wasn't opened yet because it was around nine and that phase doesn't get staffed until 10. I was trying to get to a meeting and as I passed the last room before getting to a door that only employees have badge access to, I saw an older man in a gown there who said hello and waved. 
I was confused as to why he was in there, so I doubled back to excuse my rushing and see if he was lost or if he needed help to his room. When I got there, though, there was nobody there. It's a long hallway, and all of the other doors were shut. There's no way that he could have made it to the other end and around the corner in the three seconds it took for me to turn around and look into the room. I shrugged it off and went to my meeting. A few hours later, when I was coming back through the employee door, I glanced over there, and there were several techs trying to work on something that, at the time, I couldn't see. One of the nurses told me that they had to unplug all of the equipment because all of the alarms would not stop going off, even though the machines were off. She thought that something caused an error because they kept randomly going off on the night shift nurse after the man in there passed away. At that point, I got goosebumps, and to this day I get creeped out when I walk down that hallway alone. So, I'm an RN. I was on evening shift several years ago on a GI surgical unit and was assigned to a new patient. I got him settled in and such and then went off shift. I went home and went to bed. That night, I clearly dreamed that he died. In my dream, he made an awful choking noise. Agonal gasp, I think it's called. And I knew he was gone. There were two other people in the room in my dream, though I couldn't clearly see their faces or identify them. Back on shift the next day, I learned that sure enough, he had died during the night. I now work in a community health unit in an economically depressed area. Through the generous donations of a local foundation, we have the ability to give away brand new infant car seats to families in need. A few years ago, I had a favorite family that I had been working with for several months, they had some challenges to get through, but we were working really hard and making good progress. They had a nine-month-old baby who had recently outgrown his car seat. Such a handsome little man. So, of course, we were able to get them a new seat. I showed his parents how to fit him into it properly and tighten the straps. As I was doing this, I had this absolutely gut-wrenching feeling. I kept encouraging the mom to get those straps tight enough. I watched his dad carry him and his new seat out to the car just shaking my head and feeling that it was all wrong. A few weeks later, Mr. Hansom and his dad were killed in a car crash. I don't know for sure, but I feel like he died in the seat that I gave him. I know it's not my fault. It just sucks. Those are two patients and two stories that will always stick with me. I've had lots of patients die over the years, and I don't always get premonitions. It's pretty hit and miss with me, but those are experiences I'm not soon to forget. I worked at a facility in the Rocky Mountains that was originally built as a spa in the early 1900s. Teddy Roosevelt was a frequent visitor. Staff at that time lived on the premises, in the basement to be exact, because commuting was impractical. One of the nurses committed suicide in the basement over a lost love. There were stories of sightings of her from time to time over the decades. A present night shift supervisor who was a fervent disbeliever in all things supernatural and mocked those who did, got the surprise of her life one night. Walking down one of the long hallways while doing rounds, she looked up and saw the nurse, in uniform, hanging from the ceiling. Everybody in that building heard the supervisor screaming. When she left her shift that morning, she quit, and never returned. I'm not a medical professional myself, but I did spend a lot of time in a hospice house last year, and I want to relate something one of the nurses told me. I was there with my brother, who had driven overnight to be with our mom during her last days. She was still pretty lucid at that point, and I want to add, my mom died of colon cancer, 
so there was no dementia or anything like that that would have mentally impaired her. We were just sitting with her, talking quietly, even laughing a little bit with her. We were all in pretty okay spirits considering the circumstances. Suddenly, she began slowly counting. One, two, three, and pointing her finger to a different spot in the room with each number. We of course asked her what she was doing, and a nurse came into the room about that time. My mom had gotten up to 12 by that point. We asked her again, what are you doing? And I will never forget her response. There are just, there are just so many people here. How did you and your brother get so many people here? And I know them all. She actually looked so happy when she said that, and so pleased, as if we had planned some kind of party for her. We just kind of smiled and nodded, because the only people there were my brother, myself, and the nurse. Later that day, the nurse took us aside, and said that this is a very common occurrence in hospice rooms. The patient sees loved ones, usually all deceased, crowded around to their bedside. She said, sometimes the family members and the staff see them too. I was working for an ambulance service, and from day one, I would say weird things happened in the hospital and in our building. Things like waking up to door slamming, or one time waking up after I heard somebody say, wake up, like two inches from my face, and getting a call a minute later. It was more so the feeling of breath hitting my face an instant before the words that freaked me out. Certain parts of the buildings had a weird feeling, like you were being watched. Occasionally, things moved out of the corner of your eye, things like that. I know weird stuff happens around sleep, and around lack of sleep, for that matter, so those aren't exactly paranormal experiences for sure. But who knows. This story is different, though, because it wasn't just me. A few winters ago, I was working, and it was snowing. The other medic and I had gone over to the ER to help with a trauma, and when we got back, we were both in the kitchen area, sitting, talking, just letting the adrenaline wear off. Our part of the building was the third floor of a long rectangular building with one long hallway down the middle and stairwells at both ends. So as we're sitting there, we both hear boot steps, walking up one of the set of stairs, getting louder as it gets to our floor, and then the door at the end of the hall opening and closing. We weren't sure who it was, but other people had keys to the building, so it wasn't that strange at first, although it was weird that anybody would be coming up at around three in the morning. Our building is separate from the main hospital, and it's a small facility, so there's not a lot of people around at night anyway. We kept talking, expecting to see someone walk by the room or have someone say something, but nothing. After a minute or two, I poked my head out and looked down the hall. No one was there. We didn't hear any footsteps once the door had opened and closed. After a minute or so, we went down the stairs and looked out into the parking lot and out the door. No tire tracks, no shoe prints, and like I said, it was snowing. We went to the other door, and none were there either. It definitely creeped us both out. The building was old and had been a lot of different things, serving mostly hospital functions. As far as I know, though, no patient rooms were ever there. Certainly people die in the ambulances, and in the hospital, but I don't know of any other deaths in the building. I mentioned it to some of my co-workers the next day, and they said that they had heard doors slamming, and one medic who used to be there swore that a locked door on the sleeping room flew open in the middle of the night when he was there alone. As far as anything with patients goes, I don't think I ever saw anything paranormal. Death is a process, and weird things can definitely happen during it, so it can be hard to draw the exact line between normal and paranormal, I suppose.
I've recently started a new job in a memory care facility. Typically, the hours are 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. Last night, I worked a double, 3 p.m. to 7 a.m., and I had a weird experience with a patient. It began when putting her to bed. She began staring into a corner of the room, completely unresponsive to me. After numerous attempts, she came to and screamed, The devil is in my room. This occurred at 7 p.m. As a healthcare professional, I brushed it off as her Alzheimer's. Two hours pass, and I hear a door down the hallway slam. All of the patients are in the living room with me, but that particular one. I went down the hall and found her door wide open. When I went in, her wheelchair was flipped over. She was sitting on the edge of the bed, staring at the corner, once again whispering, The devil, the devil, the devil. I get her situated and I let it go. Fast forward to 3 a.m. I hear this blood-curdling scream coming from the hallway. I run straight to her room. She was standing on her bed, staring at the ceiling, chanting. In French. The weird thing? This woman can't stand without support from the nursing staff. Not even a little. It creeped me out pretty badly, and I have completely refused working third shift because of it. She's been completely normal since that incident. Watching the cameras, you can see the slammed doors and hear weird noises, and it's clear that nobody is around to do it. Has anybody experienced anything similar in a medical facility? It's a first for me, but I'm interested in other similar stories. I worked as an EMT for one of the busiest cities when it comes to 911. It was a beautiful summer day and everyone was at the beach enjoying the sun. Tones drop and we get to our rig to see that we're responding to a potential infant drowning. We get to the scene and find PD performing CPR. We take over and start doing everything we can. I get this weird feeling to look up mid-compression and I see the little girl that I'm performing CPR on standing there, three feet away from me. She doesn't say anything, but I get a feeling, a calmness, one that tells me everything is going to be okay. We get pulses back for a minute, then lose them. By that time, the fire engine shows up, and we load and go. Fire driving the rig, my partner, a fire medic, and I in the back doing everything we can to save this girl. We get to Children's Hospital and all three of us are too invested at this point to just offload and go, so we stay and fight the battle with the ER team. It was the moment I chose to leave EMS. We lost her. My heart sank. How could I get a fleeting feeling of hope and then lose her? I took it personally to deliver the news to her parents. I broke down and cried with them, holding them and telling them I was sorry. I get back to the rig after what seems like an eternity, and in the back, in the airway seat, I see the little girl, just sitting and smiling. I don't know, I got that calmness all over again, like she was telling me it was okay. Fast forward about a year. I will admit that I have had paranormal activity happen around me in my personal life, like seeing the same ghost since I was ten seeing backpacks fly off of countertops, water glasses full being thrown to the ground when there's no breeze. But this whole past year, whenever I'm stressed or I need calmness, she comes and shows up and calms me. I still deal with the fact that I couldn't save her. She was my hardest no-save, but I think I gained a guardian angel in her no matter how crazy that might sound. My friend came to me with this story yesterday. 
She works at a nursing home, often at night. Just the other night, someone called 911 from inside the home. The staff did not know that this occurred until the EMT arrived. They relayed the information that an elderly woman had called. She said that she was scared because nobody was around and she couldn't find the staff, also adding that she felt lost and scared, which they assumed to be a sign of her dementia. After investigating all of the cameras around the facility, not a single soul was awake at this time of night. It was around 2 a.m. They tracked the phone call. When they did, they traced it to a phone which was off the hook in a room of a woman who had passed away around a week earlier and had a close personal connection with my friend. She spooked to say the least, and it's awfully sad that this soul is apparently stuck in some sort of limbo. My mom has worked in the same nursing home for the past 20 years and has had a few strange experiences. She wanted me to tell her story because we both find her story interesting and creepy. And we wondered if anybody else has experienced number four in particular. So the home that she works in has two floors, a basement and an attic. Long hallways connect to the residents' rooms, sharply branching left and right at the end. And at the other end is the kitchen and dining room. For reference, at the end of the hallway to the right is the storage and cleaning supply area. No resident rooms are on that side. Number one. One night, my mom was working late and had to go get something from the supply cupboard. She turned the corner from the kitchen to head up the long hallway. She has MS, so she has to be careful walking so she tends to look at the floor while doing so. As she's walking, she glances up and sees what looks like the bottom of an old Victorian red dress going around the corner to the right, near the floor and moving rather quickly. Obviously, sometimes residents can wander at night, but none of them could turn around the corner that quickly. She continues up to check anyway though, because you never know. Lo and behold, no one is there. The only three doors down there are still locked. I don't think she got the supplies she needed. Instead, she just noped out of there. Number two. It was Christmas time, and my mom was to go up to the attic and get the Christmas napkins and other items down. None of the staff liked going up there because there's always been an eerie feeling. They usually go up in pairs. My mom took me up there when I was a teenager, and I can confirm, it has a creepy vibe. But for whatever reason, she had to go up by herself this time. As you can imagine, the attic is rather large. At the opposite end from the elevator is where all the junk that they don't use gets put, and nobody really goes that far over. So my mom's been up there for about five minutes, gathering whatever she needed, when she hears a rustling behind her. She stopped and paid attention for a second, when all of a sudden, there's a loud bang from behind the junk, with no explanation and no apparent source. Again, she was out of there. Number three is more of an ongoing incident. She hears footsteps behind her all the time. She'll turn around, and nobody and nothing is there or anywhere near her. And finally, there's number four. I don't know how much of a coincidence this is, but whenever the residents pass away, it's always in threes. One will pass and then everybody's like, oh no, two more are gonna go. And they always do. Then nobody will die for weeks or months. Then as soon as one gets poorly and passes, so do another two. It's really strange. My mom tells me most of the staff have had some weird experiences, but I don't know their stories. Has anyone else heard of this with the residents passing in threes? I would really like to know if anyone else has this experience going on, and so would my mom.
I worked for Starbucks for about two years in two different locations between the years 2017 and 2019. The one that I transferred to was the new one in my town, which I was training for in the next town over. They had torn down an older cafe that Starbucks replaced. I have a friend who worked at the cafe and said that they only experienced some minor happenings of the paranormal. Well, this is what happened to myself and a fellow co-worker when we were closing one night. It was a normal night after closing and I was doing the floors and cleaning the bathrooms. After closing, someone was still inside one of the bathrooms. I knocked and I let them know that we were closed. The person said, okay, and I heard them wash their hands in the sink. This is a single room bathroom, no stalls. The locks we used were the same type used in hospitals, being true locks, that you cannot accidentally lock behind yourself when leaving. Also, there is a motion-censored light that turns off after 15 minutes of no movement. My shift supervisor cannot do the drawers and registers with a customer still inside of the building. So, after another 20 minutes, I knocked once more and asked if they were okay. I hear a man's voice say, yes, then grunts, many grunts, followed with many bangs, the sink turning on and off. I live in a small town and there are many people who use substances in bathrooms. Prior to this incident, somebody was banging on the walls and shooting up within the bathroom. Police were contacted and he was taken out. So with that having happened before, we thought that was the same thing that was happening now. We call the police and the station is right next door to our Starbucks. We are behind the station. They never came because it was a busy night. The motion censored light is still on after an hour. More bangs, the sink being on and off. Again, I knock and let the person know that the police have been notified. More grunting. There's a key to unlock the door, but I was 18 at the time. I was not going to put my coworkers at risk. My coworkers and I try to just keep closing, but still be as alert as possible that this person was still making noise and sounded like they were in distress. We call the police again after about just under an hour of waiting for them. The operator tells us that we'll have to be patient and wait it out. I'm watching the light under the door until after a while it goes off. No movement for 15 minutes. My shift calls my general manager and she says to contact 911 for an unresponsive unit because the person could have died from drugs in that bathroom while we were waiting. Next thing that happens, firefighters come in with EMTs. Everyone can hear the man grunt once. The EMT asked if he was okay. The EMT then told him that they were opening the door. After another moment, the EMT did just that, opened the door, and nobody was inside. He looks at us and we look at him. Everyone is just frozen. We tried to collect ourselves, but we were all shocked. There's no vent in the ceiling. The trash can is big, but not big enough to hold a person. And there was no way for us to not see this person leave, especially when we all just heard him grunt seconds before the door was opened. My coworkers that worked with me that night quit shortly after this, as did I. While I worked there, I had the ice bucket thrown at me, food thrown at me, items appear across the store when they would never by law be there in the first place. Only a small handful of the original workers from when that location had opened ended up staying. My manager still works there and she is convinced that there's something there as well. I was a certified nursing assistant working third shift at an end-of-life senior care facility in Upper Michigan. The hours were usually quiet as everybody was in bed or heading there and meals were over. The overnight job entailed lots of cleaning, mopping, dusting, and prepping for breakfast at 8 a.m., as well as answering night calls or being on death watch every 15 minutes. Those were the worst, 
as you knew that death was coming soon. One resident was close, but could linger for days, the doctor had said. People said and did the oddest things at those last gasps, too. Needless to say, it was not an easy job. But the pay sucked equally as well. Small town blues for job prospects. Watching other people's family members die is not for the faint of heart. It's a constant reminder of life's worst parts and the limited time we've been given. One of my favorite co-workers had a great upbeat attitude. Her name was Val, and I shared this night shift with her. We knew our preferred tasks and set about them happily, chatting to each other in the dining room and getting it ready for breakfast. Val needed to use one of the nearby employee toilets for an extended stay, so I proceeded to mop the opposite hallway facing the nurse's station and the bathroom where Val was. I mop backwards, pulling rather than pushing so that I don't leave footprints. Naturally, I can't see where the carpet begins and where I need to dip my mop and turn direction. The only way I know I'm there is when my shoe heel hits the edge. I can mindlessly do this job while looking around the hallway. I was in the process of dipping and squishing my mop when a form caught my eye in the hallway arch entrance to the doors that lead to both the nurse's station and opposite the bathroom where Val was. I thought it was her returning back to the floor, but nope. What I saw gave me a great open mouth, silent screamed pause. Peeking and stretching out across part of the hallway ceiling, maybe 15 feet long into the main taller hallway where I stood, was a dark human shadow form, smoky and eyeless. It stayed there for maybe two to four seconds, and then zip, it shot back into the hallway. I stood there, scared, silent, and immobile. As I heard the bathroom door open, Val scream, and then the door slamming again. I heard her call my name through the closed door and slowly crept to the hallway to see nothing there but the doors to the nurse's station, the bathroom, and now the break room across from the utility closet where the cleaning supplies lived. The hallway was clear. I called out Val's name from outside the door, knocking too. She asked in a squeaky voice, Is it gone? I responded, yes, what did you see? Because I saw something, now get out here now. Don't leave me alone with that. Val came out and grabbed me in a hug so hard that I knew how scared she was. Val was shaking. She said that she opened the bathroom door and she should have been able to see the nurse's station's open door and part of the hallway wall. But what she saw blocked the door and most of the wall. That thing was huge. It filled the wall and was smoky black. She didn't see a top or a face shape to it, but it blocked her exit like a smoky haze right against the door, leaking in. She slammed the door fast and screamed my name. We worked side by side the rest of our shift, never leaving each other's sight until it was time to leave. The morning shift supervisor wondered why we both clocked out and bolted in a huge hurry that day. Val told her about it later in a text message, saying that she was taking a day off. I'm not sure if it was a reaper we saw, but right after we clocked out, a resident died. This is the story of Madeline, the doll that has my face. For context, my mom is the original owner of Madeline, but Madeline has been mine since I was a child. Madeline was bought by my mother about 35 years ago, long before I was born. There's a possibility that she's a lot older than that, as she was secondhand when my mom bought her. These are my experiences with this doll. I'm well aware that creepy doll is a trope, but stay with me. Madeline, I named her, is a porcelain doll with a soft body filled of horse hair, with her hands and feet and face made of plain white porcelain. 
Her hair, according to a doll expert I had her repaired by a few years ago, is a combination of horse and human. She's about 30 centimeters long, with brown hair, blue eyes, wears a blue cotton dress with embellishments, black leather lace-up boots, and a somewhat Victorian underdress. I believe she was pretty common, a generic doll type. I base this off the fact that I took her to doll shows as a child to find out a little bit more about her, since she doesn't have any marks, and another lady had her almost exact identical replica. Same dress, same colors, hair, and everything. So she must have been pretty common. The only difference? The face. The lady and I compared the dolls, vividly pointing out how my doll's face was almost identical to mine. I'm not saying it's impossible to have dolls who look somewhat similar to you. I mean, that's just good marketing, really. But at the time, I had a jaw problem that required surgery, and the doll's jaw perfectly matched mine heavy overbite. This lady's doll didn't at all. Given the dolls had everything else exactly the same except the face, it just sort of makes me wonder if at some point her face had been replaced or repainted before my mom purchased her. I don't believe Madeline to be a harmful entity, but a few strange things have happened that make me wonder. As a child, I kept her on my bed on the top bunk. I had one of those loft beds with a desk under it while I was at school. If someone was to change the sheets, they'd put her back because mom was always worried that the dog would eat her. She was always on my bed and I was the only kid in the house. So I'm the only one who played with her at the time. At school one day, I would have been about 10 years old. I broke my right wrist. Most children will break something in childhood and I had fallen out of a tree. I remember getting home from the hospital at about 8 p.m., and I was a bit dopey from the assistance they'd given me. Because I couldn't climb the bunk in a cast, Mom made me up the mattress on the ground. I had grabbed Madeline so that Mom could move the bed, when suddenly, Madeline's right hand dropped onto the carpet. I would brush this off, but more has happened. Once I needed stitches in my head. I came home and there was a chunk of Madeline's hair gone. I had jaw correction surgery. Now neither of us have an overbite. I've had knee surgery and have a scar on my right foot. And she has just had a crack repaired on her right foot. Mom, who hadn't seen her in a few years as I've had things in storage, recently made a comment. And it's what made me decide to tell my story. She said, I remember her having a much younger looking face when you were little. Could this doll be aging with me, experiencing things like I am? I really don't know what it means, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. My family has a history with what we call brownies, but what I think are some kind of house spirit. They tend to take things and then return them to strange places. I always thought it was just us misplacing things or object blindness, but I've had a few events that have changed my mind. Once in college, my roommate couldn't find her school ID. She needed it to ride the bus, so I helped her look. We tore the apartment apart, emptied drawers, even dumped out her purse. We pulled everything out of her wallet too, but the ID was nowhere to be found. We started to talk about finding another way to school and decided to walk. So she went to go get her purse and there, sitting across the shut zippered top of her bag was her ID. We always had a brownie at home, but it seemed once we moved out, each of my sisters and myself got one as well. When I moved across the country, I spent a few weeks in my new rental with nothing but some dishes, my laptop, and an inflatable mattress. With the house being so empty, it seemed there were none of the usual places for my brownie to hide. I actually saw her darting from room to room, 
a gray blur about the size of a cat. It really freaked me out, so I asked her not to show herself again in exchange for a shot of whiskey, which I poured and left on the windowsill. She didn't show up or cause any mischief again until the furniture arrived. I had a very accurate reading by a psychic once who channeled some dead loved ones and things like that, and she even mentioned that I had a being attached to me, which she called a gremlin. I don't know what my brownie is, a sprite or a fairy or a house spirit. I know she acts up the more the house feels chaotic. Fighting or disorganization especially trigger her. I also know that the insane places things reappear usually defy all logic, and that everyone who cohabitates with me ends up having at least one experience with my brownie. I also know that leaving a shot of hard liquor out just for her will usually get your stuff back. I'm a strong believer in listening to my gut. I always have been and always will be, since it's gotten me out of a few situations. One was my freshman year of high school. School had ended for the day, and since I was staying at my dad's house that week, I decided I would walk home. His house wasn't that far from school. Everything was fine, until I turned down the street where there's a shortcut. It led straight into my neighborhood. As I was walking to the shortcut, a man drove by staring at me. My stomach dropped and turned. I took this as a note to walk a bit faster. By the time I got into my neighborhood, the man was circling around the cul-de-sac, waiting for me. He had a smirk slowly creeping onto his face as I walked by his car. I tried to ignore him the best I could and just kept walking. He would drive past me and yell vulgar things at me. He kept turning around and driving past me again and again. As I turned down my street, he followed closely behind. I saw him drive down my street and turn into someone's driveway to turn back around. I quickly got into my house and locked the door behind me. I then turned around to look through the peephole so I could see if he left. He didn't. The man pulled up into my driveway and got out of the car. Luckily, my neighbor, who's a family friend, was out in his garage. He came over yelling at the man and then stayed with me until my dad got home. A week later, my dad told me he saw the man parked at the end of the street, waiting for me. He went and threatened the man and we haven't seen him since, but I'm still freaked out every time I go and visit my dad. It's safe to say, I won't be walking home alone ever again. I was about seven years old, my brother about 10. It was well past our bedtime when our mom woke up off the couch to put us to bed. Our dad worked construction out of town back then, so it was often just us three at the house for weeks at a time. Up the stairs and to the immediate right was our parents' bedroom. Going left put you in the middle of a hallway. Taking another left down that hallway led to my brother's room. The opposite end was my room, which was also across the hall from our upstairs bathroom. At either end of the hallway are windowed doors that we always kept locked and rarely used. The door on my end led to a balcony overlooking our front yard, and the door on my brother's end opened to our back porch. The house kind of leans into a small hill. My brother and mom both had a habit of waking up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I only knew this because I was always a light sleeper, and they just couldn't help flushing with the door wide open. This night, however, my brother stopped on his way to his room and came back toward the bathroom. He said, 
I'm going to try to pee before I go to bed. The past few nights, I've been too afraid to walk to the bathroom. I keep seeing a man in stripes at the end of the hall. I don't know if my mom wrote it off as my brother telling ghost stories to try to scare me, or if she was already half asleep and didn't catch it. But she didn't react at all to my brother's confession. I, on the other hand, was terrified by it. The fear of seeing a ghost like that at the end of the hallway, or through the window, is the reason I started running from the stairs to my bedroom at night. Years later, when I was about 18, my mom and I were having a conversation in her car about a dog that we had for a very short time when I was little. We were sharing stories about Max's tendency toward destroying my shoes and other unruly behaviors when my mom blurted out, do you remember that time I opened the front door for the cops and Max ran inside to the kitchen and started tearing open that big bag of dog food we had? This really caught me by surprise because in all the years I lived in that house, we never once called the cops. We were a gun-owning family in a quiet, rural West Virginia neighborhood. And also, nothing had ever really happened that would have required home defense, let alone the cops. I asked her what she was talking about, and she looked equally surprised, as if she had just revealed something by accident. Oh, that's right, she said. I never told you because you were too young at the time. Okay, so one night, I woke up hearing noises outside my window. And when I looked, I saw a man staring into my bedroom. She went on to describe how turning on the lights caused him to take off running, and how she grabbed my dad's pistol before calling the cops. I can't remember all the details I gave them when they showed up, but he was a tall white male wearing a striped shirt and jeans and short dark hair. Something like that, she said. They said it matched the description of a man they were looking for in the area. Turns out he had escaped from jail on a murder charge. Now, I know it sounds so obvious hearing those two stories back to back, but this was years apart. And honestly, it wasn't until a few years ago, in my mid-twenties, that I pieced together that my brother had unknowingly warned us about a murderer who spent multiple nights casing our home while we thought he was telling ghost stories. So this happened when I was around nine years old and I'm 25 now, and it's something that I will never forget. It gives me goosebumps until this day. I live in a terraced house, four houses combined, and my neighbors and I each have our own little patio. There's a small road, 10 meters from my yard, where people do their Sunday walks and so on. Only a small fence separates my small yard and patio from that road. I live in a pretty crowded area, with several of these terraced houses spread around in my neighborhood. So seeing people walking on that road is pretty normal for me. Seeing random people standing on my patio is not. When I was nine, I usually got home from school about an hour before my mom got home from work. I live maybe 50 meters away from school, so mom figured I was mature enough to be home alone for around an hour before she got home. This one day, I got home from school. I did the usual thing, which was to make sure I locked the front door and double-checked that the back door leading to the patio was also locked. I was nine. Being alone was a little scary, even though it was in the middle of the day and only for an hour. I then rushed up to my room upstairs to play as much PlayStation as possible before my mom came home and made me do homework. While playing, I heard this noise coming from outside my window. My room was located one floor over the patio, with a view to the road that I told you about before. It was kind of like the sound of a cat, but my cat had been missing for over three months. Hope sparked, and I thought, oh my gosh, did he finally come back? I ran downstairs to check if it was my cat, but the sight that met me still gives me goosebumps. 
There was a guy standing on my patio, a tall guy with black hair covering half of his eyes, making him look like a male version of the ring woman. I could hear him making high-pitched sounds, almost like a cat meowing. A brown liquid was running down from his mouth, and I could see him spitting out my dad's stomped cigarettes. He was actually eating from the ashtray. I was frozen observing this. Eventually, I snapped out of it, and I screamed so loudly that the man must have heard it. He didn't react. He kept meowing and eating from the ashtray. I ran upstairs to my room, locked the door, and called my mom, who then called the cops. I've never been more terrified in my life, laying in my bed under my sheets, shivering with fear, as I hear these creepy high-pitched noises from the guy eating cigarette butts from the ashtray on my patio. I kind of blacked out for a moment, because the next thing I remember is the police arriving on the road by my yard. I hear them talking to the guy, saying stuff like, what are you doing? Get over here or we'll come down and arrest you, and so on. He didn't respond, but instead made the high-pitched sounds even louder and more frequent. I decided to look through the window, feeling safe now that the cops were there. I could see two police officers standing by my fence, one man and a woman. I did not see the creepy man, however, because he was standing directly one story beneath me and my field of vision. The police jumped the fence, and I remember hearing the creepy guy screaming louder than anything I've ever heard before. He charged the female police officer with full force, and he knocked her out cold. The male officer immediately tased the guy, leaving him shaking on the ground, still screaming. The policeman struggled to keep him on the ground while putting handcuffs on him, but eventually he made it. After a while, he managed to wake up the female police officer, who seemed to be badly hurt. He called for backup and an ambulance, and then he sees me standing in the window above him. The expression on my face must have been something else, because he just looked at me and said, I sure as hell hope you didn't see all that. I started to cry. By this time, neighbors started to arrive, wondering what the hell was going on. One of my neighbors, an elderly woman, made me come down, and she took care of me until my mom came back home. The police took the creepy guy with them in the car and left. Before they left, they promised to come back and talk to us about what happened. But this is where the story takes an unexpected turn. The male police officer came back later that night and sat down with me and my mom to talk. He explained that the guy on my patio was actually diagnosed with a severe mental disorder. He had escaped a facility where mentally challenged people lived, located around five kilometers from where I live. He explained that the guy had actually been living in my house five years ago, but he had been forced to move when his mom, his only caretaker, died. The poor guy probably thought he would find his mom in my house. He missed the routines, and he missed living there with his mom. The police had to move him from the house that time five years ago because he was extremely strong. From what I heard, he had extreme tensions in his body, making his muscles grow stronger and stronger throughout the years. This was the reason he reacted the way he did when the police came that day. Still frightened, I told the police officer that he needed to make sure this would never happen again, and he promised that it wouldn't. After a few sleepless nights, my life got back to normal. The years went by and the guy didn't come back, until one year ago. At that time, my mom and dad had moved out. I bought the house from them and I'm still living there today. I was enjoying my morning coffee on the patio when I see this random guy stopping on the road by my fence. He just stands there, looking at me. I look at him and give him a nod. And then I hear the high-pitched meowing. Holy shit, it's him, I think. His hair had turned gray, but the high-pitched noises were unmistakable. 
My heart started racing, and I instantly remembered the reason why he was back. I realized that he must have managed to escape again. Because I kept my cool a bit longer than when I was nine, I started to realize how sorry I felt for the guy. Sixteen years later, and he was back to look for his mom. I decided to carefully ask him if he wanted to come down to the patio. He instantly jumped the fence. I started to think he would knock me out like he did that police officer, but he didn't. He smiled. He just looked at me and smiled. I offered him to sit down. He didn't respond. I offered him to come inside. He started laughing. We went inside and his face lit up. I mean, pure joy. He was home. It reminded him of the life he had had with his mom. It almost made me tear up. All of a sudden, he sat down on my couch, turned on my TV, and switched directly to cartoons. I observed him for a while. He was just completely focused on the cartoons. I just wanted him to enjoy the moment, so I didn't say anything to him. I realized I had to call the facility to let them know. The caretakers arrived 10 minutes later. After a lot of convincing, he got back up, crying, and they went back to the facility. I called the facility two days later, and we made a deal. His name is Tom, and I now consider Tom my friend. Every Sunday from the day he returned, Tom and his caretakers visit me to watch cartoons. They say that it's the highlight of his week. It makes my heart warm. Now, for several years, my thoughts were, let's not meet Guy on the patio eating from the ashtray. But now, my thoughts are, let's meet every Sunday to watch cartoons, my good friend Tom. My mom went to Germany with my older brother last spring on a mother-son trip. I have heritage from all over the place, so I don't really feel that I'm one nationality more than another. However, my mom's side is more Eastern European, and they somewhat identify with their German heritage. Recently, my mom was going through paperwork after realizing that after 30-something years of marriage to my dad, her maiden name was still on some legal documents and she needed to change them over to her married name. She found some old family documents from her side about her relatives becoming US citizens in the early 1900s. We live in New York and they had settled in New York City as many people had when they moved here during that time period. My mom was showing me that I coincidentally shared a name with an ancestor. We have the same first name and my middle name was her last name. My parents didn't know that, though, when they named me. My mom also pointed out the name of the town in Germany where my family came from, and she told me a very short but chilling story. When my mom was in Germany, she visited a church. As she stood there, she said she had this overwhelming feeling of familiarity, that her family used to worship there. Somehow she just knew. Lo and behold, she would find out years later in that document search that that church was in the town that our family had come to the U.S. from, and they had indeed worshipped at that church. Pretty cool. We moved into the house that we're in now, after my dad died. When I was little, I saw a lady sitting on the floor with her back against the wall and her head between her knees. Now, over 10 years later, my sister has seen her too. My niece and I have both heard a child giggle at the same time when no one was home. We've had lights turn on randomly. My stepdad and I were by the pool and heard a child talking too. I believe that some kind of male entity could be in the bathroom. I keep hearing deep breathing and somebody screamed mom the other day. 
Mostly, though, it only affects my sister and I. We're not scared, we're honestly just kind of annoyed. We're not really sure how to get them to stop messing with us. We don't really feel any negative energy, just obnoxious things. Has anyone else seen the same ghosts for years too? Cryptozoology is the study of unknown animals, along with plants, that have not yet been accepted by science to exist or be real. In some cases, cryptozoologists research accounts involving large carnivorous plants, consuming animals, and even human beings. What would you do if you encountered a tree starving for human blood, spawned not from nature, but by a supernatural force. In Japan, legends warn of such a vampiric plant, called the Juboko. Japanese folklore labeled demons, monsters, spirits, and other malevolent forces as yokai. A few of these supernatural entities resulted in a human, animal, or even a household transforming after experiencing some traumatic or violent event. Not surprising to discover legends about plants manifesting into yokai that feed upon humans, like the jiboko. In myth, this creature was once a tree within a battlefield, whose roots absorbed vast amounts of blood soaked in from the soil, from dead warriors giving birth to a monster. Jiboko appears as any other ordinary tree in the forest, waiting for an unsuspecting victim. Only the few observant may be warned to the unusual jagged branches or the several bones poking through the roots. Many fail to notice these features and fall victim to the tree once close enough. The branches would grab the prey and hoist them up the center of the tree. The victim would have their veins and arteries stabbed by the branches as the juboko sucks out all the blood. The corpse would either remain hanging or lowered to the ground for animals and other scavengers to feed upon until bones were littered around the roots. Often, Juboko thirsts for human blood, but will consume large animals when people, but will consume large animals when people are not available. Many Japanese legends of yokai will refer to ways of defeating them. Juboko may be a demon but it still has the same vulnerabilities of a plant. Some stories told of chopping the tree down while fighting off its branches or setting fire to it until ashes remained. Just to note though, myths do mention a juboko branch can heal wounds and cure ailments. I was in the armed forces in my younger years, and my first duty location was in Okinawa, Japan. I was stationed in Kadena, and was living in the dorms, barracks for army personnel. Anyway, we all had our own rooms at the time, but each room was linked to another through a shared bathroom. You could lock your room from your bathroom door for added security. My bathroom mate was a tall black dude, for the sake of the story we'll call him B. I was asleep one night and I awoke with a feeling of somebody watching me. I look near the foot of my bed and I see this tall dark figure. I was super groggy, possibly hungover, but I just remember saying, B, get the F out of my room you weirdo, and I proceeded to fall right back asleep. I awoke the next morning and I go through my routine for work when I realized that my bathroom door was still locked, from my side. Weird. I brushed it off and I went to B's shop during the day to look for him and ask him about the night prior. I talked to his shop lead and was told that B was temporary duty for about two weeks and has been gone for a couple of days now. Essentially, he was on a business trip. I have never felt the same in my room since that night, 
and I only told a few people this story. Okinawa is extremely haunted since there was so much history during World War II and before. As a bonus, I told B about it when he got back, and he laughed at me, saying that perhaps I was the weirdo. I also don't remember any strange feelings when that figure was at my bed, except for the feeling of being watched, which is what woke me up in the first place. I had other stories that happened to me while I was there, but suffice it to say that Okinawa is definitely haunted. Just a little info on where I lived in Japan. I lived on a small island south of mainland Japan called Okinawa. My dad is in the military, and the entire island is haunted, mainly the military bases, including the housing. I'm only going to mention the strange encounters that I personally had, but my entire family has stories from our time there. One night around 2-3 to three in the morning, I had randomly woken up on the couch. My brother and I often fell asleep in the living room on weekends. It was pitch black. My phone had died. I couldn't find the remote, and I was terrified. I sat in the darkness for a bit, waiting for my phone to charge. I heard this loud thud, like something plastic had been dropped from the ceiling, but I could never identify the source. Another thing that happened was one of the most terrifying things. My parents and brother were going out. My parents were shopping and my brother was visiting friends, meaning that I would be home alone. Before they left, I would hear the chairs at the table move around. We had faux wood floors. I went downstairs to check it out, but everything was the same, so I brushed it off like it was nothing. Then I was sitting on the couch, and I had this really strange feeling that something just wasn't right. I looked into the doorway to our kitchen. You can see the laundry room and the recycling bins from there. And a figure moved from the laundry room to the doorway three times. I was scared out of my mind. I started crying and I called my friend because my parents weren't answering. Then, about 10 feet in front of me, I see a figure with no legs glide across the room and disappear. Finally, I still can't explain how this one happened. I was in my room and my bed was pushed against the wall. I had a window on this wall and I had a shelf two to three feet above my headboard. On this shelf, I had a lot of knickknacks like figurines and stuff, but I also had this cross stitch that my mom did when she was little, sitting on the shelf being held up by two Funko Pop figurines. Thursday morning at around 3 to 4 a.m., I heard this loud bang that woke me up. It was loud enough to wake up my mom as well. She came into my room and asked what the noise was from, and I shrugged my shoulders and went back to sleep. That morning, I found out that it was the cross stitch from my shelf. It had slammed against my wall at the end of my bed. It didn't fall, because the Funko figurines were still standing, and it would have hit my head. I am half Japanese, female, living in Japan and working as a translator interpreter. A few years ago, I got hired for an awesome project as an interpreter for a producer and an award-winning director for a movie that was to be filmed in Okinawa. The movie didn't come through because there weren't enough sponsors though. Anyway, we got flown to Okinawa and I was excited on so many accounts, plus it was my first time to Okinawa. Everything was amazing. The friendly and warm Okinawan people, the food, the weather, and the beautiful beaches, until we reached the resort hotel. 
three key team members, including myself, were on the same floor. Our rooms were side by side. I remember as I walked up to my room door, I felt like something was off. I knocked firmly three times on the door, something I was always told to do by my father who has traveled around the world for work. As I opened the door to the room, about six feet away, I see an apparition of a lady standing there, looking at me. I thought, well, shit. But I had no choice. I'm here for work. She looked like a Japanese lady in her 20s or 30s, with long, dark hair. It was kind of neat. She was wearing a long, light-colored, bluish-white dress with some sort of a faint floral print, as though it had faded with time. She also looked darkish overall, energy-wise, like there was a slight dark gray mist surrounding her or emanating from her. I stood at the entrance and spoke politely in Japanese. Hello, excuse me, I am not here to disturb your peace or your space. I am here just for three days for work and I will leave after that. Thank you for understanding. I bowed deeply before entering. It seemed as though she understood me and mostly left me alone, although she barely leaves the spot she was standing in and just watches me whenever I am in the room. Each time I have to enter or leave the room or have to go to the kitchenette or the toilet and bath areas, I would have to walk by her. My best friend was in between jobs then and whenever I was back in the hotel room, she would spend the entire time on the phone with me so that I was less afraid, since being on the phone means I'm distracted from the lady who was always looking at me. I could feel her watching me, even as I showered, so I had to have my best friend on speakerphone while I did so. The kitchenette area near where she usually stands is also colder than the rest of the room, even though the air conditioning isn't there. I was really grateful that it was quite a spacious room, enough for four people. There were two beds and two futons for the tatami area, so this gives me some space between me and the staring lady. I slept with the lights and TV on, but at around 2 to 3 a.m., I would just wake up in shock, and that's because she had come close to me to watch me sleep. It happened every night that I was there. I got the feeling that she was just curious about somebody who could see her, but nonetheless it was quite a nerve-wracking experience. Before I left, I bowed to her again and thanked her for sharing her space. I don't think I will forget that work trip anytime soon. While on vacation in Japan last year, I stayed at an Airbnb near the Daigo Shrine in Kyoto, Japan. On my last night in town, I come back to my Airbnb at about 11.40 p.m. on a Monday night. Mind you, I had no alcohol or drugs in my system when this happened, and I was wide awake. The walkway to the shrine you have to walk through to and from the Airbnb was about three city blocks long by two blocks going both sides. As the layout goes, there were ditches at the foot of the walls, followed by a row of plants alternating all the way down, then a walkway in the middle, with a museum on the right, and a whole shrine and palace at the fork. I walk into the walkway of the shrine and I ask myself this question, why are there two kids hopping a wall? I saw these two little figures hop the wall to my right, and I paused to watch what was happening. As both get down, they run across the path, and they run all the way to the end of the path by the fork, and wait there while I was walking single file. They stand there for a few minutes. I walk a little closer because that was the way to my Airbnb. I make eye contact with these things. They were about three to four feet tall, 
very slim but proportionate, with a bigger head and pointed ears. They were as white as snow. Their eyes were about as big as our eye sockets, but completely black. Normally you can tell if someone is wearing clothes in a small distance, and I was only about 15 to 20 yards from them, but they had no sign of clothing. After making eye contact, both of them go running behind the corner that I had to turn. You could also see their shadows on the corner behind them, but I slowed down to give these things space because I was freaking out a little at that point. As I turned the corner, they were gone. But, as I was walking back to my Airbnb, I sensed that I was being followed. I couldn't hear or see anything, but I know they were there. Back in 2015, I joined my husband, who was in the Navy at the time, in Japan. I was so excited. Having been an Air Force kid and spending a few years in Japan previously, and even more so when I was told that we were living in town rather than on base housing. Our little house was an older style, but still fairly modern by Japanese standards with the living and dining room, toilet, and washroom downstairs, and the entire upstairs being our bedroom. We lived right by the local marina, walking distance from an aquarium and a grocery store, and I was immediately in love. When I arrived, a small apartment complex was being built next door, and I got used to the sounds of work going on throughout the day, as the walls of the house and the windows were fairly thin but I was never bothered by the noises, since I spent most of the daylight hours exploring and enjoying the surrounding area, and before I knew it, construction was done. That's when I started noticing the footsteps. At first, I had assumed that the footsteps I was hearing were just the construction workers, until I remembered the building was done, and one day, I finally realized that the footsteps I was hearing was out of bare feet. If you've ever lived in a place with wood floors, you know that there's a distinct sound when you walk on it barefoot versus wearing shoes. Even though the walls of the house were thin, I thought that I couldn't possibly be hearing any of my neighbors, but initially I gave it little thought. Then, one day, I was leaving the kitchen to go upstairs, and as I was approaching the hall, looking directly at the restroom, I paused when I thought I saw a stack of toilet paper, which I kept stacked on the windowsill, move. The window was closed, yet I saw the roll on the top of the little tower, as clear as day, nudge forward and fall to the floor, followed by the sound of faint footsteps. A little bit freaked out, I told my husband about it when he got home, joking that maybe we had a ghost. My husband then told me that he had witnessed something similar with a hiking stick that he kept by the front door. He'd been tying his shoes and had looked up in time to watch the stick slowly tip forward before it fell. And he admitted that he had occasionally heard the footsteps too. Now, I've never considered myself religious by any means, but I was raised with a healthy respect for the dead and the possibility of spirits so I looked into Japanese remedies to deal with potential ghosts. Since I didn't feel unsafe or necessarily uneasy in the house, I didn't think it was necessary to ask the local shrine for a blessing, and with the help of a more experienced bilingual friend, took the advice of one of the shrine maidens to hang a wind chime on the property. I picked one up from the 100 yen store, Japan's equivalent to America's Dollar General or something similar, and sure enough, I stopped hearing the footsteps, and nothing fell unexpectedly after I hung it. I figured even if it was just a comforting placebo effect, I'd picked a cute chime and it made a pretty cool sound, so I was happy regardless. 
Several months passed, and the string on the chime had weathered, until I eventually found that it had fallen and, being made of glass, had shattered. I had told myself that I would grab another one while I was out in town, but it repeatedly slipped my mind as my little brother was coming for a visit in a few weeks, and I was wrapped up in my excitement and planning activities for his visit. One day, while we were showing him around town, my husband pointed out the wind chime display and jokingly reminded me to get one for our resident ghost. Immediately, and in dull seriousness, my brother shouted, I knew your place was haunted. He'd said this with a slight bit of humor, like an aha moment, but he was still pretty serious, and I was surprised because my husband and I were the only ones who knew about our odd experiences. Also, while I knew my brother was similarly skeptical of things, I'd always been the more superstitious one. Curious, I asked him why he thought the house was haunted. Well, my brother replied, I was up late watching YouTube on my phone with one headphone in and I heard footsteps behind me. But when I turned around, I didn't see anybody there. I know I heard someone walking in the hallway but I've seen the grudge and I knew better than to be that white guy, so I just went back to my phone, but I definitely heard footsteps. Since my husband and I had never considered the ghost in the house to be malicious or angry, we all got a good laugh out of my brother's animated retelling of his night and agreed to grab a new wind chime. My brother picked one out and hung it specifically on the wall by his futon for extra luck during his stay and he confirmed that nearly every morning for the rest of his stay that he hadn't heard anything during the night. Before we left Japan, I made sure to take down the chime so that the movers wouldn't pack it. I hung it in the little corner garden on the property and made a last trip to the local shrine with a friend to help me thank the shrine maiden who had suggested it to me. I hoped that whoever moved in after us kept the garden and the ghost didn't feel disrespected during our stay because I truly loved the house and my experiences there. This happened in July of 2017. I was driving in Yamanashi to go to an old hotel in the countryside with my girlfriend for her birthday, which was the next day. We decided to go out at 11 p.m. to buy some alcohol and food at a local 7-Eleven, which was open all night, to celebrate her birthday right at midnight. Before going back to the hotel, I wanted to stop on a hill that is surrounded by a forest to see the stars and wish my girlfriend a happy birthday at midnight. I was slowly driving through the forest when I saw something floating above the road, about a meter from my car. It looked like a glowing orb, but it was so fast that I couldn't really make it out. It just passed the corner of my eyes. At first I thought my headlight shined on some spider webs, but the orb was above the car hood and it vanished when it hit the windshield. I didn't want to scare my girlfriend so I acted like nothing happened, and I kept driving until we exited the forest. I asked her then if she saw something in the forest, and I could tell by her voice and her face that she was as scared as I was. We decided to go back to our hotel straight away and spend the rest of the night watching television to get our mind away from the scary thing that we had just encountered. I have no logical explanation for what we saw, even if I tried my hardest to make it rational. I'm okay with the idea that some Japanese forests have spirits, and with the idea that we may have seen one. My story goes back to September 2019, when I visited my girlfriend who lives in Japan. We decided to go to Shizuoka Prefecture, in the countryside, 
in a hotel that looked like a ryokan. We couldn't have a big bed, so we had to sleep in two single beds. My girlfriend heard a sound like a whisper coming from the bathroom and started to feel anxious about it, but didn't tell me for fear of scaring me. We fall asleep in each single bed after a really long day of bicycling in the surrounding mountains. I wake up at two o'clock in the morning in full sleep paralysis state. It's not my first time, so I know what I have to do. Calm down and try to wake myself up by talking, or at least trying. For people familiar to sleep paralysis, you often feel looked at by a shadow and its presence slowly creeps up on you. My girlfriend, who was already anxious, woke up to see me blabbering some sound and making a scary face as I struggled to speak. She freaked out so much and it took at least a minute before I managed to wake myself up. So I asked her why she didn't try to wake me up. She said that the sound she heard made her so scared that she thought if spirit had possessed me and was trying to reach out to her. I told her where the shadow I saw in my dream came from, and she told me that the sound she'd heard earlier came from the same place. We were so convinced it was an actual spirit in the room that we couldn't fall back asleep before sunrise, and we had to share a single bed for the rest of the night. I try to rationalize it and think that the sound came from another room, but no clients were staying close to us and that she freaked out because I was having sleep paralysis and it's normal to see a shadow when that happens. But something really mysterious happened in that hotel and we will definitely remember that experience. Back in 2013, I was teaching English in Shukugawa Hyogo, Japan for a year. It was truly a dream come true. Well, my English center's latest class got out at about 10.30, and with it being Japan, I felt completely safe walking home along the Shukugawa River so late at night. Along my walk, I had to pass under the JR Kobe line and would pass a small Buddhist temple as I came out from under the bridge. Now, I had done this walk dozens of times by now, and nothing scary, let alone mildly unnerving, had ever happened. It was late March, so the weather was cool and comfortable. However, I noticed that as I drew closer to the temple, it got cooler. Cool enough for me to zip up my hoodie and shiver. As I was coming up the path, I heard the distinct sound of someone praying at the altar, the small gong or bell was rung, a five yen coin clattered at the altar box, and two claps to announce the prayer's presence to the gods were heard. I stopped for a brief second, thinking it was weird that somebody was out so late to say a prayer, but I shrugged it off and moved on. Turning the corner, I expected to see somebody at the altar, but it was empty. I froze. There was absolutely no way that somebody could have prayed that fast and bolted off without me hearing them along the gravel path. It was then that I noticed how still the night was. No bugs or birds, no sounds of the city, and the river to my left sounded muted. The feeling of being watched and unwelcomed washed over me. Slowly, I began to move, the temple now to my back. I took just a few steps before I heard the bell, the coin, and the two claps. Fear gripped me. I broke out into a cold sweat as the shadows of the trees seemed to grow dark and deep. I gathered my nerves and anxiously turned to face the temple. Nothing but a vacant temple. Slowly I turned and started walking again, and then... I heard two claps, clear as day, right in my left ear. Needless to say, I bolted the rest of the way home. After that night, I avoided passing by that temple whenever I worked the later classes and opted to just take the long way home.
To cut an extremely long story short, my friend used to live in a house that was well into the woods. One day, he told me something was happening around his house, so I spent the night. We sat with our backs to the wall, and the window cracked just a bit on the second story. As we were talking, we started hearing strange noises coming from the woods. We were shocked as we peeked to see what it could be. Between his house and the woods was a big open area. We could faintly see the open area because of the moonlight, but we couldn't see into the pitch blackness of the woods. Suddenly, some large white creature that looked like a naked man creeped out. It was bald, and its eyes were glowing. When we freaked out, I yelped a bit too loudly, causing it to stop and go back into the woods. The next day, being the curious people we were, we decided to go out into the woods and search. Eventually, we found a strange uprooted tree with a bunch of holes in the ground. We heard heavy breathing coming from somewhere inside, but we decided not to go in there looking. A few weeks went by and nothing. I came back to his house just to have a sleepover. He asked me to go grab one of his bikes off the back porch. I went back there through the garage but as I was grabbing it, I felt like something was watching me. I looked off toward the woods, but saw nothing. Suddenly, I heard a strange noise literally over my head. I looked up at the roof, which was only about seven feet off the ground in that section of the house due to the elevation of the porch, and I saw a similar creature sitting on the roof just feet from my face. When I panicked, it shrieked in my face, and I ran back into the garage and slammed the door shut. My friend ran into the garage from inside the house to see what had happened, and I was panicking, telling him to lock everything. We locked ourselves inside and waited for his dad to come back. This was around 6 to 8 o'clock at night. I don't remember exactly, but it was closer to the night. His dad was in the military and decided to step out and take a look after he came home and we told him what had happened. He saw that same creature in the distance, just on the edge of the woods, but he had no explanation for us as to what it could be. It's been five years since that happened, and now I've been seeing sightings of things just like it all over the place. YouTube, Reddit, Facebook. It's really been haunting me lately thinking back on that sound that it made when it shrieked and the way it looked. It was terrifying. Its eyes seemed very strange too. I kind of tied two and two together and figured that it must live beneath the ground somewhere and only come up when it's dark. Has anyone else witnessed anything like this? It all happened back in April of 2016. I was 28 years old and I was traveling with my parents and my younger brother to visit relatives in Hong Kong. We always stayed in this area called Sha Tin as it was easy for us to navigate the public transport to all the places that my relatives lived from there. Mum found a really good deal for a 10 day stay at a hotel in the area. It was a hotel that we had stayed at years ago and while it was not as convenient as our usual place, it was a ridiculously good value for a four-star hotel. We arrived in the late afternoon or evening and checked in as normal. The first thing I noticed when we walked into the room was it was a little bit shabbier than I had expected for a four-star hotel. When you walk in, on your left is one of those closets where you can hang up your coats and stuff. About two steps ahead, on the right, is the bathroom, and opposite that is a little nook where there's a teapot, tea and coffee, and the mini fridge, things like that.
From there, the room opens up to a double bed and two single beds, plus a TV, a typical setup of a slightly larger hotel room. As soon as I walked in, I noticed the closet light kept flickering on and off, even while the closet door was closed. I didn't really think much of it because the room looked pretty old, and I figured it was just badly maintained. So, having gotten off a long flight, I really needed to pee, so I headed straight for the bathroom. When I stepped in, I was shocked to discover that the lighting in the bathroom had this horrible greenish tinge. The bathroom was a bit worse for wear, but not unusable. The corners were all dark and grimy, like they hadn't been cleaned for a while. And there was a slate loose in the ceiling that looked like somebody had kicked it in. With the greenish light, it had a really strong horror movie vibe about it. To top it off, as I did my business and while washing my hands, I had this distinct feeling of being watched. Not just watched from a distance, but it felt as if somebody was standing really close behind me, with their head next to mine. Being tired, I told myself that I was just imagining things. I finished up and I walked out. It felt so creepy, though. I found myself literally shaking it off as I walked out. My brother went in after me, and he came out shortly after. And when he did, he gave me a look that said, What the hell? Realizing he was as creeped out as I was, I nodded and simply said, I know, right? We both decided there was something off about the bathroom. But considering that our parents seemed fine with it, and we were only going to be there for a few days, we just shrugged it off. Yes, it felt a little creepy, but I figured that if we left it, whatever it was, alone, then it would leave us alone. How bad could it be? The next few days were okay. Outside of the bathroom, everything felt normal. My plan was pee as quickly as possible, shower as quickly as possible, and stay the hell away from the bathroom unless absolutely necessary. The worst thing was really that the bathroom had this huge mirror that ran all the way from the entrance to the bathtub and shower. You could see yourself in the mirror at all times. Every time I washed my hands or showered, I just had this overwhelming feeling that something invisible was staring back at me through the mirror. I can't explain it, but I just felt like if I didn't keep my guard up, at some point if I looked away and looked back, I would see something that might scare the life out of me. One day, after we came back from shopping for gifts, I was super excited because we had shopped for baby clothes for my cousin's daughter who was about to be born. We were taking photos of all the clothes and toys we had bought, and then I realized I needed to use the bathroom. As usual, I threw open the door and walked in, but I was practically floored because the green lighting was gone. The bathroom looked and felt super normal. I wasn't scared and I didn't feel creeped out. The mirror, everything felt fine. It was totally normal. I thought, oh my gosh, I really am nuts. Did I imagine everything the whole time? It was great. I finished up and went back outside to fuss over the presents some more. At some point, my brother was peering at the air conditioner control. He said, um, did you change the temperature? Confused, I responded, no. Mom? Dad? He asked. They both shook their heads. He called us over, and startled, we noticed that somehow, the temperature had been set to something ridiculously low like 11 or 13 degrees Celsius. My mom brushed it off as faulty and set it back up to 18 again. The key point here though is that I have really bad asthma, which is triggered by cold temperatures and dry air. So we never set the air conditioning that low. My brother and I exchanged looks again, but we didn't say anything. On the way out to dinner that night, we were on the train and my brother and I finally decided to tell our parents. But horrifyingly, the situation was much worse than I expected. Turns out that while I had just been feeling creeped out, my brother had had an entirely different experience.
He said that on the first day, yes, he felt the same as me, like he was being watched. But on top of that, while he was showering, he thought he heard me call him by his nickname. Only our family calls him that. He actually answered, what? And when I didn't respond, he felt scared and semi-clarified, what? And used my name. Nothing. When he told us this, I vehemently denied ever calling out to him when he was showering. He said it sounded like I was just on the other side of the door. I told him my entire plan there was to stay away from that bathroom at all times. I didn't even hover at the kettle area, simply because it freaked me out so much to even be close to it. So there was no way I was going to stand outside and call to him. Then the next day, he saw what looked like muddy, dark, bare feet footprints next to the toilet. It freaked him out, but as we had decided to just sort of live with it for the next few days, he didn't say anything. Finally, the night before, he was showering, and when he glanced away and then back at the mirror, he saw a young woman with long, dark hair standing right next to the toilet in the mirror. He reflexively shut his eyes and said something to the effect of, Please stop that. It's really scaring me. He opened his eyes and it was gone. He also explained that he had this strong feeling that the woman had once hidden under the space in the bathroom bench, which gave both of us the creeps. In retrospect, my parents and I started realizing a lot of weird things about the room and the behavior of the staff all around us. Realization number one, everyone knew but us. For example, one day we were pretty tired and we decided to just chill at the hotel until late afternoon. The cleaner came by and we mentioned that we were happy for her to just collect the used towels and leave new ones in the bathroom. This lovely middle-aged lady walked in and was friendly enough, albeit a little shy. We were all within view, but because the bathroom door was closed, Mom said to her, Oh, it's okay. There's no one in there. The cleaner nodded, and weirdly, despite hearing my mom explain this already, she knocked on the door before entering. My parents and brother and I looked at each other, a little confused. Language was definitely not an issue. We speak the same language and had spoken with her previously. She left after giving us our daily bottled water refills and towels, and that was that. The daily bottle refreshes and the housekeeping was also weird. The bed always looked like they were made up really quickly, not with the usual type of care that you would get at these hotels. The refilled bottles were never set on the bedside tables like they are usually, but just dumped near the kettle, closer to the door. At the time, we figured it was because the room was so cheap. Every morning when we left the room, any staff nearby would stare weirdly at us and smile awkwardly. This is pretty weird for Hong Kong hotels, because we don't look different. Usually they just kind of ignored you, and it's not like we were staying in some VIP room or anything. I always thought we were just giving off heavy foreign-born Chinese vibes or something, but thinking back, I think they were looking to see if we were acting funny, because they knew the room was dodgy. Realization number two, it was listening to us. When it called out to my brother, it wasn't by his real name. It was by the nickname we call him. Literally nobody else calls him that. Also, we had mentioned a few times in the conversations we had about how we had to make sure the air conditioning wasn't too low because of my asthma. It was summer in Hong Kong and incredibly humid. So my brother had joked a few times about how setting the air conditioning super low would feel better but might kill me. Realization number three, defying technology. The hotel air conditioning control does not go below 17 degrees Celsius. Most air conditioners don't in our experience. So when we saw the setting in the room, it made no sense. My brother said the reason he walked over there was because when I went into the bathroom, he swore he saw out of the corner of his eye a white mist hover near the air conditioning controls. When he walked over and noticed the incredibly low setting, that's when he asked us about it. After listening to us, my mom went white as a sheet. 
She and Dad decided that we would ask for a room switch immediately. It was the calling out to my brother and the air conditioning that freaked her out the most. In Chinese folklore, there are legends about ghosts wanting company, and they would lure people to accidental deaths by scaring them or calling out to them. She was afraid that the ghost was trying to latch on to my brother, considering he was the only one who saw or heard her. Mom also had a theory that given that I'm super protective of my family, it may have decided that I was in the way or that I had pissed it off somehow. We figured that unknowingly, my excitedness and cheerfulness had offset some of the energy in the bathroom that day, knocking it out of its territory, which was why I suddenly felt like everything was normal in the bathroom. I had accidentally knocked her out of it or something. So because I pissed it off, it turned down the air conditioning as an attempt to mess with me. When we went back and told the front desk we wanted to switch rooms, the young man at the desk looked slightly uncomfortable. Mom just explained, we're just very uncomfortable with the room. Look, we'd really like to change rooms now. We're only here for a few more days, so if we can't, we're happy to just check out now. The guy didn't even look surprised. Weirdly, without asking another question, he told us he would change our rooms. He would give us a new key to a different room on a different level. And he explained that once we were cleared out of our old room, to just come back and give him the key. To us, that was super weird, especially because he didn't even question it, nor did he offer to come up with us or check or anything, but we didn't care. We went upstairs and packed up all of our stuff. By this stage, I was freaking out inside a little bit, because the gravity of what my brother had told us was sinking in. I told my parents to leave anything that didn't belong to us in the room. I'd watched enough movies to know that these things attach themselves to objects, right? So I was like, leave the water bottles, leave the toiletries, we can get new ones. I even left my personal toothbrush in there. I wanted nothing that had stayed in that bathroom for a prolonged period of time with it. We checked into the room upstairs, and we were shocked to realize that everything we suspected seemed to be true. This room was exactly the same structure, but it was so much neater. The bathroom lighting was normal, still old and a little dirty, but not creepy at all. The refill water bottles were neatly placed on the bedside tables, with the hotel cardboard tags attached. The other room had none of these nice finishes. The beds were made properly, tucked in corners and everything. We realized that the other room must have been known as a haunted room, so the cleaners would just rush to tidy up, dump whatever they needed to dump, and leave as quickly as possible. It also explained why the cleaner insisted on knocking on the door to our bathroom first before entering. In Chinese folklore, it's polite to announce yourself before you walk into a ghost's territory by knocking on the door first. The theory is that if they don't want to mess with you, they'll have the opportunity to leave or hide. Horrifyingly, Mum realized that she had accidentally left one of the drinking bottles from the other room in her handbag. Calmly, she wrapped it up in some Buddhist beads she carried with her everywhere and explained, we'll throw it out tomorrow somewhere, don't worry. I was still a little scared, but my brother was just happy we had left our other room. That night, while we slept, for no reason at all, I woke up. I had my back to the entry hallway of the room. I could see my brother in the bed next to mine and I could hear both of my parents breathing and snoring in their sleep in the bed behind me. Despite this, I could feel someone watching me from the hallway. I was wide awake and so scared out of my mind I could barely move. I remember being very aware of my own breathing. I told myself I was just traumatized and that if I just turned around, I would see that there was nothing there and that there would be nothing to be afraid of. So. I lifted myself off the bed a bit and turned. There, standing in the darkness, I saw a silhouette of a person, medium height, standing right next to my mom's handbag where the bottle was. I turned quickly around and pulled my covers up over my shoulders and slammed my eyes shut. I don't know how, but somehow I fell asleep. 
When we woke up in the morning, we went out for breakfast. Mom threw the bottle out in one of the shopping center bins, and after that, nothing weird happened. This was one of the most frightening things I've ever experienced, and the residual effect of this meant that I kept running into all these weird things for the next two years. Luckily, never something as bad as that again, though. For reference, this place was called the Regal Riverside Hotel. I think we were on level 8, and after we were moved to 9. Neither of us remembers the exact room number. I think a big part of me blocked it out. A lesson we learned from this was that the cliché is true. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. There was a very good reason why that room was so cheap. I'd rather pay more money than ever have this happen again. And it's the last time I will ever stay silent about a creepy hotel room. Any sign of weirdness and I will change rooms immediately. I bought the house that I'm living in a few years ago. It was recently renovated by the previous owner, who was in his 50s. I found out later, after talking to a neighbor, that the previous owner had passed away from sudden heart problems. Weird things have been happening again lately. The main thing is the fire alarms. There are about four or five smoke detectors dispersed around the house. One of them will go off randomly at like three in the morning, but it's a different one each time, and it's only ever one. Sometimes it's the basement one. Last night, it was the one in the guest bedroom. This has happened probably 10 times in the last two years. The smoke alarms will just go off for a minute, and then they'll just stop. I've checked the batteries, I've checked if it's the carbon monoxide alarm, everything. But nothing is wrong with them. They'll just randomly go off. But last night, it did something unusual. Usually, it's just a really loud beeping alarm. But last night, in between the beeps, it said, fire, fire, fire. That has never happened before, and I'm not even sure those alarms are programmed to do that. Some other things that I've had happen is that the lights will dim, the lamp will turn off and on by itself, and I've heard whistling that I can never find a source for. The fire alarm thing sucks, and it's very startling at 3 a.m. I'm not entirely sure, but I think I might be living in a haunted house. I live in an old house, about 30 to 40 years old. It was built by my family. At one point after it was finished, there was some kind of conflict between my family and some other people, and someone from the other family basically cursed the heck out of it and wished everybody in my family bad things. At least, that's what I was told. Great start. Over the years, my family members, especially my dad, have been saying how there's a shadow figure in the living room in certain places. It was described as a black shadow with a long tail. My dad said that when we were little, my brother and I were running up the stairs and that he saw the shadow following us. I never saw it, but I can feel when something or someone is in my presence. There are also quite a few things that I've experienced as a child in this house but I'll skip those for now to not make this too long. Recently, a family member died, and strange things have been happening. A few days after it was announced that they passed, my family was arguing, and a bottle fell over on the table. I don't know if my grandpa accidentally hit it with his elbow or what, but it fell and broke. A few smaller things have also happened, but something that I'll probably remember forever is when we were sitting at the kitchen table, talking. Out of nowhere, the range hood turned on by itself. 
To turn it on, you have to reach all the way to the top of it and move a little hook thing. It can't turn on by itself. It wasn't a malfunction. Someone or something turned it on. Today, I finished dinner and went to my room, and the handle of my window was set straight. When it's set straight, the window fully opens, and I never open my window like that. Before I went to eat, I left the window half opened, with the handle facing up. It freaked me out. I asked all of my family members, and nobody had been in there. I checked the whole house, but nobody unfamiliar was there. My room's balcony is also kind of connected to the garden, so anybody who's in the garden can get onto my balcony and into my room. That gets me so paranoid, especially in the summer, when it gets hot in my room and I fully open my windows, that I'm very cognizant about the windows. I know that it wasn't open. Any animal and anybody can enter without me even knowing. So that's why I only ever keep them at half, unless I'm in the room. I believe that more than one bad spirit is in this house. I don't believe all the spirits are bad, or have bad intentions, but at least one is. I don't know what they are or why these things keep happening, but they just keep happening. I come from a remote island called Rendova, located in the Solomon Islands, and have since moved overseas. Across from our island is another one called Tetepare. The story of Tetepare is really interesting, because it was abandoned completely by the inhabitants a few centuries ago. Just like the villagers fled the island to come to neighboring islands such as my own, here we are a few centuries later. Because of the lack of humans on the island, it is known for its biodiversity, and a few researchers come every now and again to have a look. If you are looking for cool remote places to travel, I highly recommend it. The interesting part of Tetapare for me was, why did everyone just leave? If you were a villager back in those days, it would have been a great place to live. Volcanic soil to grow crops, an abundance of fresh water, animals that are easy to hunt. The official story told is that there was a great sickness, and people were dropping like flies left and right. So, the villagers fled to get away from the sickness. However, the island is known to be very big, so realistically, if you wanted to get away from others, it wouldn't be too hard, because you could be self-sufficient on other parts of the island. The story told to me growing up is a little bit different. Back in those days, we loved to fight. A war canoe from my island Rendova arrived on Tetepare to fight. However, upon arrival they were met with numerous unburied dead bodies. All the large canoes that belonged to the Tetepare people were gone. To leave so hastily, and to not even properly bury your dead, is a really weird thing. Because it was back in those days, the first thought was that a spirit had done this to these people. However, the people from Rendova decided to set up villages against better judgment. In due time, they also fled, because the spirit that had decimated the population of the Tetepare people apparently attacked the newly set upon villagers there. Ever since, the island has continued to remain uninhabited, except for the few ecologes the tourists come to visit at. Now in the present day, we go to Tetepare to maybe have a picnic or go hunting. We are, however, extremely cautious because it is believed that the island is still extremely wild, and because of the lack of humans, that spirits run amuck there. I have some weird stories about going hunting there, but in any case, Tetepare is a completely mysterious island.
These events took place in British Columbia in the summer of 2018, June and July to be precise. The events that I'm going to describe took place in two different locations. The first occurrence was by Gold River, near the Mawachat First Nation. The second was by Cathedral Grove. My buddy and I were spending the summer on the island. We were staying in Royston, where we both work. We decided to go spend a weekend in the wilderness. We planned to go rock climbing all day by Gold River, and in the evening, find a quiet spot to stargaze. The first part of the day was uneventful, beautiful, and sunny. We decided to camp by Gold River Boat Launch. For those unfamiliar, it's at a dead end. The only way to go farther is to take a ferry. There's nothing around except trees, valleys, the sea, and an abandoned little parking lot, which nature has slowly taken over. The only civilization nearby is right across our improvised camping spot, the First Nation of Mawachat. We went to bed at about 2 a.m. It was a perfect night. Not a sound, not a cloud, and a lot of stars. It was beautiful. Now here comes the interesting part. Not long after we went into our sleeping bag in the tent, we heard the distinct noise of monkeys. Literally, it sounded like chimpanzees, like we were at the zoo. We both heard it, and it was loud and distinct. It gave us goosebumps. We knew it was impossible because there's no such thing around there. We tried to rationalize it. Initially, we thought it could have been birds we weren't used to, or some small animals, maybe. The sound repeated itself about three times, and then nothing. Everything returned to its quiet state. We've talked to a few locals who'd been staying on the island for a long time about the incident, and we couldn't get a straight answer. About a month later, we went to Cathedral Grove and spent an afternoon there with friends. By the end of the evening, around 7 p.m., we heard the same weird chimpanzee sounds. It seemed like the sound was following us. It went on a few times again and then went quiet. We got kind of creeped out and we left. I don't know if anybody else has ever experienced something similar, but it was certainly interesting. I am located in the twin islands of Trinidad and Tobago. There is generally a culture of supernatural entities and folklore that is present in everyone that lives in the country. I've always encountered ghosts periodically in my life, but two days ago I saw something that really disturbed me. I was by myself in my kitchen window at around 2.30 a.m. I live in a three-story apartment building, and I live on the third floor. Located just outside my window, about 150 meters away, is a church that is also three stories, with the bottom level being the church, and the other parascending levels seem like a house. I was looking out of my window, onto the windows of the church, when I saw the silhouette of what seemed to be a man on the top level of the church. I began to peer at this thing, and upon staring at it, it moved from facing west, and slowly turned south, staring directly at me. Then, suddenly, it backed up and seemed to materialize into the wall behind it, like it melded into it. I know this sounds pretty unbelievable, but I'm scared out of my mind. I don't know what I saw. I have no thoughts on what it might be. I'm also getting nightmares frequently these days. I don't know if they're connected or not. In every city, there is a place that local residents are aware of. Whether it's a home, an office, an abandoned building, or a park that everyone has heard the rumors about, there is always something haunted. 
The story begins with a murder, a suicide, or some tragic death. And, decades later, tales circulate of the paranormal activity within the area. Some believe while others scoff, but either way, everybody knows of the place. I want to share with you the haunted history of Paveglia Island. Paveglia is a small 17-acre island located in the Venetian lagoon between the cities of Venice and Lido. In the past few decades, the island has taken upon the reputation of being one of the most haunted locations on Earth. Paveglia holds many tales of paranormal activity, going back for centuries. Local residents refused to set foot on the island, believing that they would be cursed by those who haunt it. The history of Paveglia is a dark one, shrouded in death. There are beliefs that the Romans had used it to isolate victims of the plague and the mentally ill. The first recorded settlement on the island was in 460 AD, of people fleeing the invading barbarians on the mainland. Over the centuries, Paveglia was the scene for many battles as people sought to raid or control it. During the Middle Ages, the island was designated as a quarantine area and a burial site for those who contracted the Black Death. Over the next few centuries, Paveglia served as a fort storage of shipment goods, and continued as an isolation station for those infected with the plague. In the 1920s, the island was set up as a hospital for the mentally ill and the elderly. Soon, stories started to emerge of patients encountering ghosts along with the counts of being possessed. There is the legend of a doctor who conducted medical experiments on the hospital's residents that was driven insane by the spirits to committing suicide. In 1968, the facility was closed and abandoned. Today, the island has been deemed as one of the most haunted places on the planet. Historical researchers estimate that more than 100,000 people died on Paveglia in its history and many of those souls are believed to still reside there. Locals won't go there, and the fishermen steer clear of its waters. It's said that a few fishermen had caught human remains in their nets. The few paranormal investigators that braved Paveglia had reported encountering a lot of paranormal activity, with claims of being attacked by unseen forces. In 2014, the Italian government sold the island to a developer in hopes that the island could be made into a resort. Currently, rumors on the internet have said that the workers sent to survey the island had an experience and refused to return. This is not my story. I heard it on a very new podcast in Norway, where one of our celebrity mediums interviews the everyman and listens to their stories. This is one of the stories. Some of these experiences are quite remarkable, and I wish more people could hear them all. This happened in northern Norway in the 80s. A man and his brother-in-law used to take a rowboat to go to the grocery store. This was, as I said, in northern Norway in the 80s, not many urban areas. The wives, I think, were in the house on land and waited for them to come back from the sea. Suddenly, they see one of the guys from the boat walking over to the estate, walking toward the house and around a corner. The women were very puzzled by this. Maybe he'd forgotten something. And had he changed clothes? They didn't see the boat. They waited for him to come inside the house, but no one came. A couple of hours later, he and his brother-in-law came home with the groceries. A couple of weeks later, they would go on the same trip to get groceries by boat. This day, the sea was very dangerous, and the boat had tipped over, and they both drowned. And when they died, his wife suddenly remembered that the clothes he wore on that day when he drowned was the same outfit he wore when they saw him walk toward the house that day, two weeks before.
My girlfriend and I went camping this summer on Mears Island. We didn't know too much about the island, aside from the fact that it has some of the best old growth forests in British Columbia, and that there's the campground and hostel and a small village there. When we got there, we went exploring and felt fine checking out the abandoned cars and rotting docks, as well as going inland along the waterways. We decided to go check out the lake around dusk, since we were told that there was a boardwalk and a boat available for use. As we walked there in high spirits, we listened to the birds. It was a quick walk, only 15 to 20 minutes from the campsite. Once we hit the lake, the atmosphere changed, however. All animal noises ceased. It was complete silence. It was very eerie. At the time, nobody vocalized anything, but my girlfriend and I later discussed the experience and both agreed that we felt uneasy and in danger. We were with a third who I didn't ask the feelings of. I didn't feel comfortable going out on the boat, so I stayed on the dock. My girlfriend and the third person with us went out for a few minutes but felt too creeped out and paddled back quickly. Nighttime had fallen and we decided that it was time to head back to camp since I know silence generally equals predators. We quickly walked back and once we passed the threshold of where we had originally stopped hearing all the noises, animals and birds could be heard in the distance. It was a quiet walk back as we were intent to listen for anything behind us. I know it doesn't sound very scary or eventful. I figured it was probably a black bear or a cougar, but I've encountered those before, and I've never felt threatened by one, particularly not in advance. Cougars could definitely be the reason, though. They said that the big cats stay farther away than that. I wouldn't have thought much of it, except that today, I learned that the island is a Bigfoot sighting hotspot and has a good deal of First Nations lore about wild men and Sasquatch, and the thought creeped me out. Has anyone else ever had a similar experience of not really encountering anything, but feeling like you're on the verge? Just to give you an idea of who I am, I am a 13-year-old, able-minded girl. I've never been suspected of any sort of mental illness and I have no medical problems other than asthma and tinnitus. I was born in Arizona. I currently live on a very small Caribbean island that I will not be sharing the name of for privacy reasons. I am a science-based individual. Last night at about 10 p.m., it got really windy all of a sudden, which was odd considering that it hadn't been stormy at all. When I looked out at the ocean, it was flat, smooth as silk. I decided to ignore what my gut was telling me, and my father and I went outside. What I saw will stick with me for the rest of my life, however much longer that will be, which, due to what I've seen, I don't think will be much longer. We saw three red lights in the sky, at the top of the mountain. Of course, because of how stubborn my father is, he told me that it was probably some kind of military craft, Dutch Marines or something. But once we went back inside and told my mother, she believed a portion to each of our stories. My father, who believed it was just the military doing some sort of training, and me, who believed it was a UFO, of the words true nature that is, simply an unidentified flying object. Whether it was from another country or another world, I wasn't sure. And my mother, well, she believes that it was some kind of government spy or experiment sort of thing. I found my mother's estimate more likely than my father's, until about 30 minutes ago. I saw someone, well, something. I'm not sure what it is or was. It was on top of one of the flat points on the mountain. Subsequent to us seeing the lights up on the mountain, I asked my friend if she saw the lights too. 
She said that she did. We're planning on hiking the trail that goes around the island to check it out. We're thinking about waiting until something more major happens until we investigate the situation, in the off chance that my father is correct. Update number one, May 26th of 2020. Today I was hiking for one of my school clubs, and I saw some blood on the trail. Maybe goat blood? I'm not sure what the blood was from, but I have a feeling that it's related to that thing I saw in the sky. Update number two, May 27th, 2020. I just found out that three goats that are on a Caribbean goat farm sort of thing are missing. I think that something is eating them. Update number three, May 31st, 2020. I spoke to an archaeologist here because I wanted another adult's opinion. He told me that there's a certain legend on certain islands that every 177 years, red lights will appear in the sky or mountain, and things emerge from the mountain and will eat and drink and do all that they need to do to survive. He said if they're real, they're more like demons or spirits and won't go away until they're stopped but they can only be stopped and seen and interacted with by certain groups of people of their choice. It seems that they have chosen teenagers to fight them off. I hope this doesn't end bad for us. I can only hope. Update number four, June 1st, 2020. Today at around eight, I was sitting in my room doing homework and I heard a tapping sort of sound, like something was on my roof. All of a sudden, I heard a screeching sound, and the tapping was over. I was too scared to go outside and look. Final update, June 2nd, 2020. Today I went hiking for my school group, and two of my friends walked up past the part of the trail where we were supposed to stop at. When we were all walking back down, one told me that she saw a dark-skinned woman, like a native or Hispanic woman but on the darker side hiding in the bushes. She said that she didn't recognize this woman, which they would have if they were a local. Our airport and the ferries are all shut down, so nobody can get on the island. And my other friend told me that when he walked up, he heard a voice speaking almost in a whisper, and what he thought sounded like a native language to the Caribbean. I found a pile and shrine and altar sort of thing slightly off the trail, and we all agreed not to tell anybody just for the sake of convenience. We're keeping in close contact on WhatsApp and Snapchat. If anybody knows what's going on or has any suggestions or ideas, please let me know.